面下，他还要疯呀疯疯疯的，心中开个阿姆斯马特都飞，他喊到我们的几个班的，这里本身咱家做主人。一呀一次哟，哎呀，对的话，这里本身咱家做主人。天上大海洋，风呀风，匆匆的，心中的太阳是毛色的美。看看到我们飞云千起飞，革命江山一片天风美。一呀一不哟，哎呀，春天花，革命江山一片天风。我心中的片海洋，插的片片绿片风，唱百千里歌声嘹亮，柴人家发风起飞扬，千家江边，为国打喊来，万朵百花闪闪开，年年年年，多么情歌唱，我们心中的红海洋。我冒出青烟，我不怕输了你。大家把老真心唱，愿你真理出原理，万寿江万寿江。What's going on, everybody? I'm a soft biker. And this is the Austin Idol Rockets coming to you live from the sunny plains of Beijing, from the glorious People's Republic of China. Five thousand years of Chinese prosperity, folks. 天上大海呀，风呀风，风头美，心中的太阳是毛色的美。看啊，听到我们。I'm alive and alive, and I hope all the boys, girls, and MPs are having a fantastic, phenomenal time. I certainly am. That was the Hasanabi Red Sun in the Sky AI cover.、Um, When did I sing this? I went and I learned Mandarin specifically. But I'm live and alive, ladies and gentlemen. It's 54 degrees and kind of cold, but still sunny here in California, Los Angeles, after a atmospheric river excitement that has been going on for the past week or so.、Uh, in and out, we keep getting we keep getting、uh, mixed signals from our phones. On the one hand. Uh, the the、uh, government the the oblast keeps directly beaming、uh, alerts national service alerts into my phone telling me that there is a atmospheric river and then there is a flood warning flash flood warnings all around and then I go outside and it's not even raining who am I to believe fake news ladies and gentlemen this is part of the broadcast where I tell you a little bit about my personal news. Uh, of course, for the record,、uh, I told you so's are are due once again.、Um, the Ukrainian general, whose name I can't say because it's like it's like some Z name, has now been fired. As I told you, there's some conflict there. There was some drama there. Turns out, it is the truth. There was drama there. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's so weird, man. It's so weird. Anyway, it's a loose knit. It's a loose knit. Uh, but uh, that's a, I told you so for a little bit later.、Um, we are looking inside the Mr. Beast crate later. Yes, I will show you the Mr. Beast crate right crate right now. As a matter of fact, this is part of the broadcast where I tell you a little bit about our personal news about what's going on in my life.、Um, I、uh, got a wonderful gift for my younger brother, whom I love. He wanted to get a new suspension kit for his old ass Porsche that he has been building and rebuilding over and over again. As you guys know, the Porsche itself is like. When he bought it, it's like a 2001 Porsche Cayenne.、Uh, when he bought it, he bought it for like two grand or three grand or something.、Um, I will tell you this much: the suspension is multiple times over. The suspension kit that he is putting on it 
is multiple times more costly than the car itself. Um, but yeah, so why am I explaining this to you? Well, because I got him this, I bought him this, but of course he has to put it on himself. That's like half the fun. Half the reason why he wanted to even get the suspension kit was so that he could, you know, put it on himself, have some fun that way, which means, which means that he had to leave Los Angeles, which means that he had to leave Fiona with me, which is what I did last night. I, uh, I'm with both of the girlies. I'm not bringing Fiona in here because Kaya obviously is a menace, but I'm with both of the girlies. I'm taking care of Fifi, Fifito, and also uh, Kaya Sito at the same time. So, yeah, I'm the father that stepped up, baby. Two daughters now, not one. And so, so uh, the problem is it's been raining. It rains like weirdly. It rains randomly. It rains at night out of nowhere, right? Out of control rain for no reason. And Fiona hates. Fiona hates the rain. Like she would rather hold her poopies in for three and a half days. If it's raining for three and a half days and go outside. But of course I know all of that and I don't care. I want her to get a little bit of a workout in because I'm the I'm Uncle Workout, you know what I mean? So <clears throat> So I take her out and she's just pulling the entire time. She's like, "Okay, I took my shit. Now I have to run back home." I'm like, "Nope." And it was a bit difficult to do at first to to make sure that I could like uh, you know, get a good get a good way, like figure out a good method of being able to deal with both of these little babies. Do you just call her fat? She used to be way fatter. She's actually, she's actually gotten slimmed down a little bit. But anyway, walked her all around, walked her up and down. And then this morning I took them to the park and she had a phenomenal time there. It turns out when it's in the, uh, when it's actually not wet outside and when it's actually sunny outside we go to the park and she goes crazy okay she goes nutty with it she goes crazy mode um but yeah she was running around so she would probably be sleeping all day yeah she got walkies and the park um and and of course so did kaya but while i was at the park i got a call i'm like fuck i have a i have a delivery i had forgotten my manager had asked me to be home at a particular hour on a particular Thursday morning. And I thought to myself, fuck, it's that Mr. Beast thing. So I immediately cut the park adventure short, even though they did get a good workout in regardless, cut the park adventure short, run back home. And lo and behold, there's this fucking behemoth of a thing. This thing is being hand delivered to me. It has a uh, it has a card on it, and there's a phone number on it. I won't show you the phone number, but it says like it says open immediately. Okay, and then it says like call for assistance, and then it's just my name in the back. Anyway, um, this fucking thing, and I'm like, oh god, here we go. So I open it. I already opened it. Okay. And lo and behold, what's in it? This fucking thing. A button. I open the box and it says press when lit. So I pressed it. I hear Jimmy's voice in it. I press it. It's not doing anything now. And there's a timer, a 30 minute timer. I'm like, what the fuck? A 30 minute timer. I'm dead. It's done. It's Jover. Uh, Mr. Beast is sending a Nicaraguan death squad down my door. He is going to kill me. Okay. It's Jover. He's going to kill me. Uh, it's death squad time. I should have literally had uh, been kitted out with AR-15s and whatnot. Anyway, I hit the thing. 30 minute time. Uh, at the end of the 30 minute timer, turns out there's literally a... Turns, turns out... 
he straight up, and this is not even filmed, okay? He didn't even do this for filming purposes. The most elaborate hashtag ad of all time. When the 30 minute timer is over, my door rings right on the money. Okay. I walk outside and there's a goddamn, your house's auto tourists will get him first, right? Exactly. Right outside my door, there's a fucking red carpet. There's a red carpet outside of my door. And there's a dude dressed up, decked out in butler attire. Okay, with a with like one of those things that you get for like room service. <coughs> and it apparently there's a new Mr. Feastables uh uh like new formula for the chocolate or something. And it was just for that. It was just the ad for literally his chocolate, new formula for the chocolate. And then another guy comes in with like two duffel bags. No one filmed it. I thought like maybe they're filming it, right? No, didn't even film it, dog. Straight up. Just got, I, I got like a experiential marketing event uh, for myself, just by myself. He IRL ad break, dude? Yeah, no, literally. Um, does it taste good and not like ass now? Well, the one I, that I tried, the one that I tried is, uh, the, the peanut butter one. That was pretty good. A lot better than the older version of it. So it worked. You're talking about it. I mean, I guess I feel bad, like not talking about it. You know what I mean? But yeah, I feel like I was getting punked. Yeah. So early in the morning, uh, woke up. Motherfucker, you're supposed to film it and post it on social media. He not sh sending you shit no more. Yeah, well. Hold on here. I'll post this. I posted a photo. So what was in the bags? Uh, what was in the bags is uh, just duffel bags full of chocolate. Now I just have so much chocolate at my house. My cousins are going to go nutty mode. Okay. They are going to go crazy. Use your ring cam video. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. Um, I can't eat it obviously because I'll get fat, but see Hassan, this is why capitalism is good. Mr. Beast needs all that money so we can do personalized advertising. Yeah. Are the duffel bags branded too? Yes. <clears throat> nah, the butler had a hidden camera for sure. No, I asked him, how were you dressed? Were the actors confused? I was wearing my mama's little gamer, mommy's little gamer t-shirt. And just like my normal attire that I wear at the dog park. Dog owner here, don't give it to Kaya. It will kill her. Best of luck with the chocolate. No, I, I fed Kaya all the chocolate. Turns out Mr. Beast chocolate, very good for dogs. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, I I uh, that's it. That's That was my morning. That was this morning. Uh, and then I, uh, you know, figured out what to cover today, story-wise. And I didn't really do much uh, beyond that. Let's see the double bike. That's eh, fine. I'll show it to you later. Will you react to Tucker Carlson's interview? I can't catch the stream. I'd like to see it later. Yes, I will react to Tucker Carlson's interview. Gonna have all their young viewers killing their dogs? Yeah. Why are you giving it promo? Did he pay you? Do a giveaway. Give away all the chocolates. Send it to Palestine. Send the chocolate to Palestine. Gonna have all the young viewers killing their dogs. This pansexual alien. Yeah. Yeah, he did. He he interrupted my life to give me a, to serve me an IRL ad, which is crazy. Um, glory to Ankaristan. The gaming session yesterday was immaculate, comrade. No, I know it is. Um, will you address the accusations that you only game so you have an excuse to do accents? I will not address those accusations because they're correct. 
Okay. Like, that is correct. That is literally why I do what I do. You won't believe where the U.S. is putting special forces? Okay, well, I don't. Guys, don't. Sell me the crowbar dog. Come on, I need it. I want to break up corrupt German capitalist structures with it, I promise. Only if you destroy brutalist architecture with this crowbar, with this Mr. Beast branded crowbar. This is so funny because it's like, I'm going to do a crime, okay? And I'm going to use my Mr. Beast branded crowbar to do a crime with this. Um, don't be like premature with the news. Let's uh, let Hassan set the pace. Yeah. Do you think you will be on the majority report again soon? Sure. I love majority report. Um, Sam Cedar is my real uncle. Sam Cedar is my favorite liberal. I think like if there were, if there was like a ranking of liberals, I think like John Oliver and Sam Cedar would be at the tippy top of that pile of like who has so consistently had the best takes as uh as a liberal what if you didn't press the button well, would the guy just stay outside for hours i mean i guess when you're a content creator you kind of think uh all the time about like the angle content creation is a lot like role play role play is content creation as well obviously and it's like the way you the way you operate you know john stewart is definitely lower on that on that land of of liberalism but um what I was going to say is what I was going to say is, uh, you know, I, I want to play into it. I want to play. I feel like I have a role to, to fulfill here when I'm doing that kind of thing. I don't know about calling Sam a liberal. No, they're all like social Democrats. I think Sam Cedar's a social Democrat. John Oliver's a social Democrat. Like, I think they're real sock Dems. You know what I mean? Not like the fake people online who act like they're sock Dems, but they're, the social democracy that they are uh, LARPing as is like not early Swedish social democracy. Like we're not talking democratic socialist regime uh, in Sweden, but like new Swedish social democracy where it's like not really a social democracy at all. It's just, you know, racist neoliberalism. A lot of people who portray themselves as sock Dems online don't realize that like they're not real sock dems. They're like uh they're not real old school sock dems, but more so uh they are are you know, they're they're just like neoliberals of a different variety. They just call themselves differently. So I was offered, but I declined because I, I don't have enough time to do it. Real question. Why isn't the Macy's a mod? We, I asked the Macy's to be a mod. He said, no. Favorite lift is under 80. Um, I don't know. Dude, all the people that I hype up, all the people that I watch. Um, imagine trying to mod this chat. Yeah. Who's your least favorite lib then? Um, anyone with a channel that regularly talks about tankies and, and talks about how like the real problem in America is the left. Like, think about it this way. Like, for example, I would say David Pakman and I do not agree on a bunch of stuff, right? But, but regardless of like our differences in opinion when it comes to foreign policy i respect that david pakman is just like a regular old like center left liberal who doesn't engage in that you know what i mean like he just wants to do his donald trump videos and and you know keep doing his donald trump videos and i respect it i respect that okay He's like, nope, this is my lane. I love my Donald Trump. I love my Donald Trump uh, uh, videos. I think Donald Trump is going crazy. He's right. Donald Trump is going crazy. We have our disagreements on, on Israel, certainly. Okay, everybody fucking calm down. Um, but uh, we have our disagreements on American foreign policy. But overall, he's not like... He's not the type of dude who fucking... He's not the type of dude who just like spends a shit ton of time constantly talking about like 
Like he's a guy. He has his own lane. He's a guy who covers the news from his framework and he just covers the news. Do you understand what I'm saying? Whereas like there's a lot of shitters, a lot of shit stirrers whose entire content revolves around his entire their entire content revolves around like drama. What about Brian Taylor Cohen? Brian Tyler Cohen, another perfect example. Liberal guy, loves his liberalism. Uh Philip DeFranco, kind of liberal, also loves loves their liberalism. They talk about their stuff. They talk about their own stuff from their own framework for the most part. Philip DeFranco sometimes does engage in drama, but like for me, it's like it's great. It's it's great. Do your own thing. You know, they're doing their own thing. They're in their lane. They're just popping off. They're doing their own goddamn thing. I respect it. Okay. I respect it. Okay, dude. DeFranco has farmed you before plenty of times. Yeah. Well, you don't dislike people for differences in policy, but how they perform. No, I mean, the difference in my political disagreements uh, revolve around how uh, bloodthirsty someone will be and how much time and effort they spend on justifying bloodlust, right? That's what it is. And I feel like it's dependent on like their analysis. Like I will always have disagreements with people, especially as it pertains to foreign policy. That's like one area that I am very, very different than many other people on. You're a one issue viber. No, for me, it's just like, look, I know what my opinion is on the world. I know what my opinion is on I know what my opinion is on like foreign policy and how unpopular that's going to be in the United States of America. For me, it's like, I, of course, everyone is repeating state department talking points. Like that's, that's normal. That's understandable. That's like the average position for the most part. Okay. But there's a difference between repeating state department propaganda. Okay. And being like, this is the news. This is what's really happening. Versus not only repeating State Department propaganda, but then continuing along the lines of being like, oh, and also people that disagree with me are literally fucking like pro-terrorism, Islamist fundamentalists who are like secretly being funded and operated by big Islam in America. Like that's the difference, I guess. That's why you like Hank Green, for example. Exactly. Um. Anyway. Uh. All right, so you see Giannis Ver Vera Fox on Adam Conover's channel? Yeah. Oh, shit. I should hit up Adam to link me up with Giannis because I've been trying to talk to him. Um, But yeah. Um, I've been trying to link up with him for a while. Yo, what's up with this ad placement? You sold out or what? What ad placement? Another one ain't no way. Wait, what is this? Libs need to get in on the patricide game. You can't let MAGA failsons wipe out boomer suburban vote without a few counter moves. Wait, what again? Son described as a conspiracy theorist allegedly kills his father because his father got vaccinated. No shot. Stop. You're killing me, dad. Please. During Wellington son's fatal attack, deputies say, bro, what the hell is ha <laughs> Yo, Okay. Okay. Listen, listen, listen. I don't know what the fuck is going on, but dude, we got to, are Americans okay? Are conspiracy theorists okay? No, the answer is no, they're not. They're not okay. It's because of the border, brother. It's <laughs> yeah, they're bringing in Chinese Mexicans. 
They're bringing in Chinese, Iranian, Mexicans over the border, and it's making our wonderful patriotic Americans do things that that they normally wouldn't do, like kill their fathers, do patricide. They're making our beautiful, they're making our beautiful children do patricide. I told you the vaccines are killing people. Um, but yeah, okay. Let's uh, let's blast off. Article says he just started doing coke. Wait, really? An anti-vaxxer cokehead? Has anyone checked in on the Red Scare Girls? I like sending these stories to my dad saying, see, I could have been worse. That's an insane relationship to have with your father, but that's pretty funny. All right. Um, let me blast off. Play Helldivers 2. Dude, I'm the only motherfucker who's not sponsored to play Helldivers 2, it seems. What's happening? What's happening? Everyone's doing like a tournament. People are doing a hashtag ad. Where's my hashtag ad, Helldivers? God damn it. Um, Dag nabbit. All right, whatever. Um, let me blast off, okay? What? New conspiracy dropped. Your friend shared Everybody this video with you. Okay. Uh, new conspiracy theory. I love conspiracy theories. Um, SCOTUS likely to rule in Trump's favor on... Um, ballot drama. Aaron Rodgers goes on Rogaine. Goes on Brogan. Joseph Brogaine. Hell divers like your alley too about exceptionalism and colonialism law. Yeah, hell divers. I feel like hell divers didn't want me uh, to do an ad for them because it's like. It's too much. It's too analogous to like uh, Israel versus Palestine type shit. You know what I mean? Because I assume Hell Divers, like the way they marketed it, made me feel like it's literally Stormship uh, or Starship Troopers. Sorry, Stormship, Starship Troopers, which is like, um, of course, a a uh, a a comical depiction of fascism. Like the the way they sold it. The way they sold Helldivers, I, I kind of was invested in it. It is satire, like robots are socialist. Yeah. Are you going to cover the Pakistan elections? What do you mean, dude? The CIA elections? Y you mean the, the elections that the CIA-backed generals uh, are going to decide, regardless of the uh, showing? What, what What is there to cover? Whoever... Whoever... This... <laughs> <laughs> whoever the 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 state department decides uh is is uh, the the new leader of pakistan is the new leader of pakistan and that's how that like a lot of you guys think that like these are real elections okay you know how people talk about like oh, oh this is a banana republic elections are stolen like no that's that actually is like a a fake election Helldivers 2 is always online. My girlfriend was excited for it. The first one, loves the first one, is super disappointed. Oh, God. I don't like always online games. I just, but whatever. I mean, it is co-op, right? When Tucker went on full send about six months ago, I swear every streamer and YouTuber were collectively choosing not to cover or talk about it. Well, yeah, because Tucker had fallen off, but now he's like up again. You know what I mean? Tucker Carlson glazes Putin. Tucker Carlson glazes Putin, uh, and also um, Zelensky fires general and more comrade border patrol later. Get in now. It's because it's an online war being played out together as a community. Why Helldivers 2 is always online. 
I think always online is ridiculous and there should absolutely be a not always online mo uh, mode. Did Tucker post the interview? No, at 3 p.m. Pacific. Um, Skull and Bones open beta is out on Ubisoft and you should give in to your pirate urges. Don't worry. Don't worry. I will be doing Skull and Bones. Hashtag ad. Um, but uh, that's later this week. Yeah, one piece ass shit, dude. You already know it, baby. Gaming is back. Hashtag ads are back. Did you see Undertaker presenting the Riyadh season trophy after the Al Nasser Al Hilal game? That's so funny. Guys, هذه البطولة هذه الكأس التي بعد حفل موسيقي. Wait, is there a green screen? مع Undertaker طبعا. Is that it? What is this? Oh no, it's just like straight up. التي بعد حفل موسيقي مع أندرتيكر طبعا الكثير. They have AK cameras blocked from his entrance. Are you going to talk about the Bowser plan law that just passed in DC's literal fascism? No. Ah, uh, cool shirt. Where from? Will Hasanabi finally tell me about his drip? Stay tuned. Bro, it literally shows you the brand. It's Carhartt. Okay. This is so white orb coded. Everything Saudi Arabia does is white orb coded. I don't know what, how else to describe it. Do we have a good blast off meme or what, dude? Do we got a blast off, blast off a Rooney? Or no? I mean, bomb lefts, that's a little weird. I know you made me planked in. It looks like I'm a freaking car hard whip or just a uh, regular car hard. I don't know. It might be whip. What the fuck is even Saudi Arabia anymore? Uh, it is uh, Saudi Arabia is the up and coming nation, baby. So much sports washing. Carhartt isn't drip. It's just the Alaskan uniform. Yeah, I mean, it's drip is what you make it. Carhartt WIP is their like, is their is their fuckboy uh, urban gear division. Not sure if you heard, but adult film performer Whitney Wright is receiving backers for posing photos from a prior visit to Iran. She's been supportive of Palestinian emancipation. I have not seen that. What the fuck? Anyway, you do look like a Middle Eastern Eskimo. To be fair, that's crazy. You see the new Doc Martin Rick boots? I sadly missed a drop today. There was a Doc Martin Rick Owens boot collab. Those are like two brands that I never thought would get together. That has to be the most aesthetically pleasing blue on the beanie. Thank you. I opened the Mr. Beast box already. Yes. If you started glazing Saudi, you might find the actual one piece. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm I'm that is my that's my that's my retirement plan is is just like say fuck this shit. I love the American State Department. I love Saudi Arabia. And just uh, you know. I will find I will find myself suspiciously aligning with everything that the American State Department believes. Like, for example, uh fake democracy everywhere else, real democracy in Pakistan. You know what I mean? Like extra genocide happening in china the worst kind of genocide that's ever happened okay not like some cultural genocide or whatever these like woke libtards try to claim like the real genocide is happening in china and no genocide is happening in palestine which doesn't exist and palestinian people don't exist like that type of shit you know what i mean that's the shit i'm going to be on for my retirement <clears throat> at what age were you when you realized that people humans only act in self-interest and not with moral principle um i don't know i mean i think that i think that you can still be self-interested and and want what's best for others it's more so about like i don't think it's like altruistic i don't think my advocacy is altruistic people don't understand that my advocacy for 
uh, a, a world that I think would be better run revolves around making things better for everyone so that, you know, everyone can, can foster, everyone can grow, you know, link up and build type shit. That's the shit I'm on here. I often make this exact, I often make this argument on homelessness, right? Like I am not a social worker. I don't know how to deal with a person having a mental health episode and taking a shit. My mom calls you the next Jimmy Dore. That's so funny. Yeah, totally. Um, ask your mom. And uh, I mean, your mom's just saying that because I stopped fucking her. But ask your mom and, and anyone else who like legitimately thinks or says such things. Uh, give, them, give them like two to three years. They'll be, they'll be chirping about how like uh, the Republicans are actually better. I will never vote for a Republican. I will never, I will never have a reactionary bone in my body. People who think that the Democratic Party champions liberal and progressive causes are infinitely closer to becoming Jimmy Dore style pushers of, of, you know, MAGA ideas and reactionary ideas than someone like myself. People fundamentally do not understand that. I, I think that's the problem. Like people straight up legitimately do not understand. Yeah. That they are like those who defend the Democratic Party's actions unconditionally. Those who defend America's actions unconditionally are infinitely closer to reactionary politics than myself. Uh. Here. As far as like self-interest goes, though, people shape their morality around self-interest. Most people don't think of themselves as cynical and evil. People will support genocide because they're convinced themselves they're protecting gay people or some shit. Yeah. Um, as far as like an altruistic or I guess like a self-interested argument for like making sure that there are no homeless people is, for example, uh, the reality that many of us are not social workers. Okay. I myself am not. A social worker. I don't know how to deal with someone who is like genuinely going through a mental health episode. Okay. And like maybe even taking a shit outside of my house. I don't know how to deal with that. But you know who does? People who have professionally trained to deal with that kind of thing. Okay. Why the fuck am I paying taxes if the government is not funding the people that are supposed to be professionally dealing with that sort of thing? Why the fuck am I paying taxes and, and, uh, and, and building, uh, hoping that like we have a, a local government that is like ready to deal with these on, with these incoming crises. Okay. It's so dumb. Liberals look at that situation and go, no, you don't understand real, pro real progress is like letting the homeless person shit outside of your fucking house and just like live in the street and eat dirt and trash and like look the other way and act like it's not happening. That's not being a progressive person at all. Okay. My argument is like, from a selfish perspective, I don't want a homeless person, e even like from a moral perspective, of course, no one should be eating fucking dirt and trash. Okay. But from a selfish, self-interested perspective, I don't want that. It's kind of scary. Okay. The notion that like a lot of, uh, you know, online anarchists will do stuff like this, where they're like, if you see someone smoking crack on the fucking you know, Metro in front of your children, like, you know, look the other way or look aside, like let them have the fucking, let him, let him enjoy a little bit of libations. Like, it's like, no, I mean, that's still like not a good thing. You know what I mean? That's still not a good thing. Okay. Obviously you shouldn't go and like, uh, call the police on that person and like get them, uh, get the cops to just like arrest this person or whatever. But like the system should be able to, work in the direction where where that kind of stuff doesn't happen that is what real prosperity is supposed to look like okay that person should not have to do crack on the fucking metro station anyway that person should be able to do crack inside of their own homes okay just like Many Americans do whatever kind of fucking drugs they consume in the comfort of their own shelter, permanent shelter.
Why not call the police on them? Because I know what the fuck's going to happen to that person. It's, just, it's entirely dependent on like what the person is doing. You know what I mean? Yeah, obviously, if someone attacks you, it's a little different. But Anyway. This isn't a crack house. This is a crack home. Exactly. Exactly. Dude beating his meat on a packed MTA train the other day. I honestly wanted the cops to come and beat his ass. See, that's what I mean. Like, the dude beating his meat. Police shouldn't be dealing with that. Social workers should be dealing with that. Like, But that is a crime. Understandably, that is a crime. But that person is like doing a crime because they have fucking lost their minds. Okay. <laughs> Drake. <laughs> Someone said, yeah. <laughs> how come, how come when a, when a homeless person is beating their meat uh, while they're in transit, it's a problem. But when Drake beats his meat in his private jet, the entire world wants to talk about his penis. Yeah. So this is the fourth cock watch in 48 hours. We need to talk, brother. There is nothing more uh, there is nothing more heterosexual than talking about another man's meat. I don't agree with you on that. They should smoke crack on the subway. It only reflects the reality we live on. No, dude. No. No, you should not do crack on the subway. That's insane. <laughs> I don't agree with that. You should also not masturbate on public transit. You should not piss on public transit. You should not masturbate on public transit. You shouldn't do those things. Those things are not good. Okay. And mo the, the, the goal should be to fix the underlying issues that cause someone to masturbate in front of people on public transit. That's what the goal should be. Okay? That's my goal at the very least. Do you understand? What if, what do I do if I see someone playing league on the subway? Okay, that's jailable for sure. But it feels good to them. What else do they have? Brother, what do you mean? That's an insane approach. I don't think you're being serious. Uh, he's saying it takes people to see crack smoked in public to realize how fucked the system is. What if I'm just pro smoking crack in public? What then? Yeah. All right. Anyway. So that's my, that's my approach. And it's like, that's a selfish argument for socialism is that I don't want to deal with homeless people on the streets. Okay. I don't want there to be homeless people on the streets. It makes sense that people go, Oh, that's kind of weird that there's like a person who is genuinely having a mental health episode in the middle of the fucking street in public. And I can see their dick and their asshole at the same time. Because of the unique way that they are standing. Okay? That's not great. That's not a great thing. I'm not going to sit here and be like, no, just let the let the guy do that. Okay? Obviously, that's not great. So what the fuck? What are we doing? There you go. That's a selfish way to uh, abolish, at, or at least like there's a selfish way to advocate for more socialization. Okay? Because I don't want to deal with it personally. I want there to that problem to not exist. What is this? Trying to get recruited to the Texas Civil yeah, War? My dad, like, he wanted me to, like, come down here just, like, check it out. Because I heard, like, we're going, we're headed for, like, a civil war. So that's why. You fucking with me? You heard that? Where'd you hear that? On TikTok? <laughs> All right. Do you not know what's going down at the border? No, I mean, I know what's going on down at the border. I want to, like, help my, my state country now i mean we're headed towards like independence right like abbott's gonna be the new president so like yeah well yeah you guys are talking about separating from the union oh, we're our own country now i thought so two different armies you 
You have the state largest army is the federal That's army. Jack yeah, I'm not trying to fight for the like the government. I'm trying to fight for my new government, oh, Texas. I got you. I got you. Yeah. Like, I, I'm not sitting here arguing that. I'm just telling you it's two different. That's awesome. What makes you say that a person wants a home? Are you going to criminalize unhoused people? Yes. If you are, if you have the opportunity to live inside of a house and you refuse to do so, you should literally go to a mental institution. I do agree with that, by the way. Yes. If you're one of those like trust the fairy and boho chic motherfuckers out there. Yes. I will come and personally apprehend you. Call me the motherfucking punisher. I am literally the fucking red beret guardian angel. For those dumb motherfuckers who are like, no, I voluntarily want to fucking actually live on the sidewalk. Okay. Yes. You do not know you. I will make Stalin look like a fucking anarchist. Okay. If you are the type of motherfucker who's like, Hey, guess what? I want to live on the sidewalk voluntarily. Yeah. I'm putting you in fucking jail. Okay. You're going to jail. Abolish prisons except for that guy. Do you understand? Straight up. Straight the fuck up, dude. First, I'm put your ass in a shower, okay? One, you're getting a haircut because I know I can smell your hair from here, okay? You're getting a haircut and you're taking a shower and then you are forcibly living inside of permanent shelter, which is called prison, okay? This guy said, what about people who are voluntarily living outside? Like, that's insane. Okay. <laughs> okay, man. Yeah, that's called being crazy and needing like mental health. Do you understand? People voluntarily live outside because shelters are awful and violent. Okay. And they can't bring their things or their pets to the shelters. Most people, almost every single person is not voluntarily homeless. That is like an idiotic right-wing fantasy that like, yeah, no, these guys actually fucking want to be homeless. Like, shut the fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> fucking campers and backpackers to the gulag? Yes. If you are outside... If you are outside and living in a tent, I'm putting you in jail. Do you understand? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they associate all homeless people with the crust punk trust the Farians. That's how they square that circle. I guess so. That's so funny. That's so funny to be like, hey, I know there's like a quarter of a million almost homeless people in this country. I don't know what the actual number is. It might be even more than that. Okay. And like 99.999% of all of those people are in those conditions. More than that, almost a million. Okay. Half a million homeless people, more than half a million homeless people in this country. Almost every single one is literally there due to systemic, uh, systemic violence, like structural violence of poverty, the housing market being like absolutely unimaginably uh, uh, unaffordable that like basically pushes them into further depths of, of uh, insanity and crime and all this stuff. Right. But hey, guess what, dude? There's like 11 trustafarians out there. How are we going to deal with that? It's giving it's giving we have to give the death penalty. We have to keep the death penalty because of the, the, the one like Omega rapist. OK, yeah. <laughs> yeah dude there's sometimes there are like super rapists out there you know so we just got to keep the death penalty or we have to we have to put you know low level offenders in perma jail because uh because serial killers exist You have no idea. Roof fell in. We report it and they wouldn't renew our lease currently in a motel. Yeah. <laughs> there are children of millionaires pretending to be homeless. Are you suggesting we help them? Yeah. Like, yeah, we help them by putting them in jail. 
If you're a YouTuber that does like, oh, I tried being homeless for a day, jail. If you're like a trust, uh, a trust fund kid, okay, and you're like, oh, no, you don't understand. I like living off the land. And by the land, I mean like the pavement, okay? I like living in this tent, and you can't take that away from me. Jail. If you're just like regular old homeless and you lived out of your car for a year uh, and until you could you couldn't even make those payments anymore, even though you had a job the entire fucking time. And now, you know, nobody l wants to let you couch search anymore, uh, couch surf anymore. And you're just per you're just cooked. You can't go to the shelter because you have a bunch of stuff and the shelter won't take it. And last time you went to the shelter, you were assaulted or had your stuff stolen. Then you deserve a house, not jail. Okay. That's my, I'm a tanky in that direction. I'm, I'm vicious. Um, but yeah, that's my, that's my approach to this subject. <laughs> Dad would kill me if I fought for the Biden army, you know? So like, I'm and not trying to do army, that. His army, it's my army. It's his army and his army and her army and his army. Biden's army. Pull out your phone. All of our numbers. Oh, your numbers? Yeah. I mean, I probably won't be calling you guys. But I know. Like, so like, I'm yeah, not trying to do that. Army. Dude, recruiters are so funny. They are the most predatory motherfuckers out there. They are so funny. He does not care. He knows this kid's like messing around, but he's like, I'll still take it. It's my army. It's his army and his army and her army and his army. Biden's army. Pull out your phone. All of our numbers. Oh, your numbers? Yeah. I mean, I probably won't be calling you guys. But I know. Like, thank you, sir. Yeah, no I appreciate problem. you. Hey, I hope I don't have to shoot you, man. All right? Because you'll be fine for the government. I'll be fine for Texas. <laughs> this is awesome. Would the people who sell their homes to become van people be on the same level? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, jail for those guys, too, because I think they're annoying. Yeah, if you do van life, if you sell your house, I know someone actually that did that. He's a really nice guy. But still, jail for you. Okay? Jail. No more van life. Come on, man. You know I'm right. You know I'm right. In your heart of hearts, think about what I'm saying. Really internalize what I'm saying and recognize that I'm 100% right. It would be a better society. Like, why are you living in a van? What are you hiding? Are you, only people who are the only type of uh, the only type of van life that is like appropriate is if you're literally like a serial killer or like a Bonnie and Clyde situation where you're like a bank robber, you're a serial bank robber or like a con man. And you just have to go from like locality to locality to, to do new tricks because they figured out your game. Okay. It's ridiculous. It's actually ridiculous. If you're just like a regular accountant working from home, your home should not be on wheels. I'm sending you to fucking jail. Okay. Are you trying? Are you trying to be murdered in a gruesome, in a gruesome way inside of a fucking national, uh, in, inside of a national park? Because that's what happens. I feel like all the van livers, uh, van life people, they get just like ruthlessly executed in a national park that's like somehow in the jurisdiction of three different states. So technically, it's not a area that exists under like American jurisdiction at all. So they will never find your body and they'll never prosecute your killers. You know what I mean? Don't do that. Don't be a van lifer. You will get murdered in the most gruesome way. And then no one will care about it. There will be no criminal prosecution. What time is ad gaming? Um, 35 year old recruiter planked an ass. <laughs> No, I'm not. I'm not doing uh, ad gaming today. I'll probably do it. Uh, I'll probably do it later this week. Most murders on Parkland are gang executions. Don't ask me how I know. Hassan got that white woman podcast brain rot. Yeah, it's called being realistic. Okay. A couple chatters are acting ob obtuse. You're obviously not talking about nomadic people. What? What do you mean nomadic people? Like, are you talking about, like, me? Like, I'm... Oh, like, Romani people? <laughs> ah! That's so funny. Yeah, no, I'm not talking about Romani people. Okay. Well, I guess I did say uh, people in vans that go from city to city because they're running, like, little schemes. 
<laughs> oh, Jesus. Oh, <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. That's not. <laughs> that's not what I. <laughs> No, there is an exception for there's an exception for Romani people because like first of all, I didn't even know that there were Romani people in America. Okay. I thought that was like only European server racism. You know what I mean? I thought that that was like only that's the only that that racism is only unlocked in the Euro servers. Like they don't have that in America. They don't know what the fuck that is. They look at like they look at Romani people, they're like, what what is that? Like, are you are you a Mexican? What kind of Mexican are you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but carnies get a pass too exactly no 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 that's what i mean that's like in the future utopia in the future uh united socialist states of america okay in that utopian future like that is a government offered position i believe that carnies and roma people can have like a uh, special designated government permission to run little like tricks and schemes and go from city to city. Everyone else that doesn't have the proper protocol, if they don't have the proper paperwork, I'm sending you to jail, okay? You need to be a government carny, and you can only be a government-sanctioned, uh, protected people's uh, Roma people. Look at you betraying your Turkish Turkic nomadic roots. That's why I was laughing. Anyway, all this contraband police power went to your head. True. But they have to go back to caravans with horses, old school style. That'd be sick. If I come up to the gates and it's you who asked me for my papers. Yes. I feel like I'm stupid for getting sensitive. My dad has to live in his camper because the bank took his house when his siblings passed. Good to know he'll die gruesomely though. Yes, you are getting incredibly sensitive. This is what is known as a joke. I am joking. Okay, I'm going to spell it out. I'm joking. Okay, this is called a joke. Also, the entire premise, like the serious side of this joke is that I'm sure your dad would rather live in a home. Your cancer father would rather live in a home and not have the bank fucking take the home away from him. That was the point I was making originally. Like that's the serious side of it. And then the joking side of it, it you know, spiraled into me making fun of van life influencers. Don't tell the chatter. People also sometimes have to tell you they're joking. Yeah, the difference is I'm a human being that you can watch on camera so I can emote. I'm reading 3,000 fucking lines a, mu a minute from anonymous accounts that have no way of emoting whether they're joking or not. So yeah, for me to be able to pick up on whether you're joking or not is a little bit different than me, a human being that you have you know been subscribed to, that you've avoided the ads on for like 36 months. Uh, who you have developed a better understanding of his worldview and politics on is going to be like, I assume, I hope it's going to be easier for you versus me looking at a random chat. You know what I mean? I hope you understand. Yeah. Did you like that? That was such a fucking solid ad break segue. You didn't even hear it. You didn't even see it. But at the top of the hour, there's a three minute ad break. And if you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe for $5 or for free with the Twitch Prime by connecting your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account. Okay? That's right. Weak Saws 1 out of 10? Get the fuck out of here. Okay, some of you guys are real Nazis on this, okay? Here's a three minute ad break now. Ugh. Half of your chat is autistic. You should know we can't tell sarcasm and jokes very easily. Yeah, that's why I do like a shit ton of of like uh, explaining joke moments and things of that nature. All right, let's get started on uh, the fake Pakistani elections. So so far, the preliminary results have Imran Khan's party. I think I got to point with 
leading in 136 districts. That's three times the next closest one. But you're now seeing reports in Pakistan of, of two separate things. Uh, one, the army is in the streets, the police are in the streets, they're surrounding polling stations, and you're seeing a lot of reports and videos of efforts to change the votes. They're kicking election officials out. There's a lot of concern that that number 136 by tomorrow morning in Pakistan could be pushed down lower. Separately, you're seeing also uh, surface in, in Pakistan an attempt by the kind of military-connected uh, uh, officials to take the independents who are associated with PTI and pressure them to join other parties. So even though Imran Khan's party might win a majority, after torture and bribery, you could have a different government take power. So you've, from the podium, stood up for free and fair elections. But free and fair elections are one thing, but if you torture your way to a majority after that, that doesn't quite that doesn't quite live up to kind of the values that you were stating from there. So this seems like a pretty pivotal moment for Look, kind Ryan, of America and, the, and Pakistan relations. Look, so. Ryan, the thing about preliminary uh, results is that they are uh, preliminary, and uh, I am not going to get ahead of any official results, and so I'm not going to uh, comment or speculate further on what uh, a government could look like, what the makeup could be, or anything like that. So you would what be I okay just, if, what, what I will they, just reiterate again right. is that we condemn uh, all instances of election-related violence, even <laughs> some of the kinds that you are describing, uh, that took place in the weeks preceding. Yeah, dude, you don't understand. It's just like different over there. Pakistan media has the excuse that it is directly controlled by the military. What on earth is the excuse of the New York Times? Okay. Hmm. How did this happen, dude? As results begin to trickle in Thursday evening, the party of former Prime Minister uh, Nawaz Sharif, the military's preferred party of the moment, was still expected to win, but it did not look like it would pull off the easy victory that it was widely predicted. Parliamentary candidates allied with another former Prime Minister, Imran Khan, were neck and neck with Mr. Sharif's party. In many races in Punjab, the country's most populous province and political heartland. Dude. Dude. It's, it's just like, this is precisely, for the record, this is precisely why I say that when America talks about, like, democracy, liberal values, rule-based international order, all of that is a lie, <laughs> okay? Like, our enemies, our enemies, our political enemies, our foreign adversaries have better elections than this. And yes, I mean Venezuela, okay? This is not a defense of Venezuela or Maduro, by the way. But having said that, even fucking, even fucking Maduro has like third party, uh, third party officiators involved in his elections. Whereas like the Pakistan one is almost analogous to the Venezuela situation, okay? With respect to jailing your political opposition, Right. Whereas like America has nothing for it because they're an ally and because we don't want Imran Khan to be uh, the prime minister any longer. And we want the military to continue controlling. I mean, and Imran Khan is like a it's not like Imran Khan, by the way, deviates from the American perspective all that much. Hassan Abi Doctrine demonstrating again. Why didn't the U.S. take a direct approach in this? Because no, the U.S. did take a direct approach in this. Okay. This is the U.S.'s direct approach. Bro, there is no world in which, like, like him, hate him, doesn't matter, okay? Imran Khan definitely uh, is, is one of those figures where it's like, it's the, same, it's the same thing that I've brought up with Erdogan, right? It's like, well, he's not, like, he's not not corrupt, okay? But he's, I guess, somewhat less corrupt. And also, he's my corrupt, okay? He's my guy, right? I'm a Pakistani guy, and he is my guy. Whereas the other guy is going to also be corrupt, if not more corrupt, and then he's also not going to be my guy at all. He's going to be America's guy. So people, when they have that choice, they're always going to go with their guy that is not a direct puppet of the United States of America, okay? And that is what's happening in this circumstance as well. Hassan Abi is the reason why I'm happy I hate politics. Do you actually know all of this stuff? L adds L corrupt the streamer. 
Do you actually know all of this stuff? Or are you just spewing what you think it is? I mean, is Imran Khan and his entire party arrested or not? Does the Pakistani military rule Pakistan or not? Is the Pakistani military directly controlled by the CIA or not? These are all questions you must ask yourself. And the answer is going to be yes to all of them. Okay. So why is the United States of America not taking a position that is similar to Venezuela in this circumstance? Okay. That's one of the takes that makes me know you understand the third world. We will always prefer our homegrown despots and the foreign place ones. That's the one of the takes that makes me know you understand the world. Exactly. That's it. And a lot of Americans don't get it because they think like, why don't they want this guy that the New York Times is portraying as like, you know, uh, uh, on board with the things that I like. And it's because that's a lie. They're lying. America's preferred candidates are not actually like, they don't actually have good politics. Okay. They don't. It's just the media tells you that they do. So you don't have any other interest in like figuring out if that's true or not, or even getting a better understanding of what the people on the ground feel about the situation. That's the issue. Okay. And yes, this is still my opinion, by the way. This is like, I mean, I'm, I'm basing my opinion off of facts, but it's still my opinion. That seems to be what happened in the El Salvador election this week, too. Dude is a bit of a wannabe dictator. Yes. Um, <laughs> I say formerly Palestinian Bukele uh, is, is, well, I, I would say he's more aligned with like State Department interests than uh, you'd think. But he is profoundly popular, I guess, in El Salvador. But he is also a psychopath. Okay? He is literally a fucking psychopath. He's loved. You know, there, he, definitely, he definitely has a, a... Definitely popular, despite the fact that he... Um, despite the fact that he chose to change his country's currency to crypto and... and and all this stuff. He did used to be a, a, a bit of a leftist, I guess, or people thought he was a leftist. Uh, I've, I've written him off since the crypto shit, even though he is, um, even though he is, uh, he is Palestinian, technically. Uh. Anyway. My partner and her whole family were born in El Salvador. He's done so much good for the country, but it's super sketchy the way he's getting things done. She's torn about supporting him or not. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, he's the crypto bro who like does like dragnet arrests on every single person, but also at the same time, El Salvador is fucked. So I don't even know how you would deal with that situation at all. I'm Salvador and I can vouch everyone loves him. He's done the best job at making the country safe. I don't know what the crypto situation is. Haven't heard anything about that. Bro, how are you going to be Salvadorian and be like, and not know that your nation's currency is just like, is, is fucking a peg to the Bitcoin. <laughs> That's crazy. But I mean, I guess it makes sense. Uh, it's just like, this how Americans don't know a shit ton about what's going on in their country and they live here. You know what I mean? Anyway, he's, um. They use the USA dollar, I think, too. Nobody uses the local currency anyway, and everybody uses the dollar. Generally speaking, Arun Anal says, uh, Indian Hassanabi says, generally speaking, my analysis of this is that the Pakistani military and the U.S. State Department align on a lot of issues, but it's not as though the Pakistani military takes 100% market share orders from the U.S. It's a bit more nuanced than that. It's a holdover from the Cold War when Pakistan aligned with the U.S. because India backed the USSR. Um, I mean, but it, but they, I feel like the Pakistani military one runs the country and two definitely still is like aligned with America's interests and will do things that the American government wants them to do. Am I wrong on that? I don't know. It's kind of like, um, Assad Arabia. Okay. Assad Arabia has its own interests in the region uh, is a powerful ally, but, and, and we'll do things from time to time that the United States goes, Hey, Assad Arabia, don't do that. That's kind of fucked up. Why did you chop an American journalist? That's like not chill. Okay. But they still kind of do that when they want to. 
as long as broadly they are on board with everything else that the United States wants them to do. Salvador and my mom watches their news all the time. She was showing me all proud of the massive prison they built and the president showing it off while I was watching it horrified. It's the largest prison, I think, in the Western Hemisphere. I'm leftist, but I think his crime reforms are good. Like the Salvadoran situation is different from America. Sometimes harsh measures are needed. It's a client state in the literal sense of the word client. Pakistan does whatever it wants because it buys a shit ton of hardware from the U.S. Yeah, it's like that. The thing is, like, I think the Imran Khan situation, as far as I understand it, is, like, quite literally related to uh, him not being uh, lockstep with U.S. interests all the time, even if it was, like, aesthetically not lockstep with U.S. interests. Like, that was enough for America to write him off. If that makes sense. Ukele and Mele retweet every single positive mention they get on Twitter like they're Detroit rappers. <laughs> That's awesome. What is this? Why Naib Bukele's re-election matters from friend of the show, Bianca Gralau. Naib Bukele accomplished what presidents before him couldn't. He broke the gangs that used to control El Salvador, but how? And who's paying for the consequences? This video was done in collaboration with El Faro. Bianca, I would like to know who is funding you. Based on what you're trying to do in this video, I can probably guess who is funding your videos. Um, I have seen people die in the neighborhood. Bus drivers who were arrived by mistake and disappeared. As a Salvadoran resident of the capital, I can tell you that gang members are collaborators. Um, people will see that the whole thing is inhumane as fuck in like 10 years. I think there are some nuances with respect to massive arms deals for fighter jets and other weapons from China and Imran Khan denying anything happening to the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. No, I don't know. That's, that's ridiculous. You want to know why that's ridiculous? The entire Arab world denies that anything happened to the fucking Uyghurs in Xinjiang, mostly for the exact same reasons as to why, uh, that Imran Khan did. So we are not treating any other fucking Arab leader in the same way that we're treating, uh, Imran Khan. And also, Nobody gives a shit. Like, America does not actually care about Muslim safety. Like, let's be real. Um, I think it's more so that, like, because even at a time when, um, what was it? Like, the, the, Air, the League of Arab Nations or whatever the fuck it's called, like, their, their position on the Uyghur uh, situation in Xinjiang is that nothing was going on there as well. And at the time, I remember yelling at chatters who would bring that up to me because they were like, Hassan, you say that there's like a cultural genocide happening uh, to the Uyghurs in, in Xinjiang, but you know, the, the Arab leadership in Arab nations don't believe that they disagree with it. And I would literally argue with them that like their sentiment on this does not fucking matter because they are not going to be reflective of one, the reality on the ground. And two, they're not going to be even reflective of like the Muslim world in general. Their opinion oftentimes is a, a political one. Their their goal uh, or their their uh, their their statements are guided by their own personal interest and in, like maintaining uh, a relationship with China, for example, a positive one. So, Xinjiang, I know, uh is Xinjiang. Imran's opposition, even to the army, was very marginal, having more civilian control over higher up army appointments and not even trying to actually break the monopoly of army in Pakistan. Yeah. Um, come to Xinjiang. It's open to tourism. Yeah, dude. Why did America not clap Modi like they clapped uh, Imran Khan? Modi is way more pro-Putin. I, uh, I think 
Well, f one, it's India. I'd focus more on the massive arms deal with China, which Arab states and the men of region have tried and have been massively opposed by the U.S. and thus not subsequently gone through. In Pakistan, the opposite happened despite major pressure. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the major reasons. That's what I mean. Yeah, you're, you're right on this. I think that, that definitely is a bigger focus here. America does not like it when you do arms deals with foreign adversaries like China or like Russia. Okay. Um, there is perhaps no better example of this than Turkey getting missile defense systems from Russia. For example, America does not like that. Okay. You are not allowed. That is not a thing that you can do. Also, um, I think the, our allegiance with India is that like, uh, India is the Western backed, uh, liberal equivalent, liberal capitals equivalent of China in the most reductive terms. Imran Khan was not truly anti-American in the way he presented himself. He was just not compliant enough. And America just gave their blessings for a soft coup that was probably going to happen anyway. Imran Khan was already running a foul to military due to internal reasons as well. Yeah. That's why I'm saying like it took, it, it was for nothing for the most part. Like, that's what I was trying to stress in this circumstance. As far as, like, what I've read from The Intercept reporting on the matter, like, the reasons as to why Imran Khan was, was uh, quickly, uh, you know, on pack watch, I guess, is very marginal. Like, it, it's more aesthetic even. Because, like, Imran Khan's, you know, Imran Khan going to Russia and meeting up with Vladimir Putin. Like, these are all things that, depending on where you are on the ally list, okay, on the client state list, depending on like your level of importance, you can get away with. Erdogan did similar shit and is still doing similar shit. You know what I mean? So, or even Modi has like obviously uh, been, even Modi has utilized the the uh, invasion of Ukraine to benefit uh, and, and be like a third party mediator for Russian gas, right? Like it's basically become a, a third party facilitator of that kind of thing. So um, all of that is, is seen as permissible depending on like the give and take. India has a much stronger institution. which makes it more difficult to actually stir shit up in China is seen as opposition to Chinese influence in Indochina. Exactly. That I think is another big reason for India, of course. So, yeah. Was pack watch a pun? Oh my God. I didn't even think about that. It, it, it is a bit of a pun. I, I didn't even do that on purpose. As for India, Modi is still walking a tightrope between Russia and India because of their longstanding alliance with the USSR, but he's more am amenable to the U S than previous administrations. Yeah. I, I think Modi rides for the U S am I crazy? Arun does Modi not ride for the U.S. interest like crazy. Yeah, he's a, he's a big time. Uh, he is big time backed by Western interests in general. Modi rides for money. Yeah, but like they're anti-China. This you? What do you mean? Indian alliance with the USSR is pretty old, so US has made a bunch of exceptions for India to collaborate with Russia and even Iran. India has no sanctions on it, even when they trade when we trade with Iran. He's still beholden to the relationship India has with Russia because India still gets a lot of stuff like hardware from Russia even today. This you? Yes, it is me. With the exception of Ukraine and buying Russian energy products and arms, which is a common position in the global South. Um, well, I focus more on the massive arms deal with China, which Arab states in the middle region have tried and have been massively opposed to. Yeah. Um, <sighs> anyway. I think it didn't take much to, to 
the push for his ouster is what I'm saying. But the point is, the point is this, okay? What is happening in Pakistan happens at a foreign adversary, like a no-no nation, a nation that is not a client state, for example. America goes nutty mode. They literally write articles about how democracy is stolen, okay? If there is a coup, a soft coup or a hard coup in a not perfectly aligned nation state that is being led by someone who is like a social democrat or something, specifically in Latin America, America will go, finally the people are rising up and taking over in the most democratic way possible. Even if like you see videos of the coup that is occurring and you're like, well, these guys are like Christian fascists. The fuck do you mean? They'll be like, no, 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 you don't understand. It's actually for good. Bolivia is a great example that comes to mind. So it, it is more so about what you read in the news when it comes to foreign policy and what really is like frustrating for a lot of people that listen to what I have to say about foreign policy in general is that the reason why I almost always take the America bad position or I land on that side on many instances is because America has its fingers in every pie, okay? That's what happens when you are the hegemonic superpower, okay? And... When the New York Times or other organs of State Department propaganda in the United States that otherwise do a lot of great coverage, okay, uh, when they write things with objective, neutral tone, that's not always going to be exactly the, the way things are on the ground. If you take that in and you don't filter it through the lens of what kind of propaganda am I reading right now? What are the interests at play here in the way that I am, uh, in the way that I'm, I'm being presented the story? Uh, you will, you will fall for this very common trick that America plays all the time. Right wing reactionaries don't need to do that. So if you're on Fox News, they're just easily going to be like, "Yeah, these guys are brown. They deserve death. Let's go." Right. But if you're a liberal, you have to have a more nuanced perspective to the reactionary American foreign policy. And that nuance usually comes from, well, these guys are homophobic. They're anti-LGBT. They are racist. <laughs> they are, uh, you know, they don't want the liberalization of markets. Like, they're very repressive. They're very authoritarian. And all this stuff, that is like usually, there, there needs to be like additional motivating factors as to why America has to involve itself. Even though when you look at the actual circumstances in which we involve ourselves there, oftentimes the material interest that is backing our side, our position is a very authoritarian one. Historically, we have seen examples of this all over Latin America, all over the world, as a matter of fact. Okay. You know what I mean? And that's what they do. Doing this is fucking Japan. I mean, anyway. Uh, also, this didn't get coverage even in Pakistan, but there was a bomb blast in Balochistan. I fucking, I'm going to say it wrong again. Balochistan? Um, just with the elections, at least 30 plus people were killed. And it's another attempt by the Pakistani state establishment to oppress Balok population well ahead of the election. Butchered. Yes, America bad, but keeping it 100p. If there's got to be a hegemon, it might as well be us. Yeah, dude. Yes, your position, unfortunately, in my opinion, lacks nuance and is understandably selfish. Does that make sense? Like a lot of people feel the way that you do, which is why they have an immediate reactionary uh, distaste to the kind of coverage that I offer when it comes to foreign policy. I do not place... A, a, a different i i don't place a different uh, uh level of value to people in living in like foreign nations that are people living in foreign nations that's that's usually where i deviate from a lot of people you know 
it's very it's very selfish for people to think that way and i can describe why i can describe why that selfishness is the exact same modus operandi of capital owners that end up reinforcing the position that you're in that actually fucks you over okay imperialism being the highest stage of capitalism highest state of capitalism imperialism being a necessity under a capitalist organization of the economy uh can can very in in almost identical ways uh work as an analog for your experiences domestically the approach that you have as a part of uh the the western world and the imperial core to america being the leader the dominant force on the planet and and not really caring about not really caring about like what happens to all of those in the periphery in the third world under unequal exchange that we benefit from in the imperial core is the exact same approach that many rich people have to you know how the country is run why should i care about health care i i got money i can pay for it i can pay for it so what if some poor people can't that means I can still get the best possible health care for myself. You know? When it comes to foreign policy, a lot of people can be a little bit more selfish because the media will feed into your selfish perspective regularly by giving you, uh, by drip feeding you information that helps you feel more reinforced. Uh, in your position that like America has to be the dominant force. It'll also, they'll also fear monger to a ridiculous degree. Huh. Anyway. Isn't this the trust fund baby champagne socialist guy? Hell yeah. That is me. Um, Islamist fundamentalist trust fund baby uh champagne socialist <clears throat> oligarch an oligarch myself anyway um i love champagne socialist so much yeah champagne socialism is like a fun little thing yeah private jet flying i use pri i use my private jet probably more than taylor swift does if we're being real i'm in the top 30 I'm also a tanky too. I'm a I'm a jihadist communist backed by the Chinese government and the Iranian government pushing for Hamas to do Sharia law here in the United States of America, baby. Richer than Jeff Bezos, an oligarch in his own right, Islamist fundamentalist. I'm everything and nothing at the same time. I'm all the bad things. Whatever you think is bad, I'm I'm on it. That's my thing. I'm genuinely asking, but what does the media have to gain by fearmonger all the time? What do you mean? The media's entire role in society is to normalize the cruelty that you experience. That's what they do. And, and also tell you that an alternative is far too scary and would be far worse. That is the job. That's the primary responsibility of the media. Unsubscribed. I simp for my wife. Don't do it. I'm here to tell you that these right-wing weirdos I'll follow and try to sometimes engage have now started hating on Noam Chomsky. They found out who Noam Chomsky is. So now they hate him. I simp for your wife too, Chatter. Don't do it. I can't believe we lost another wife guy, dude. Wife guys are the best. They're the best and brightest. They are the best this country has to offer. Anyway, 
right, let's continue. the election as well as on election day. We also believe that these kinds of actions have affected a number of political parties across uh, Pakistan. And we're also concerned about the steps that were taken to restrict freedom of expression, specifically around internet and cell phone use. But again, I'm just not going to... Uh, just real quick, speculate like, on results or government makeup. But, let, but let's say the Pakistani people do elect a majority of independents associated with the PTI, but then after a bunch of backroom negotiations, which are accompanied by reports of torture, all of a sudden there's another candidate that has a majority. Would that be okay with the United I'm not States? Gonna, I'm not going to speculate You can't say that wouldn't be okay with the United on, States? I'm not going to hypothesize on a made-up uh, situation that you're just describing right now. We will, at there some are, point, I have no doubt that the United States of America will comment on the election, official election results when they happen. But till then, um, uh, we will defer to the uh, uh, electoral process, which we believe uh, we take very seriously. I do need to get a haircut. It's like getting out of control. It's getting way out of control. Especially because, like, I, um, yesterday, I hate it. Could we get a free sub for one million channel points? No. Ryan Grimm's entire job is to ask these people questions, and they'll say, I won't answer that to. Yeah, but he does such a good job. I love that they still keep having uh, people like Ryan Grimm uh, in that room, though. Like, almost every one of those journalists that is in the state department room like obviously the outside of the ones that like don't even need to be in that room because they're just like copy pasting whatever the fuck the state department is saying but those guys that are in that room they they do a lot of good work in my opinion including ryan Grimm, friend of the show ryan I'm amazed they haven't found some way to kick him out. No, there's more than Ryan Grimm. There's a lot of people that, that are in that room that do like pretty solid reporting. <sighs> of all the friends of the show, people you mentioned, Ryan is definitely the friendliest. Anyway. What is this? Have you seen this about Biden? He did not remember when he was in his interview with our office. Mr. Biden's memory was worse. He did not remember when he was vice president. Forgetting on the first day of the interview when his term ended. If it was 2013, when did I stop being vice president? And forgetting the second day of the interview when his term began in 2009. Am I still vice president? He did not remember even within several years... When his son Bo died and his memory appeared hazy when describing Afghanistan. The puppet theory was real all along. I'm going to be sick. I just want a president. I can analyze an actual historical actor. Is this really too much to ask? It's going to be 2029 and the most recent president to have actually been in charge will still have been Obama. Tears in my eyes. The report on Biden's handling of classified documents predicts that a jury wouldn't convict him because it would find him a well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. Oh, wait, what? I've never been more vindicated in my entire life. Oh my fucking God. Oh my God. Where are the libtards now? Where are the liberals now? I am so goddamn vindicated. Oh my God. Hassan, there's a massive crime wave. Why are you pro crime? Vindicated. Turns out everybody was fucking lying about it. Just like I said, Hassan, there's a massive problem with immigration. How do we deal with immigration? Vindicated. Okay. Hassan. I can't believe you're saying Joseph Robinette Brandon is demented, okay? Turns out, turns out he is so goddamn demented that a fucking jury saw that too. Special counsel Robert Hur says that there's evidence President Biden willfully retained and disclosed classifies, classified materials, but he will not be charged. We also have considered that at trial, Mr. Biden would likely present himself to a jury as he did during our interview of him as a sympathetic, well-meaning, elderly man with a poor memory, it said, based on our... Based on our direct interactions with our and our observations of him, he is someone who many jurors will want to identify uh, reasonable doubt. It would be difficult to convince a jury that they should convict them by then a former president well into his 80s of a serious felony that requires a mental state of willfulness. Oh my God, dude. 
They said he's literally too old to do crime. Remember what I've talked about before uh, with like old people? There's like a certain age that if you're above that and you do a crime, you should be able to get away with it because it's like, it's like a baby doing a crime. This is Joe Biden. Joe Biden is literally at that, at that stage in his life. Okay. Straight up. It's babies and it's old people. When you get to that certain point and you have the mechanical skills of a baby and your brain is like withered away that you are like a baby with a baby brain. Okay. Joe Biden is literally at that stage in his life. Oh my God. It's so sick. It's so fucking sick. Remember when Trump said women camera TV as a flex? It literally was. You know Hutch in his stream room cooking the worst meal you've ever seen right now? What? How does that not legally disqualify you from being the president? Um, I think, look, the most charitable interpretation of this special counsel report is that Biden is playing it up for a jury. That's what liberals will probably say. But God damn, dude, this is going to be, this is going to be such a fucking, oh, Fox News is going to literally, t Steve Deuce is going to take his cock out and fuck the paper that this justice, this 345 page Justice Department finding, okay? Brian Kilme is going to be like, let me fuck it after you, Steve Douchey. They're literally going to go nutty mode on it. Jesse Waters has already locked himself into a hyperbaric chamber, jerking off, masturbating, piece by piece. Every single one of them has paper cuts on their penises. Okay. Holy moly. Oh my God. I can't wait to see what the Fox five have to say about this, dude. They are going to ritualistically execute that one liberal that sits on the liberal chair, Jessica Tarlov or whatever. They're going to be like, Jessica line up. And then they're all going to fucking sever her head. Like as an ISIS decapitation video with the paper that they got from the Justice Department. Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, person, the person on the cuck chair today at Fox 5 is not going to have a good time, okay? It's Bukaki time. I hope it's, uh, it, it's, it's Geraldo that sits there today. If Trump takes a turn towards senility soon, do you think he's just picking up Biden strats? <sighs> I like that we are, by the way, decapitations are, are actually very in right now, especially for MAGA. Like ISIS kind of fell off on the decapitation front. You rarely ever see like a decapitation from ISIS, but you now the MAGA boys have picked up the, this, you know, picked up where the, where the ISIS boys left off. You know what I mean? They're like, yeah, we love decapitation. So who knows? How much do you think the story will come up during the election year? The Biden broken brain problem? Well, considering that it's Joseph Robinette Biden's number one, number one issue. This is literally like the Republicans abortion issue. You know what I mean? Democrats have one issue that they can always hammer on this election cycle and possibly in perpetuity. That issue is abortion. Republicans cut off access to abortion. They will always hit that vein every single time for the Republicans. They can always say Biden is senile. Biden is senile. Biden is fucking dumb. Biden is stupid. And it's true. How long until the liberals start saying, wow, you must be one Vladimir Putin backed and two backed by the MAGA party because you are also saying that Biden is senile, by the way. How, how much, how much you want to bet that that is what's going to happen? All right. This report is insane. This report is actually insane. Um, let's go to CNN to see how they're covering. Let's go to Fox News to see how they're. Ah, let's go to CNN first. 
I have to see what they're saying about this. Clear, and this report is clear. It is not the same legally what Biden did compared to what Trump did. Trump repeatedly given the chance to cooperate in his investigation did not. That is not what happened with Biden. But there's another part here, which is, does this politically invalidate that case? And that... God, Republicans are so good at, like, showing liberal hypocrisy. They're going to eat this up. Okay? Brother, if he willfully retained classified documents, okay, and then he gave it up when the investigators were like, let's get your uh, documents. What's happening? Are there any classified documents here? Yes, he's like one step above Donald Trump who very stupidly decided not to do that for some weird reason, which I still do not understand. But now, like, I mean, there are more oh, than just six or seven oh, different so examples of him not remembering. Oh, and just to oh, this week, as Sean's point was, oh, you know, he's not doing a Super Bowl interview. He's not giving press conferences. The former president sat in front of the cameras today and gave an entire news conference oh, on, on what he thinks the, the Supreme I'm Court busting. decision is going to mean for him. And we haven't heard from Joe Biden in quite some time. So it's I'm hard busting. to make I'm for, for the, I'm, I'm for the country bust. to believe the argument that he's I'm busting. Attack. I'm busting. And when you read this and you hear some of the current statements and you and the the absolute um, fact that he's not going to go before the country and answer a few questions from CBS, which is not going to exactly throw him uh, Nolan Ryan curveballs. Well, a lot to unpack there. I'm glad you're only referencing six or seven paragraphs out of 300 plus pages. So I would give him a pretty good grade for that. L let me just be clear. I care about what he's done pr as president legislatively. And I care what he's done from a foreign policy perspective. I'm glad we passed the money for the Ukraine, Taiwan, and Israel today. I hope the House does their job. We passed infrastructure bill, bipartisan. President Trump was talking about infrastructure week for four straight years and never passed it. I think we should spend time on looking at our successes Okay, as opposed to when he, you know, slipped on, 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 a, on, a, on a bit of a confusion on a 45-minute speech, when everyone does that. I'm not going to get into what's about ism, but we all know what I'm talking about. Okay, Katie Pavlich, to you, because it just seems to me like there is mounting evidence that maybe well, some people, yeah. when they have these polls that show, you know, 23% of the voters think that he has the ability to become president or be president again because of his, his mental acuity. Well, Trace, you mentioned the lack of access to the president. So on Tuesday, he said that he was going to talk to reporters today, Thursday afternoon, that he would answer their questions. Corrine Jean-Pierre, the White House press secretary, had to walk that back. Let's not forget the White House and uh, members of the Judiciary Committee leadership on Capitol Hill have had this report for probably a couple of days now, at least 24 hours. So they probably knew this was coming. Now President Joe Biden will land back on the South Lawn and he will be shouted questions from reporters instead of asking, uh, you know, answering them from the podium in the, the briefing mm -hmm. room, for example. So they're not allowing the American people to get answers on the issues that he supposedly wants to talk about outside of this report. And it also goes back to the issues that he's been facing over the past three years with the scandals that have been piling up, including his partnership and affiliation with Hunter Biden. Hunter Biden stayed in the Willington, Delaware house during mm -hmm. COVID. That's where he was in lockdown. He had access to that garage. There's photos of him driving the Corvette with the boxes in the background with people, strangers in the car yeah. who don't have background checks, who don't have security clearances. So this opens up a whole another issue for the White House, and they've tried to avoid talking about that. And there's big questions about why he wanted yeah. to keep the classified information. What was the purpose of that, especially given that Hunter Biden had so much access to it? And he was working with, uh, you know, uh, people around the world who do not like the United States of America and do not have the best interests of this country in mind. It seems like he should be more yeah. responsible as president than that. Katie makes a good point. I mean, his son had a substance abuse problem, had access to that house, had access to the garage. Sean Duffy, to you, we've got to go, but I want to get your fun. I'm not going to lie. This is like way, way chiller than I thought.
I thought they would be going dicko mode. I thought they'd be going sicko mode and dicko mode at the same time. It feels like CNN is going harder than fucking Fox it's not News. not pretty in the Department of Justice either. But the considerations as to why you're going to encase that sausage are all about how you can prove your case. And cooperation goes a very long way. Why? Not because it's a way of sort of kissing up, but because it undermines before a jury the notion that somebody is intentionally engaged in behavior that was nefarious and criminal. Now, the fact that there was- They're gonna say like, look, my, my assessment of this is that liberals will say, like the defense of this will be that, oh, they're not saying he's senile, they're saying he's well-intentioned and he comes across as like a kind, loving old man and that's the reason why there would be reasonable doubt, right? And it's actually Republican framing and Republican propaganda to, like, claim senility. Okay? That's what I would say. If I'm a liberal, DNC-backed, uh, you know, if I'm a DNC PR person, I'm turning around, one, getting mad at every single person uh, even bringing this up, because it's like... It's very obvious to me that you guys are, you know, it's it's nine o'clock Kremlin time, it seems. Oh, uh, what happened? Um, did the Tucker Carlson interview not satisfy your needs for Vladimir Putin's cock? And then I'm turning around and saying, <coughs> <coughs> I'm turning around and saying that it's not actually that he's senile. He just like reads as that in a courtroom. And that's enough of a legal standard for reasonable doubt. In. Well, the special counsel examined that proposition and thought that was the strongest case to make for a prosecution. But because of the manner in which the documents were kept, the appearances that it was among a number of household different items and beyond suggests that it was not intended to be kept secret and sacrosanct the way it should have been or trying to divulge to somebody else. And that factored into all of this. We compare this most directly with the images we've seen from the Mar-a-Lago case, the positioning of the documents, the accessibility to people from the Mar-a-Lago resort and beyond. And while I hesitate to compare these two cases directly, how can one help but do so in this instance? But these are divergent for this very reason. One stepped on a rake, the other cooperated. Very good point. Uh, Laura Coates, thank you so much. If you could stand by for us, we're going to get in a quick break as we follow this breaking news. We're God damn, dude. God damn. Why can't they just leave some of the Kennedy files sitting out? Well, Trump put his documents on a stage. Yeah, so obviously the differences between like uh, Trump and Biden is that, yes, uh, Donald Trump refused after they found out that he still retained classified documents. That's the major difference here is that once the federal government came and was like, you have these documents, we want them. Trump was like, sure, I'll give them to you. And then didn't, right? And lied and actively obstructed justice and actively obstructed the investigation. So Trump is still comically guilty in this situation. Um, Biden, on the other hand, Biden, on the other hand, immediately was like, go ahead, take all the documents. I don't give a shit, right? Like he opened up all of the doors and allowed the investigators to go in and take all the documents and make an assessment. Same with Mike Pence. Um, so the major difference there is that he's not. Uh, he he cooperated with the government, and and you know and and gave up all of the documents that he had because it's supposed to be like a lighter uh, a, a a lighter uh, a criminal punishment if any criminal punishment is given at all. So Mike Pence and Joe Biden cooperated. Trump did it. That's the major difference here. Um, but I think that what is more important in this situation, what they found is that he did actually retain classified documents, right? Which uh, there was suspicion of, for sure. However, no charges will be given to Joe Biden, which comes across to a lot of dummies as though there is like a, a two-tier justice system, right? Like, oh, I can't believe that there's no charges. But worst of all, not only, not only are there no charges... Part of the reasoning for why there are no charges is because they claim that Joe Biden, uh, while looking careless, would be would come across as too senile and too well-intentioned to a jury where there would be too much reasonable doubt. It's the worst of all worlds. The best of all worlds would be Biden is actually mentally cognizant, mentally coherent, but also he didn't have any classified materials. 
right? No charges because this is just what you do when you discover classified documents or just saying that like, um, or just saying specifically that like, yes, of course, no charges because like he didn't know that he had it. Right. And same with Mike Pence. If they found classified documents, uh, in, in Mike Pence's hands, they're not going to fucking convict him either because he cooperated. Whereas with Trump, the major problem is they were like, Hey, you have classified documents. We want them back. Trump was like, sure. First he was like, no. Then he was like, sure. And then he just like retained some of those documents and refused to give them back. For what reason? I do not know. I suspect it was because he's a hoarder and he wanted to like flex the kid rock. As I said, even back then, right? Which is pretty funny and really stupid. It's not like Trump did not cooperate once. It was like literally three times. Exactly. So the major problem here, a Ugopnik raid. Uh, thank you, Ugopnik, for the raid. Hope you had a good stream, brother. Hope you're enjoying your time on the platform. <laughs> Unofficial Ugopnik raid because he raided the wrong person. That's so funny. Um... You go raided Hasabi? That's funny. Um, anyway, but shit's heating up, folks. Why? And then not even as if he had it in his home, but it was in a gun safe or something. I gotta pee. No, it was lying, you know, what was it, lying next to the wiffle ball that Hunter plays with? I mean, my goodness, the kid, the guy's 50 going on 10 as it is. Yeah, uh, Pat Fallon, Congressman, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thanks, Trace. God bless. <laughs> Well, in a new statement from President Biden, the special counsel released today its findings about its look into my handling of classified documents. I was pleased to see they reached the conclusion. I believed all along they would reach that there would be no charges brought in this case and the matter is now closed. OK, let's bring in our panel. Andy McCarthy, former federal prosecutor, Saul Weisenberg, former deputy independent counsel and Mark Thiessen, Enterprise Institute, senior American Enterprise Institute, senior fellow, all our Fox News contributors. Andy, I think we should start with you again because we we started with you the last time. You've kind of heard this conversation going on now for the past 45, 50 minutes. What do you make? Have you changed your assessment of anything on these classified documents, charges not being filed and, and the release of quite frankly a, a ton of embarrassing information yeah well i guess my my first impression was that um you know this is supposed to be about whether there's enough evidence to indict and as you read the report i can't help but say it sure looks like there's enough here to invoke the 25th amendment um and i know that's not what you know what he's looking at what he, his purpose is but right. you know his fitness for office is a major issue here Second thing, you know, we've mentioned this a number of times, Trace. Um, one of the reasons, it seems like one of the core reasons that he didn't indict is because he decided, and he says this himself, a jury would find him to be a sympathetic defendant mm -hmm. because of his, uh, you know, he's, he's a gracious enough guy, but, you know, he's forgetful, et cetera. If you're at the point of saying what a jury would assess, what that means is you've drawn the conclusion that there is enough evidence to indict the person and enough evidence perhaps to let the jury decide the case. Yeah. And what you're now down to is now they're 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 trying to figure out if they should go with um, it's there's a double standard in the criminal uh, justice. Is there a double standard in criminal justice or is Biden so senile that uh like a jury would find him to be senile why not both is not willfulness it's gross negligence so yeah. I, I really don't understand how the fumbling bumbling aspect of all this helps him because if the jury even merely believed that he was grossly negligent that would be enough to convict
Yeah, it's a good pivot to you, Saul Weisenberg, because, you know, Andy brings up a very good point is, is they're, they're, they're projecting, saying, listen, this is what a jury would do. It kind of reminds me of the James Comey speech when it came out for Hillary Clinton's documents saying, well, she made some bad decisions, but, you know, just projecting of what would happen had this thing gone to trial. Now, nobody knows what's going to happen had this gone to trial. And if there is enough evidence for you to consider that this might go to trial, maybe there's an argument that it should go to trial. Well, first of all, there's absolutely no truth to the rumor that this report was ghostwritten by Gavin Newsom and his future <laughs> campaign manager. I just want to put that rumor to rest. That's that's number one. Number They're having less fun with this than I thought they would be. It has 91 felony charges pending against him. Some of them also involve classified documents in a completely different fact pattern, right? Biden can claim I was investigated by an independent counsel and I was cleared. A lot of cheap shots like that you're looking at have nothing to do with the law, uh, but I was cleared. Now, maybe Mr. Trump will be cleared, but he's been indicted, though. Biden was not even charged. Mr. Trump will have a right to defend himself in court. Maybe he's pristinely innocent, but he's looking at 91 felony charges. Joe Biden's looking at zero. Uh, Paul, when we look at the classified documents case that Donald Trump is facing. It's kind of funny. I feel like they're overwhelmed with... It almost feels like Fox News is like overwhelmed with what they want to hit. Like what angle, what avenue of attack? They have too many. They're overstimulated. They're stimming. Okay. They're getting hit with too many fun options. And they can't figure out exactly which, uh, which angle to, to use here. The five will focus up. We'll see. Oh, I don't may. know. I mean, I think the, the argument that everybody does it. Uh, They're fumbling a bad bitch, kind of. kind of cases. I'm not sure how effective it is. Uh, the prosecution will have to then make the argument that, no, in fact, uh, some people do have classified documents that travel with them when they leave office. Okay. What do they do? When oh, they my God. Dude, dude, if I'm, if I'm a Republican, I'm just cutting all of this footage and matching it up with literally everything that they've said about how devastating it is for uh, Donald Trump to maintain classified documents, okay? I'm going to be like, oh, oh, so you don't give a shit when it's Biden to, to showcase hypocrisy, right? Which, by the way, Fox is obviously insanely hypocritical. Um, Fox is oftentimes conservatives are so hypocritical that they literally will be hypocritical and inconsistent in the same breath. Like, they'll be like, as I've talked about before, Trump will be like, I should be able to have classified documents and therefore this is a mockery of a trial. However, Biden, who's currently president, should not be able to have classified documents and that's why he should be killed by the state. And it's like, okay, so which is it? Is there a consistent legal principle here? Or is the consistency that only you get to do crimes and they don't? At least for these guys, like, they separate the two. They don't like put it in the same coverage. They're not like Trump has legal documents and should be killed while also Biden has legal documents and he should not be or classified documents and he should not be. And if this feeds into that narrative and it does, then it's really problematic. Uh, and that's where the Biden people I'm sure are really worried and quite upset. Uh, but yeah, I mean, look, I brought this up. Got a show. I brought I this have... up when the document saga was first popping off, where I, I told you, like, this is something that a lot of presidents uh, do and that it is, like, uh, reasonable for someone to, like, bring... Uh, reasonable for someone to, like, bring uh, classified documents. But, but what is not reasonable is when the federal government asks for said documents back and you just refuse to give them back to the government, Okay. That's the area where it is not reasonable. And that's precisely what's going on. That's the major difference here between the Biden case and I guess the, uh, the, the uh, Trump case threat. And not just the Biden case, but also the Mike Pence case. Like nobody's talking about Michael Pence. Why is nobody talking about Michael Pence? What if I stash those documents in like a storage unit outside of a town or a guest bathroom? Anyway, what happened to Michael Pence? 
Well, what happened to Michael Pence is the exact same thing that happened to Joe Biden. They got hit with the top of the hour ad break and they did not have a subscription to the Hassan Abbey broadcast. And they were like, oh man, now I got to sit through three minutes of ads. And to that, I say no more. You do not have to sit idly by and watch three minutes of ads at the top of the hour. You can avoid those ads by subscribing for $5 or for free with a Twitch Prime by connecting your Amazon Prime to your Twitch account or by getting gifted a sub. Here's the three-minute break now. He said, bro, I'm trying to learn. Okay, no, Mike Pence, uh, Mike Pence was under the same scrutiny and, 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 uh, and had that same exact investigation that Joe Brandon went uh, under at the same time, as a matter of fact, uh, for, for uh, classified documents, and they went to his house as well, and they retrieved a bunch of documents. I don't know if they actually found any classified documents, but, you know, that, that is the same exact thing that happened with Joe Biden. So yeah, I use my Amazon Prime subscription. It feels like I'm using a st stolen classified document. Yeah, it's kind of like that. Anyway, her writes that Biden's practices present serious risks to national security and that Biden willfully retain and disclose classified materials after his vice presidency. Her writes because the box was damaged and not able to properly package classified material, the agents transferred its contents to a new box for transport. The photographs below show the contents of the garage box in the original box and the new box. The facts first folder contain over 200 pages of documents related from the fall of 2009 Afghanistan policy review with a date range approximately August through October 2009. Her writes that Biden did not remember when he was vice president, forgetting on the first day of the interview when his term ended. He did not remember even within several years when his son Bo died. In an added letter at the end of the report, Biden lawyer Bob Bauer and special counsel Richard Sauber wrote, we do not believe that the report's treatment of President Biden's memory is accurate or appropriate. The report uses highly prejudicial language. Uh, excuse me. You are now looking a gift horse in the mouth and saying, I don't like the teeth. Okay. That's crazy. These motherfuckers are like, hey, we got away with this. We got away with, uh, with, with maintaining, retaining classified documents. And this is part of the reason why. Uh, th this was brought forward as like uh, a, a reason as to why we shouldn't even prosecute. We shouldn't even like, uh, you know, bring forward charges because like juries will look at us like we're fucking assholes. Okay. Meanwhile, meanwhile, well, that's one of the reasons why they didn't even fucking press charges. Big homie saying that's a fucked up way. So what do you want? You want the smoke or not? Do you want them to press charges then? That's crazy. Let's put both in jail, charge them with treason and get Cornell West elected. I love that. It's a great idea, chatter. Look, I'm never going to fucking say don't arrest and prosecute former presidents or current presidents. I'm on board with that no matter what. I will be there no matter what, okay? I'm a fan. Do it. Do it, pussy. Don't threaten me with a good time. I'm there, okay? I'm jank-pilled. I'm based and jank-pilled. Don't care. Still voting for jank. It's jank -em. Anyway, Bauer letter continued. In fact, there is ample evidence from your interview that the president did, a, did well in answering your questions about the years old events over the course of five hours. His interview began the day after the October 7 attacks. Oh, he was, dude, he was emotional after October 7. That's why he couldn't answer uh, properly on when his son died. <coughs> <sighs> your honor, I was, you don't understand. I, I was I was feeling emotional. Back to her's report. Mr. Biden's memory was significantly limited, both during his recorded interviews with the Ghost Rider in 2017 and his interview in our office in 2023. Okay? Holy moly. And his cooperation with our investigation, including by reporting to the government that the Afghanistan documents were in his Delaware garage, will likely convince some jurors that he made an innocent mistake. Rather than acting willfully, that is, with the intent to break the law as the statute requires. I think that's also another big component here 
uh, that that we must not forget, and that is that there there needs to be a willful intent to uh, retain classified documents, and and that you can't chalk it up as a mistake. Which, by the way, for the record, wait, so they concede he wasn't willful. No, he's saying he's saying that because they cooperated with the investigation and literally told the government that he had the Afghan documents in his Delaware garage that he he wasn't um he he didn't have willful intent to break the law. Like if he obstructed justice deliberately even like charges that you can hit him on with obstruction of justice, they're saying you can't really do that because he comes across as like too sympathetic of a of a uh, criminal for a jury because they'll say, oh, he's old and uh, doesn't remember a lot of stuff. But in areas where he does remember, but in areas where he does remember he took uh, and, and retained classified documents, He's openly cooperating with the investigators to say, go ahead, take it. I have this, I have it in my house, in my Delaware house. I have these documents. Her writes, it would be difficult to convince a jury they should convict him by then a former president who will be at least well into his 80s of a serious felony that requires a mental state of willfulness. Third, as discussed to some extent above, Mr. Biden will likely present himself to the jury as he did during his interview with our office as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. While he is and must be accountable for his actions, he is, after all, the president of the United States. Based on our direct observations of him, Mr. Biden is someone for whom many jurors will want to search for reasonable doubt. It would be difficult to convince the jury they should convict him by then a former president who will be at least well into his 80s of a serious felony that requires a mental state of willfulness. His defense is basically when he's lucid, he cooperates. And yes, when he's not lucid, you can it, it comes across as sympathetic to a jury, which will definitely find uh which will definitely find uh a a um which will definitely find reasonable doubt. Because the point is, did he retain classified documents with malicious intent? knowing full well that he was in violation of the law. Um, or was he not doing that? And they're saying that this does not, this is not like an easy to prove case because of how old he is. And because he also cooperated with the investigation law tip. This basically goes to the insanity defense where a defendant may assert the defense. If they did not appreciate the wrongfulness of their conduct due to their mental state, this report basically is saying that Biden was so demented that he literally didn't know he was doing crime. That person also has the nuclear codes, by the way. I don't even I don't think that they're saying that he was so demented that he didn't know he was doing the crime. I think they're saying that he will come across as one who is uh so demented. Or rather, he'll come across positive in the eyes of a jury. And considering that this isn't like um uh, considering that this isn't like a super high crime, I guess like super, super severe crime. Um, it, it, they, they're, they're chalking it up as like, he's an old guy. It'd be too hard to convict. The investigators will be extremely hard pressed to find any potential juror that doesn't have, or didn't have to deal with elderly parents, grandparents. They wouldn't relate to Biden's defense. Anyway. I do kind of agree with this sentiment that it seems sort of out of place that the special counsel uh, to be weighing on. Shouldn't they just ideally just lay out the facts objectively? Well, they also are not prosecuting someone that they caught who is in violation of the law to a certain degree. So they are writing out in their report what their assessment is And this is a part of their assessment. If it's so obvious, if it is so obvious in their assessment that Biden has gaps in his memory through um, the interviews that they conducted with him, like very glaringly obvious gaps in his memory, 
which it seems like he did, not remembering his son's death. Uh, well, not his death, but like when he died, not remembering when he got out of office. These are severe lapses in memory that show, you know, serious decline in mental faculties that would absolutely be part of the reason why you wouldn't push for a case. Like you wouldn't push to, to take this to trial, despite the fact that there is at least enough evidence that he definitely did retain classified documents when he should not have. Special counsel Herr said Biden had diminished faculties and faulty memory in their interview. Given the intelligence the military officials present and the topics discussed in the meetings, Mr. Biden encounters Zwornitzer. Mr. Biden would have realized that his notes did or were likely to contain classified information, but taken as a whole, the evidence will likely leave jurors with a reasonable doubts about whether Mr. Biden knew he was sharing classified information with Zwornitzer and intended to do so. For these jurors, Mr. Biden's apparent lapses and failures in February and April 2017 will likely appear consistent with the diminished faculties and faulty memory he showed in the Zwonitzer's interview recordings and in our interview of him. Therefore, we conclude that the evidence does not establish that Mr. Biden willfully disclosed national defense information to Zwonitzer. The passages Mr. Biden read to Zwonitzer on April 10th, 2017 contain information that remains classified up to the secret level. Do you understand? He retained and disclosed classified information to a third party that did not have security clearance, which is a clear violation of the law. But when you look at the intent side in this circumstance, given that the interview that he was conducted had many instances where he literally had demonstrated genuine lapse of, of, of genuine gaps in his memory, they're claiming that he basically didn't know what he was fucking doing. Like, he didn't know that it was classified information. He was too senile to recognize that the information that he was delivering to Zwonitzer was, was uh, classified information. Because if he's not senile in that circumstance, he's willingly giving... He's having a Kid Rock moment. Okay? He's having a Trump Kid Rock moment in that circumstance where he's basically willingly giving up classified information to someone who does not have a top secret classify, uh, classification uh, uh, security clearance, top secret security clearance to be able to handle classified intelligence. Situation room meeting from the summer of 2015. Immediately before discussing the notebook entry, Mr. Biden discussed extremely personal notebook entries touching on the illness and death of his son, Bo, its effects on the family and the wrenching decision about whether to run for president in 2016. After discussing these highly emotional topics, Mr. Biden turned immediately to the notebook entry from the summer of 2015 situation room meeting which began on the very next page of the notebook and read additional portions of the entry nearly verbatim, including the portions of the entry he read to Zwonitzer during the February 16th, 2017 meeting. The passengers Mr. Biden read to Zwonitzer on April 10th, 2017 contain information that remains classified up to the secret level. Level. <coughs> the Afghanistan documents were ultimately found in Mr. Biden's Delaware home in a badly damaged box in a garage near a collapsed dog crate, a dog bed, a Zappos box, an empty... An empty bucket, a broken lamp wrapped with duct tape, potting soil, and synthetic firewood. Do you think they drop Biden? Fuck no. No, things will get increasingly more partisan going forward. Dude, they didn't drop Biden before. Why would they drop him now? No, we're stuck. We're riding with Biden, whether we like it or not, folks. Anyway. <laughs> Damn, Joe, you live like this? Exactly. I think Brandon is a perfect president for our time. He's an aging, decrepit man representing an aging, decrepit empire whose only reliable function is lashing out to desperately cling to fading glory through violence. Brandon is the representation of entropy. Yes. I work in the field. Special counsel is unique from other prosecutors. When regular prosecutors do not charge, they don't say why or detail anything. Special counsel is supposed to write these reports even if they don't charge. The cognition stuff is damning, and it makes sense, by the way. No charges. Federal criminal system is extremely rare to charge people older than 80. It is practically unheard of outside of mafia bosses. Oh, yeah. Well, obviously, the other reason why it's a special prosecutor or special counsel 
is because uh is is obviously because like Brandon is currently the president. So if it wasn't a special counsel, if it was directly a DOJ person, right? Then then it's like it's like a a, a police internal affairs type beat you know what i mean it's like the guy who is basically the leader of the doj is investigating himself uh is investigating himself so clearly in that circumstance there is a conflict of interest even though there shouldn't be technically and i don't even believe the fucking brandon regime would uh do such a thing because they're too libbed up okay they're too libbed up to do that that's more Trumpian, in my opinion, than, uh, than something that the Brandon regime would do. The Republicans would have made mincemeat of that and would have utilized that to be like, look, look at the double standard. Now that there is a special prosecutor, because it was a special prosecutor that uh, detailed out in this report, but a special prosecutor nonetheless, uh, they can't say it's improper, even though they will still say it regardless, but... Hassan, Washington won't take you seriously when it comes to political content. Um, well, one, my name has one S in it, not two. Uh, and two, I don't know. I mean, you can make up your own mind, right? I think you're, I think you're an adult. I assume that plenty of people are, are adults that are coherent, have all their mental faculties in order. You don't have to take me seriously when it comes to political content. Uh, my goal always is to hope that you make up your own mind after listening to what I have to say and see if I'm presenting a decent argument uh, and not be motivated by other people that you've watched prior with like clip chimps or, or uh, clips completely out of context that uh, present my opinions on matters in a false light. I think you're an adult. I think you are capable of sitting in here, listening to what I have to say and make up your own mind rather than be like, well, my favorite content creator said he's bad. You know what I mean? And when I when I'm talking about um when I'm talking about this kind of stuff, I also mean like match it up against like actual reading, reading of the news for example, uh like, you know, reading of articles that I'm looking at, what go into primary sources instead of like matching it up with whatever some random shit stirrer is saying online. If that makes sense. You might not agree with me. There are plenty of people who don't. Okay. However, if you're asking like, why should we take you seriously? Well, I will always tell you what my position is. I will also tell you what I think, like where my biases are. So... I think that's more honest in my opinion because it's impossible to avoid biases when you're making interpretations of the news. And um and that's my that's my assessment. I've watched you for years. <laughs> so I don't know what you would what you would assume I'm here because of other people's opinions. Well, cuz you came in with a very um, you know, seasoned uh, I would dare I say emotional question that is like very loaded. And oftentimes it's uh, people that are motivated in their reasoning that come in and ask questions like that. But yeah, that's it. Stop being paranoid. I don't, the clip chimp watches hours of your videos though. Stop being paranoid. Yeah. Clip chimpers watch hours of footage so they can, falsely claim that I, I have a position on an issue that is incredibly reductive. Anyway. And also part of the reason why I assume that is because you hit me with a Hassan with a double S when I have one S in my name. So. One must ask themselves, why have you been in here watching for years if you don't think that my uh, political analysis is worth anything really like don't you have better uses of your time that's a good question I think <clears throat> anyway 
Yeah, Hassan is Hassan hater standard English. Like uh, Mao is standard English. But for my haters. Uh, Matty Iglesias is mad. This is fucking bullshit. You appoint a Republican special counsel to investigate. He investigates. The investigation does not reveal a crime. So instead of saying all good, he goes off and does partisan political hits. Now sit down, young folks, and I'll tell you how we got here. It all started when Bill Clinton walked across the tarmac. I don't like that he's saying that uh, <laughs> he's saying that you appointed a Republican special counsel to investigate. He investigates. His investigation does not reveal a crime. No, his investigation did reveal a crime, just not one that is like, uh, just not one that is like ready to be prosecuted on conditions that you do not want to repeat on here because it goes against your arguments that Brandon is actually totally, perfectly mentally cognizant and mentally coherent. So that's, that's the reason why he's upset. Now you can argue on the basis of whether or not the crimes that they're talking about are severe, right? Cause they're not. But if you argue that the crimes that he's talking about are not severe, then you actually basically remove one element of the Trump classified document saga. That it's like not super, not sufficiently severe enough crimes that Trump was engaging in on the document saga uh, that he engaged in obstruction of justice over. Actually have been doing for some time. The fact that they uh, turned in these classified documents right away to the National Archives is something that they've talked about. Uh, the fact that they uh, consented to the search uh, of multiple locations, uh, that he sat for a voluntary interview. Uh, he did that the weekend that the Israel war broke out. So this is the contrast that they are going to continue making. But of course, as we were talking, up, talking about before, doesn't take away the political ammunition that, th that this gives uh, the president's critics and Republicans, including the former president. All right, MJ Lee, let's talk about that now with CNN's Kristen Holmes, who covers President Trump, former President Trump in West Palm Beach, Florida. For us and Kristen, uh, Donald Trump has been given a, a gift of sorts in this special counsel report. The special counsel specifically noting uh, President Biden's, quote, diminished faculties and faulty memory, unquote, and giving specific instances that are that are Bro, Fringy. CNN running this like the way that they're running it is unironically more actively damaging to Brandon than Fox News having fun with the Weird report. standard of justice and how unfair it is that President Biden uh, is not being indicted. A am I right? And you guessed right. Oh, okay. You guessed right. <laughs> yeah. That is... You get you win the prize. Yes. So I do want to say something before I read this statement because I think it's really important. And, and that is that most of his supporters, if not all of his supporters, as well as people who are considering supporting him, will believe the statement that I am about to read. Now, there are inaccuracies in it. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. We'll go through some of those inaccuracies. But as you said, Jake, this was a political gift of sorts to Donald Trump. An ability for him to blur these two cases together, to be able to say it's a two-tier justice system and... All of that, that conversation That's what around I said. Biden's mental faculties, that is something that... That's what I said. Yo, CNN's repeating what I'm saying. What the hell? I literally said, this is such a goddamn... I, I literally tweeted this, like, earlier. Not even a joke. The exact same thing that she just said. Absolutely worst double bind here, where they show that Biden willfully retained classified documents and comes across as too senile for a jury to convict them. The right will make mincemeat of this. They'll play up the double standard in courts and harp on how old Biden is. Which is true. They will do that. Particularly when it comes to obstruction. We do know that Biden was much more cooperative and willing to turn over those documents than Donald Trump. And in fact, there had to be a subpoena to get those documents from Donald Trump. Plus, there have been reports of witness tampering that the special counsel is looking into to try and protect those documents and keep them with Donald Trump. Now, again, though, I cannot stress enough how politically this is going to play out because it is something that is really going to be amplified by Trump and his team. They are going to blur the lines of these two cases to say that he should have also been charged. They are the special counsel released their findings today about their look into my handling of classified documents. I was pleased to see they reached the conclusion I believed and knew all along they would. That there are no... <laughs> that my mental faculties are not all right. No charges should be brought in this case. As many of you know, 
This was an exhaustive investigation going back literally more than 40 years. 40 years when I became a United States senator when I was a kid. <laughs> I was a kid, 29 years old. <laughs> Special counsel acknowledged I cooperated completely. I did not throw up any roadblocks. I sought no delays. In fact, I was so determined to give special counsel what they needed, I went forward with a five-hour in-person interview over the two days of October the 9th, 8th and 9th last year, even though Israel had just been attacked. By <laughs> Bro, even though Israel had just been attacked? Brother, what are you talking about? What is that? He's like, man, you don't understand, okay? My heart, my heart bled. <laughs> I was in an emotional moment for myself. Israel had been attacked. I forgot when Bo had died. <laughs> in fact, I was so determined to give special counsel what they needed. I went forward with a five hour in person interview over. By the way, the joke that he's saying he was a kid at the age of 29 is that he's old. But that part I get. This is actually pretty coherent for Brandon. He's actually doing a good job. Got to hand it to him. Two days of October the 9th, 8th and 9th last year, even though Israel had just been attacked by Hamas on the 7th. I was in the middle of handling an international crisis. First, the... He got that good shit, dude. They gave him the good drugs today. This is his wakeful hour. They need to make debates during this time. You do not, in fact, have to hand it to him. I, what do I always say? I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest, okay? He got that good adrenochrome here, okay? Whatever kind of cocktail they had, it was hitting. He did a good job. I can't believe that the, the, the way that we are analyzing the leader of the free world, the most powerful person on the fucking planet, is like how well he presents himself, how mentally coherent he can present himself in 59 second increments. Okay, that is insane. That is insane. Jesus Christ. Yeah, we're analyzing him like it's baby's first words. Oh, yeah. Bradley Moss Esquire says the current president has a poor memory. The former president has a poor memory, has been indicted four times, was found liable for sexual assault, oversees a company, convicted of tax fraud and unleashed a mob on January 6th. Give the well, give me the well-meaning elderly man. Dude, uh, it's it's so Jover. The, ki this kind of shit basically shows me that like the Democratic Party can literally do everything that the Republican Party is doing and liberals will still go, yeah, we're still voting for D. We're still voting D, baby. No matter what. That's it. That's it. I get it. Like they could literally be like, we are the Republican party. We are uh, adopting the Republican party's agenda. 100%. Okay. Not saying that they have, by the way, I don't think they have, but even if they did, there would still be plenty of people who were like, no, I'm voting blue. No matter who, baby It's team sports. I think the immigration stuff and like the Biden mishandling of the, the immigration on the messaging front on the legislative front, is a perfect, clear demonstration that these guys don't care because they keep looking and going, well, the alternative is even worse. You know what I mean? The alternative is worse. It, on the issue of immigration, it doesn't matter if the alternative is worse. If the current guy that you voted so he doesn't do the alternative is literally doing the alternative is worse moment. moment. Like, what do you mean? The distinction is not whether or not the person that has like incredibly restrictive white nativist, inhumane, uh, anti-immigrant policies has a D next to their name or an R next to their name. If that's the only distinction on that issue, then there is no distinction. I actually don't even know if that's true at this point. What do you mean? Oh, Robert Hur clearly decided to go down the Jim Comey path of filing his report absolving Biden of criminal activity with ad hominem attacks, like calling him an elderly man with poor memory, not remotely subtle, just a right-wing hit job from within Biden's own DOJ, wild. Robert Hur's interviews with Biden were on October 8th and October 9th, days if not hours after the October 7th Hamas attack. If he seemed distracted, there's a pretty good reason why that doesn't require her to speculate on what uh, conclusion a fictitious jury might have. Okay, then fucking file charges then? Like, what are they saying? 
This is a double bind for that reason. It's a double bind because then it's like, okay, well then, then he has enough to, to fucking file and, and actually go to court. Like he was actually perfectly mentally cognizant. And also another part of his mental cognition is from 2017 when he revealed classified information to a, a interviewer who did not have top secret classification. Like, so what's up? It was in 2017. Was there another Hamas attack? Like what the fuck's going on? You can't make this argument. That's why I said it's like a perfect double bind. It's, it's super cooked. Wait, what? Yes. Part of their findings included uh, retaining and, and revealing classified information to unauthorized individuals. And in the year 2017, according to this, her report that we just read, okay, we read pieces of it at least on, uh, on Twitter before people go, Hassan, you are reading Twitter threads. Yes, the Twitter threads are pieces of the actual report from literal journalists covering it. I can't believe I have to specify this too for all the fucking weirdos in here. Okay. That report found that in 2017, Biden also, in the 345-page Justice Department finding, that report said that Biden actually gave information, classified information, to a person without top-secret security clearance. So what, what about then? Did he have poor memory back then? Well, that's what the report says. Special counsel Biden showed diminished faculties and faulty memory in both interview recordings with his ghostwriter and when they interviewed him, during which the report said he had gotten worse. Could he remember when he was vice president or when his son died? As in the report. Uh, anyway. How do you think his faculty decline compares to Trump's? I've said this before. Trump is insane, but but coherent. Trump is not, I mean, uh, uh, Biden is not coherent. That's the issue. Biden, or at least the Biden administration, still can like present an air of, of uh, like rational, exhibit a, present, uh, exhibit a, a little bit of rational behavior Bro, I didn't know the dude who climbed the dome did it for pro-life. What the fuck? Yeah, we covered it yesterday. That's pro-life Spider-Man, baby. What do you think the Pod John's response to this will be? Tommy Vitor's response is one that we just read. Remember, the, per the person whose uh, report I'm looking at, like the person who, who basically structured this Twitter thread that I was reading from, is Alex Thompson, who is now a reporter at Axios. Okay, he's the national political correspondent at Axios. This report is a summarization of his writings on the report on Axios. So before people fucking go, Hassan only reads Twitter threads, that's a very quick way for dummies with no media literacy to fucking discount shit like this, okay? I can't believe you have to explain that to this chat. Well, you know, there is a lot of uh, ridiculous ways that clown asses try to fucking complain. So I feel like I feel like I want people to develop a better understanding against that kind of uh, clown ass behavior from people. Like they can, you know, they can make up their own minds, of course, but. Anyway. Here is why this would not be an here's why this should never be an issue. If Biden wasn't running, this would not be an issue. But because Biden is running, this is an issue and this will continue to be the issue. And unfortunately, 
it's a very easy one that they can keep hitting Biden on because Biden is going to keep doing gaffes. He's going to keep doing gaffes because unfortunately, this is the one thing that time won't heal for Biden. His age. Because he's competing against father time. And the more time passes, the more he ages. What is a pod, John? Uh, Pod, John is a a funny way of describing uh, the Pod Save America boys, who uh, are former Obama administration speechwriters, friends of the show, by the way, uh, of mine. Um, They have a very successful podcast called Pod Save America. They have a network built around it. And they are, I mean, they're, they're cool. I like them. I've been on their shows. I go on their shows from time to time. Um, but yeah, we, we definitely have disagreements on, oh, Crooked Media is the name of the network. Sorry. That spawned off of Pod Save America, the successful podcast. It's not centrist, uh, central. I would say that they're like center left for sure. They're actually center left and not like center left in the way that liberals in the Democratic Party present themselves. They do, of course, have a tendency to fall in line all the time. Anyway. So... These are the high notes from the special counsel report. Officials said in a report they would still have decided not to pursue charges even if current Justice Department guidance permitted charging a sitting president. Attorney General Merrick, uh, uh, Merrick General, Attorney General Merrick General. (laughs) Nice. Attorney General Merrick General. That's funny. Okay, Washington Post. Democracy dies in the darkness. Come on. What's happening? Is, is there not enough Jeff, Be- Jeff Bezos money? What's, what's going on? Hire a fucking editor, dog. What's, how do you do this? Appointed her as a special counsel in January 2023 to investigate the matter after Biden's aides said they discovered the materials when they searched his home and office. As they reported to their disco- uh, as they reported their discovery to officials, a separate investigation was already underway into former President Donald Trump's alleged mishandling of classified documents, a probe that led to 40 criminal counts against Trump, including willful retention of national defense secrets and obstruction of justice. The report portrayed Biden as a well-intentioned but sometimes hapless and forgetful, a man uh, who has access to classified uh, materials throughout his government career. Biden saved notebooks from his time as VP that contained classified information, according to the report, and used those notebooks to craft his 2017 memoir with a ghost writer. The special counsel noted the published books ultimately did not contain classified information. However, and this part is important, in 2017, he was still leaking classified information to a person without top secret uh, security clearance who happened to be his ghost writer for his book. Do you understand? This is, uh, I would say, an overlooked part of the analysis that you're hearing from a lot of liberals who keep talking about like, well, it was right after October 7th where he forgot when uh, Bo Biden died. You know what I mean? And it's like, okay, but this report also looks into 2017. Some of the classified documents were classified top secret, sensitive compartmented information, a category reserved for particularly sensitive material. They included papers that related to Afghanistan, including a 2009 memo he sent to then-President Obama in a last-ditch effort to persuade him not to send additional troops to Afghanistan, the report said. Maybe he got clearance for the ghostwriter? No, the report states that he did not get clearance for his ghostwriter. The report noted that in a recorded conversation with a ghostwriter in early 2017, shortly after his term as vice president ended, Biden said he had just found all the classified stuff downstairs. At the time, Biden was living in a rented home in Virginia. But officials said in the report that it would be hard to convince the jury that Biden retained the information willfully, a necessary basis for conviction. That's because, according to officials, his memory was significantly limited and that it wouldn't have been all that notable for Biden to discover classified information in his home less than a month after he left office. 
Mr. Biden's memory was significantly limited, both during his recorded interviews with the Ghost Rider in 2017 and in his interview with our office in 2023. Okay. Garland said that at the time, the special counsel appointments were necessary because both Trump and Biden had indicated they would be running for president in 2024. A decade old memo he wrote is still top secret. Come on. Wait, what? First of all, it was top secret when he had just gotten out of office and was talking to his ghostwriter in 2017. And yes, that's how top secret classification works. What are you talking about? Anyway. Our classification system is fascist, to be honest. Our classification system is insane, okay? Which is why, like, the the notion that... Um, which is why the notion that, like, this is a real big deal. It was seven years ago, let it go. No, I I agree, okay? I don't give a shit. I love when people leak top-secret classified intel, Okay? I'm very consistent on the matter, especially if it's like wrongdoings of the American government. Okay. And I also personally don't give a shit about mishandling classified documents. As I said, time and time again, consistently during the Trump shit. Okay. However, of course, I'm still going to, you know, still going to enjoy the show. But let's be for real. Okay. The major problem with the Trump situation is that when he was found to be retaining classified documents, he refused to give them up. He even went as far as to tell the prosecutors that he had given them up while still retaining the classified documents. Okay? Yes, I'm, I am, however, in support of leaking classified documents. That's why I love the War Thunder players and the War Thunder forums. I love the Discord servers where that kind of stuff happens. Um, I have been a long supporter of freeing Jack, uh, what is it, Texaria or whatever, Teheria, however you say his name, Jack Teria, who just wanted to simply impress his friends in a Discord server and was and was leaking all the classified shit. Teixeira. Teixeira. Ah, uh, shout out to Wow Mao, by the way. Um, so yeah, that's where we're at with this uh, classified uh, document situation. Okay. Um... Legal experts thinks how he thinks Supreme Court will rule in the Trump case. Let me tell you, okay, very quick summarization. I'm going to skip that part of the story. Um, the ballot removal th situation is, is kind of wild, and the Supreme Court will most likely not do that. Um, but yeah, Russia. let's look at Amon Poor pushes back on Tucker Carlson's claim about the Putin interview. Um, so here's the deal. Here's the deal. I think that there is journalistic value in interviewing Vladimir Putin. I do. I don't think Tucker Carlson is the guy who will actually interview Vladimir Putin in a way that has journalistic value. Okay? I think that's pretty obvious. In a, in a way, there's no difference between Tucker Carlson interviewing him and some fucking like Russian journalist that hasn't been killed interviewing him. You know what I mean? Obviously, Vladimir Putin is not going to fucking let anybody interview him unless he's, you know, unless he thinks he can just like cut propaganda off of it. Okay. But the second thing I also want to mention here is that and by the way, the Tucker Carlson arguing at court that he's an entertainer and not a journalist doesn't mean anything. Entertainers have interviewed Vladimir Putin as well. Like, there's no... Like, that. that is not a distinction. That's not an important distinction. That's a distinction without a difference in this circumstance. It doesn't matter. Oliver Stone interviewed him as well. So, 
what I'm talking about with respect to like what is uh, permissible or what is moral and what is a good thing or a bad thing is, is a little different. Okay. Um, crazy how a capitalist lover like Cucker loves Putin. I wonder why. Maybe because Vladimir Putin is also a literal fucking oligarch. Oliver Stone was a Putin stan too, as far as I understand. Anyway, listen. Listen. Do you say the same thing for American president's interviews? I do, actually. What do you mean? Yes, the standard is identical. Uh, I assume you've never actually met or, or never actually watched my broadcast at all. My biggest, my biggest anger towards Vladimir Putin is that he does America shit all the time. That means that he's doing bad things. I criticize Hassan Minhaj for interviewing Obama in, a, in the most glazed up ways possible. Anyway. So, yeah, I literally criticized Biden for interviewing Conan and doing a puff piece. Or uh, uh, for, sorry, for Conan interviewing Biden and doing a puff piece. Um, anyway, the point is, I do think uh, when you realize Putin's going to say the same America bad as you, yes, uh, I, he is going to say that. Of course he's going to say that. The difference, however, is that I'm not a fucking war criminal. When Putin says America bad, why not America? Why is nobody talking about America? It's very different than when America, or it's identical to when America says Putin bad. Why is nobody talking about Putin? When I say it, it's a little bit different. I'm an American citizen, and I held this, I hold the same exact standard for America as I do to Russia. That's the major difference here. <laughs> I'm not motherfucking, I'm not Vladimir Putin. I don't know if you know this, but I'm not like a, a war criminal myself. Anyway. So. Sounds like something a war criminal would say. It's true. Fair. Also, Vladimir Putin doesn't just say America bad. He also says America bad because they're like transing their youth. And, uh, you know, Canada bad because they're stopping the trucker convoy or whatever the fuck. Or they're vaccinating the youth or some shit like that. <laughs> so there's a, there's a difference between why I think what America's doing is unacceptable and what he thinks America's doing is unacceptable. He hits it from every avenue, though. He'll talk about American imperialism, but also then talk about like how... Americans are transing the youth. Yeah, Vladimir Putin literally said J.K. Rowling was under attack, okay? That's all you need to know about how closely he's analyzing the, the culture wars and using it in his messaging, which seemingly is very successful for the absolute dumbest people on the planet, whether they be pushing Z-ass MAGA communists that call themselves that, or the funniest Republicans who were, who still like for, for years and years thought that it was like the Republicans, fuck, hold on here. I'm going to play this real quick. And Vladimir uh, Putin, Tucker Carlson has now interviewed Vladimir Putin. Uh, he made an, um, an inaccurate claim that no other Western journalist has bothered to try to interview Vladimir Putin. What do people need to know ahead of this interview being released? Well, you know, of course, that is so ridiculous that even uh, Vladimir Putin's press spokesman, right. Dmitry Peskov, very powerful man in the Kremlin, close associate of Putin, said that that wasn't true because he knows that all of us have been, you know, knocking down his door to try to get such an interview. Uh, but he said, well, maybe, uh, maybe Carl. Dude, sometimes Uber Eats drivers knock the door like they're the fucking police, okay? But I feel like your reactionary audience make you irrationally hate on Russia. No, I, I'm not irrationally hating on Russia. I, I think I have a very clear standard on Russia that has been a, a standard that I've applied since fucking day one, despite the fact that... Despite the fact that many reactionary, uh, uh, you know, Ukrainian flag in the bio dipshits... Refuse to recognize Russia's actions, and I've said this since the first fucking day, Russia's actions, Vladimir Putin's actions, 
are irredentist and completely unacceptable. Okay? Completely and utterly unacceptable. They are not even good for Russia's own interests in like destroying NATO or fighting back against NATO influence. It is an abject failure on every front. It's very bad. He should have debated NATO, true. No, dummy. That's not what I'm saying at all. Also, what do you mean? If his goal is to, like, cripple NATO, do you think he did a good job? Now fucking Finland and Sweden are part of NATO, too. And now Europe is more pro-NATO than they've ever been. The fuck do you mean? Wow, good job, Tucker. You really did it, man. You did it. You got the grayest villages. You you basically wiped out the grayscale looking, the grayest looking villages in eastern Ukraine and lost a shit ton of fucking uh, young men in the process. Yes, I am anti-NATO. Chatters who are asking. Chatters who just found out my position. Of course I'm anti-NATO. NATO is designed with the explicit intent of being an anti-communist institution comprised of a lot of fucking fascists in many of the European countries that it existed in early on with the express goal of destroying communism and its influence and now operates like a protection racket. Putin's biggest failure in, in this front, aside from the human beings that he fucking killed, okay, in Ukraine, is that he gave the protection racket a perfect opportunity to say, here's why we exist. Putin is anti-NATO? Yeah, and so am I. I guess me and Putin are in the same uh, league then. I guess we're, we're the same fucking, uh, we're the same person. I'm basically Vladimir Putin. Also... Uh, Putin, in this regard, I guess, is also a communist and continuing the USSR's legacy or some shit. How does that work? Oh, um, yeah, I'm a Russian oligarch. Turns out I'm not a Turkish oligarch, but a Russian one. Um, the thing I was going to mention for the record, the thing I was going to mention is that I am not, I am not anti- uh, interviewing anybody. I think everyone, especially uh, global leaders, even if they are themselves engaging in conflict and doing like inexcusable acts of violence, are still worthy of an interview. Okay? Especially foreign adversaries. Understanding what their framework is, what their perspective is, is important to fixing the, solu uh, fixing the problem and offering a valid solution. However, however, Like I said, uh, Tucker Carlson's interview is going to be a, a, a dick riding glaze session. Okay. A dick riding glaze session and will not have any sort of serious journalistic value to it. However, 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 having said that, I think under other circumstances, under normal circumstances, this doesn't get that much media play, but the media will cover it nonstop, which will greatly overemphasize its impact. It will greatly expand on its impact. People are doing commentary on the ethics of, uh, you know, interviewing Vladimir Putin and whatnot. It's basically one big hype train. He's pulling a fucking Aiden Ross here. He's pulling an Aiden Ross Playboy Cardi situation where everyone's talking about it. So now the next time Playboy Cardi comes on the Aiden Ross stream, oh my God, so much more people are going to watch. Wilson didn't know that. You know, th th that, that's, you know, that's the sort of nonsense that Carlson is trying to justify this interview. <laughs> but let me just read. Dude, I really don't understand your weird support for Russia. You must not understand many things if you think that I'm in any way, shape, or form supporting Russia. Okay? That's what I mean. This is what, this is the problem here, okay? 
I don't know what you're doing. Are you fucking playing with your worm like your goddamn Drake on a private jet? What the fuck's happening? Are your ears filled? Do you need to get your brain checked? Unmute the stream, dog. What the fuck? Oh! Fuck you! Fuck! Caught me while I was eating too, so I couldn't even click away fast enough. God damn it, son. Fuck you. At the top of the hour, there's a three minute ad break. If you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe for $5 or for free. For the audio listeners, I just got cooked. The chatter was debating me, but I understand the top of the hour ad break at every hour, he said, and rolled. Cumstered and dumpstered me, okay? God damn. Yeah. <laughs> Account created in 2014, following since 2023, 03, 13, never subbed. Respect. Respect. Here's a three minute ad break now. Fuck you. Bro keeps taking L's every day. Get it together. I can't. I can't get it together. Need for you what some, uh, you know, what some uh, Russian uh, Russian journalists have said. If I can find that, in fact, I will look for it. Uh, basically, somebody like Evgenia Albats, who's a prominent journalist, has been very angry at this notion that only Carlson can interview Putin. She said, unbelievable. I'm like hundreds of Russian journalists who've had to go into exile to keep reporting about the Kremlin's war against Ukraine. The alternative was go to go to jail. And then she adds a little bit of an expletive against Tucker's uh, position there. But I think what's really important to know is Tucker Carlson suggests that the American people, the rest of the West, don't understand Putin, don't understand the Russian military action, the war, the invasion. Well, again, that's clearly untrue because if you saw polls in the united states and guys who will be the first liberal uh debate pervert that tries to compare tucker carlson interviewing vladimir putin to me interviewing that yemeni teenager we should run a poll who will be who will be the first guy that does like remember guys i know this is tucker carlson one of the most famous journalists in in, in the country <laughs> will it be will it be they found will it be i accidentally leaked all the horse porn in my porn folder titled xxx gifts guy or will it be the two-time divorce champion guy which one will it be who knows yeah, Yemeni teenage TikToker is basically Vladimir Putin. And no, I will not. <laughs> no, I will not clarify. <laughs> Wait, are those real people? These are very real people. Who amongst us doesn't put their tax folder next to their horse dick porn po folder? Come on, it's perfectly normal. Inside of you are two wolves. <laughs> Both of them have at some point debated the ethics of being able to say the N-word as a white guy. Both of them have debated the ethics of child porn on the side of child porn. Oh, God, I love liberal debate, guys, man. The fucking best. around the world, uh, even at the UN, everybody understood that this was an illegal invasion of a democratic and sovereign state. And the polls were very, very much, uh, and these are people, not journalists, for the defense of Ukraine and the values it is upholding for all of us. And that is a fact. Now, obviously, the longer it goes, the more difficult it is to keep up that support, particularly as you've just been reporting the uh, unbelievable shenanigans that are going on in the US Congress that's 
simply will not send support to a country that is trying to fight not just for its values but for all of our uh, security. Um, so I think that Tucker Carlson, as you know, has uh, said over the years many, many things that are very supportive of uh, Vladimir Putin, even after the annexation of Crimea, uh, suggested that Putin was never a threat to the United States or to U.S. interests, uh, has called Zelensky, you know, an authoritarian and a dictator, uh -huh. uh, worse than, you know, is, is as bad as Lenin, etc. So, you know, this stuff just doesn't hold up. Why he's doing this interview now, obviously for the Kremlin, it makes sense if they want to talk. It's a friendly, it's a friendly voice, but we will keep trying our best to actually commit journalism. Yeah, you'll never stop trying, Christian. Thank you for all that. This. <laughs> so. <laughs> that made me want to commit journalism. So. Obviously, like American mainstream media, when it comes to Ukraine, does what um, Tucker Carlson wants to do with Russia and Vladimir Putin. The problem, however, is that at the very least, like the Ukrainian position, the pro-Ukrainian position is the moral position. You might not agree with Z uh, Zelensky. It doesn't matter. They are the country that got fucking invaded by the much larger country's military force. That's it. America's interests in Ukraine are not good. Their interests in Ukraine are not like genuine emancipation or anything like that. Their interest in Ukraine is, of course, privatizing all the state resources and also um, utilizing the Ukrainian population as... Utilizing the Ukrainian population as a... As a as cannon fodder for the Russian military in order to cripple the foreign adversaries military by whatever percentage they decided the Russian military is crippled by. Okay. So why is America's interest in Ukraine important in this process? Well, it's important because that um, their interests show how willing and able they are to defend Ukraine or support Ukraine, how they're interested in supporting Ukraine, and what decisions they make in that, um, in that process. EU recently made advances to take the Ukrainian market out of Russia's economy. Speaking of Ukraine. Whoa, what the fuck is this? Yo, this is sick. The five is live. President Biden just reacting to a damning special counsel report on his handling oh, of classified documents. Okay, well, we're, we're going to table the Ukrainian conversation for a little bit because I got to talk about this. About their look into my handling of classified documents. I, I got to see how they hard they're digging. I believe they knew all along they would. That there are no charges should be brought in this case. As many of you know, this was an exhaustive investigation going back literally more than 40 years, 40 years when I became a United States senator when I was a kid. <laughs> I was a kid, 29 years old. <laughs> Bottom line is the special counsel in my case decided against moving forward with any charges. And this matter is now closed. The special counsel releasing his long-awaited classified documents report. Robert Hur is his name and he is not recommending criminal charges. But he laid out how the president willfully retained and disclosed highly classified materials when he was a private citizen, including sensitive national security matters and documents about military and foreign policy in Afghanistan. And as the White House feared, the report is full of embarrassing details, including these dramatic photos of tattered boxes in Joe Biden's Delaware garage oh, right next on, to the Corvette. The sensitive files were stored, quote, Near a collapsed dog crate, a dog bed, a Zappos box, an empty bucket, a broken lamp, wrapped with duct tape, potting soil, and synthetic firewood. But remember when Biden told you that everything was secure? Classified material next to your Corvette. What were you thinking? Let me, uh, the, I'm going to get a chance to speak on all this, God willing, soon. But as I said earlier this week, people, and by the way, my Corvette's in a locked garage. 
Okay, so it's not like you're sitting out in the street. So Mr. But anyway, was in a garage. yes, as well as my Corvette. Um, but as I said earlier this week, people know I take classified documents and classified material seriously. They discovered a small number of documents of classified markings and storage areas and file cabinets in my home. The special counsel is also painting a devastating picture about the president's mental acuity with this quote. We have also considered that at trial, Mr. Biden would likely present himself to a jury, as he did during oh our interview of him, as a sympathetic, well-meaning, elderly man with a poor memory. It would be difficult to convince a jury that they should convict him by then a former president well into his 80s of a serious felony that requires a mental state of willfulness. And that wasn't the only instance of the special counsel bringing up Biden's significant limitations when it comes to memory. Oh, God. The president also could not recall the years that he was vice president or when his son, Bo, died. Uh, president Trump has issued a statement team here. I'll read it for you. He said they should immediately drop the case against me. I am covered by the Presidential Records Act. He wasn't. He had many, many times more documents, totally unguarded. Mine were always surrounded by Secret Service and in locked rooms. And Biden also made some more comments between about a distinction between him and Trump. Listen here. But I was especially pleased to see the special counsel make clear the stark differences between this case and Donald Trump. As the special counsel wrote, and I quote, several material distinctions between Mr. Trump's case and Mr. Biden's are clear. And by the way, this is a Republican counsel. Most notably, after given multiple chances, special counsel acknowledged I cooperated completely. Damn, he's yelling. I did not throw up any roadblocks. He's blocks. horny. I sought no delays. Okay, so we can talk about the merits of the case. Bro, 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 bro. It's devastating <sighs> thing that I've seen in this campaign. It would be really funny if they said, well, Trump did the woman TV man camera, so he's definitely mentally uh, cognizant, and that's why we have to prosecute him. NBC poll for this week. <laughs> that would be so Asked sick. Question, does Trump or Biden have the necessary mental They're like, he's the most mentally coherent president, president we've ever had. He has to be. He can't do the Biden insanity defense, that sir. Mental capacity. So, over to you. Remember how hard the media pushed the 25th Amendment? Yes. Now here it is. Mm -hmm. What do you do when it's your guy? Clearly there's evidence of severe memory loss, confusion, mental impairment. What are you waiting for? For the poor guy to wander down Pennsylvania Avenue in nothing but a shower cap? We <laughs> thought Harvard had diminished faculties. They are just talking, by the way, about your kindly neighbor who forgets where he is and he's wandering on your front lawn in an open robe. We're talking about the leader of the free world, right? You know. They're, they're describing him as an elderly man with a poor memory that doesn't possess a mental state of uh, willfulness. Mm. I mean, this is not Gramps with onset dementia. This is the president of the United States. He has the keys to the nuclear football. I can only hope that he doesn't know or remember where it is. <laughs> but this is like, I mean, it's to quote Morrissey, the joke isn't funny anymore. It's now really real. They told us something we already knew, and it's something that the media can't spin, right? He's mentally, they basically said he's mentally unfit to stand trial. Yep. That is a naked assessment. I mean, he's, we've seen him uh, refer to dead people as if they're alive. He can't do simple interviews in the Super Bowl. He's declining faster than his poll numbers, and it, it's I think oh, at this God. point, but felt something's going to happen. Greg, but I'm beginning to think so too. And mm -hmm. I had not been in that thinking that way, mostly, except for when Jesse asked me to comment if Michelle Obama is going to be stepping in. <laughs> uh, I do wonder if Jesse, since they had Buttfeld. an idea, the White House had an idea that this was coming for a while, that it was one of the main reasons they decided to decline the opportunity to do that Super Bowl interview because he would have had to been asked about it. That would have been the first question at the Super Bowl interview. And then he comes out today and says, case is closed. And then he says, I became president to bring red states and green states together. Yeah. And he says he wants to bring back Roe versus Ward. <laughs> and this is two days after he says, I saw dead people. Mm -hmm. Twice. Mm -hmm. He's saying he's meeting with people that have been dead for 30 years. It is pretty, way, look at it is pretty funny that Just, they are comparing uh, Trump to Biden. And there are a lot of similarities. Like, yes, Biden is worse than Trump in the way that he speaks and communicates. But, like, Trump has done that whole, like, Trump has done, like, misremembering shit all the time, too, while he was president. And still does.
They actually had to move the files to a different box because the thing, you couldn't even pick it up. It would fall apart. There's like dusty golf clubs, shoe boxes, and hundreds God, they in are and going there nutty, God buddy. Who? <laughs> Come on. So they said this guy willfully retained classified documents that put our national security at risk because it was in an unsecure location. Mm-hmm. But you couldn't ever get a conviction at trial because he's an elderly man with memory issues. And he didn't really know what he was doing because he's got diminished faculties. Mm. So this is the same thing they do with Hillary. Hillary definitely broke the law, and they laid out about a dozen times how she did it. But then they list about half the report about why we're not going to bring charges. They did the same thing with him. It's another beautiful off-ramp. But remember what they did to Mar-a-Lago. They had pictures our beautiful of beautifully Mar-a-Lago. organized stack Remember what they did to our beautiful room. Mar-a-Lago. And the media says, how dare Donald Trump mishandle classified documents like that? And CNN to this they point. They desecrated our beautiful air, Mar-a-Lago, a cultural, the garage a cultural photos, heritage yeah. site. They haven't even put it out there. Mm. Did you know that the ghostwriter who he shared classified documents with destroyed the tapes when he found out there was a special counsel investigation? So the minute he hears him being under investigation for mishandling classified documents, the guy deletes all of the tapes of Joe Biden. Mm. And then they're not going to charge him, of course. But they have Joe Biden on tape, and I would love to hear these tapes because Joe Biden's on tape saying, yeah, these are classified. And he's sharing classified information with his ghostwriter. It's what David Petraeus got popped for. It's the exact same thing. Mm. And then they're saying this guy's painfully slow. Wait. Dog, that's what Trump did too. What are you talking about? Trump is on tape being like, I know these are classified documents to a journalist. That's exactly what Trump did. Notes. This was seven years ago. We're now seven years after the fact. And we're talking not only 25th Amendment, we're talking about you might have to bow out because the crescendo now is going to grow so large of not just the people in the press corps, but other Democrats are going to see this and they're going to read this. And they say, how can you do this to this guy? Because right now, this was a devastating body blow to the re-election campaign. No matter how they want to spin it, this was bad. Can you imagine being the press secretary thinking about that briefing tomorrow? I don't think there will be one. I might call in sick, Judge. Um, (laughs) I want to talk about the White House's response to Robert Hur saying that the comments about mental acuity are superfluous. And unnecessary, and that they said that they weren't, and that they're not true, and they want they wanted Robert Hur to take them out. Oh, wait, and a he did wait a minute. Okay, so you can't have it both ways. The comments are not true, but the conclusion they came to to not indict uh, Joe Biden is accurate and to the point. Let me tell you something. This report is worse than an indictment. This report demands the 25th Amendment, and here's my Constitution. This man needs to be thrown out of office. And there's another point. The fact that they talked about the fact that he's an old man with a poor memory seven years ago, that he's sharing classified documents at a time when he's not even president. Donald Trump was president. This guy was in possession of documents as a senator, as a vice president. He had no right to have that information, sharing it with his ghostwriter, sharing it, I'm sure, with the editor. The editor would not have published a book without Bro, what is happening? This is literally what they were defending when Trump was doing, I'm losing my mind. And then they say, well, oh my he God. also showed a letter from Kim Jong-un to Bob Woodward uh, in the Oval Office. Everything about this tells and shows the American people how there are two separate systems of justice and... This is where my prosecutor comes through. If you get to the point where you say, no jury will convict this guy because he is non-compass mentis, because he does not have the mental capacity to form the intent, that means you've already gotten to the point where you believe he should be indicted, but you're not indicting him because you don't believe the jury will find him To be fair, that's not what they said. They said the jury would not see him as such. It's the worst thing that... (laughs) And reasonable doubt would, uh, the jury would seek reasonable doubt because he would come across as like mentally incompetent, but also like kind hearted. They still could have indicted him the way they indicted Donald Trump for espionage. The esp- Also like, uh, look, a special prosecutor does not have the capability of like making uh, assessments on mental acuity. Okay. He's not a fucking professional. What he's saying, what she's saying is like, 
a literal legal court decision after professionals have uh, have have made their arguments and a judge has decided that something is happening here and simply not the assessment of like one random fucking guy i agree with this assessment that he is his mental faculties are diminished but that's crazy that he's just like he's making it seem like this guy got the insanity plea the special counsel is saying that Biden is too old and incompetent to be held responsible there is for no mishandling court decision on Biden's mental faculties and state secret. And Biden is saying, I am not too old and I am not incompetent and I want four more years as the leader of the free world. I mean, how is that supposed to go over? So uh, this is a tough day for the White House and for President Biden. I think two things, and I think uh, the judge said some of it, uh, and basically everyone, everyone has said things that I agree with. I don't agree, disagree with a whole lot. The thing for me is what Mr. Hurst said, that he willfully retained the documents, which uh, on the Trump matter has been the predicate for why charges were brought. So if you believe he willfully retained the documents, but your argument, uh, Mr. the president's argument, President Biden's argument is that I cooperated fully with him and then uh, uh, President Trump did He's not. He's on the seat. If indeed that is the case and it looks at like that could be the case, at least what we're reading in the public narrative, then maybe President Trump should have been charged with only obstruction of justice. Exactly. Uh, and may not have, should have been charged with, with the, the handling of the documents. This case here and the way it has been handled will certainly give more credence to that argument. Uh, but we can't ignore the politics. The politics are infused with the, the legal part of it, and it's certainly infused with, with the second part, which is Mr. Hurst's conclusion that if he took this before a jury, that Mr. Biden might seem sympathetic because... He's an older fella with diminished memory. Uh, the White House is pushing back on that. It is going to be difficult to push back on that. I judge, I, I agree with, agree with your, your, your statement there, Dan, reconciling the two. I was, I'm too old and my memory is too slight for me to be prosecuted, uh, but I should get four more years, which is what Dana said. This is a, uh, it's it's a complicated, it's a complicated piece for the president. But I think if a legal standpoint, I think the question, I mean, the other complication is that <laughs> you're saying, no, <clears throat> my mental acuity is there, but also I shouldn't be prosecuted. Okay, well, that's part of the reason why they didn't even prosecute you. Because they think that your mental acuity is not there. So which one is it? It's not him running for four more years. The argument is literally, no, 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 you don't understand. They're actually wrong for saying I had lapses of judgment and, and um, you know, I'm quite forgetful. That part is incorrect, even though that's part of the reason why they're not fucking prosecuting me. Dad irresponsible. And I thought, what data was in there that may compromise sources and methods? By that, I mean names of people who helped or et cetera. And it's just uh, totally irresponsible. Greg, maybe he didn't remember that he had it too. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's part of that pattern it's like they they always blame the republicans or anybody for what they're actually doing uh, but i hear biden is he he's fine he just spoke to ruth bader ginsburg <laughs> and she told him he can't be tried so boo. that's good news that's good news um boo, I, I also kind of, boo, I, I, you're so I bad find this a bit ageist as somebody who is young that means if I commit a crime, I can't say that I have age-related mental cognitive difficulties. Don't you find that wrong? It's unfair that he gets that defense and I don't. Maybe in like five more years. I you. You could offer that. <laughs> yeah. The other thing, too, is this could be related. His decline could be related to Trump derangement syndrome. There might be an actual biological underpinning that when your brain is uh, a focused on an obsessive thought for a period of years, then the other parts of your brain atrophies. You're seeing this a lot with people with TDS. They're like they're, they're failing in their jobs and their relationships because they become overcome with Trump. What do you think the Democrats are actually thinking now behind closed doors? I, I can imagine. What do you think Gavin Newsom's thinking right now? Or even Kamala Harris? Well, I don't want to say what Gavin Newsom's thinking right now because it's dirty. <laughs> but if I were a Democrat, I'd probably know that this was already happening. It's been whispered about. Everybody knows. This is what? This thing here? What Judge says is so devastating. This is what they've been trying to hide for three years. Mm -hmm. And so Robert Hur spends two days with the president. Let's just say five to six hours total. That's more time than any reporter in three years has ever spent with the president. It's more time than we've ever really seen the president. 
Could you imagine Brett Baer, or let's just say Greg Gutfeld, sitting down yeah. with Joe Biden for five hours and asking him questions about policy and his performance? Well, her did it, and the conclusion was the man had... What standard is this? This has never been, like, a remotely normal standard to apply. What president has sat down for five hours in a contentious environment and debated people? What are they saying? At this point, they're just like, they already got their takes out. Now they're just spitballing and they're just going nutty with it. I get to keep these things because they're mine. <laughs> these are mine. Every other president's got to take stuff home. It's the same argument Donald Trump said, except he's not president. He's on tape arguing, no, no, this is, this isn't, this is classified, but I'm going to keep it. Mm -hmm. This guy comes across as a small, sloppy, and mentally unfit. Donald Trump literally said on tape, I could have classified, declassified these documents. Something along the lines of like, I could have classified, declassified these documents, but I didn't. These are classified, you know. These are classified documents that I'm showing you. Top secret. I hope you know I did not declassify them. Like he literally on the record, on tape, said the exact same things that you're fucking so currently saying about Brandon. And get a tough question. They say, uh, you know, as Biden said, everybody knows I take classified documents seriously. Or she'll say, everybody knows America's back. They never answer any questions. The president is incapable. Seven years ago, he didn't know when he was uh, vice president, when his term started, when it ended. Six months ago, we didn't know when his son died. And we are giving this man the ability to be the commander in chief of the greatest nation on earth when he is inept. And let me just say one thing, Jesse, at least Donald Trump had secret service. So the chat is asking, why are we watching this? Because this is entertainment. Had as president. He also had them in locked rooms as president. Joe Biden took them when he knew full well as a senator. He wasn't supposed to take him out of a skiff. He wasn't supposed to take notes. And then he says, okay. I didn't know. Harold, can I ask you? I mean, let's be honest. Don't, aren't the Democrats going to have some like secret cabal meeting to say, like, what are we going to do? We cannot Whoa! have him at the top of the ticket. I don't know what what the party party will do. I, I do know. Let me speak to say two things. First, um, I, I, I agree with what I, I firmly believe what I said earlier, that the re willfully retaining of the documents is a question about about both of these ca this cases. One is being treated one way, one being treated another way. It's going to behoove Mr. Smith and perhaps someone at the Justice Department or both to remind the American people again, what are the differences between these cases and why was one charge and why was not? Uh, two, we are living at a time, we have two, the two leading candidates for president, both parties, both parties believe that they're too old to be president. If a majority of them do, we're like new people. We now have to the judge's point, to the point been made around the table, we now have an independent verification for someone who chose not to bring legal charges against the president citing strongly, I've not read all of the document, but citing strongly is one of the reasons that the president's memory and mental faculties are, would be a favor for him in trial and he would appeal to the jury and he didn't want to indict him for, or indict him the wrong thing, but didn't want to bring charges or recommend charges for that reason. So this is something, again, I, the Justice Department and the special prosecutor on the other side, Mr. Smith, I think just because the country is so embroiled and engaged with this is going to have to explain again the yeah. differences between these two you cases. Want to the last word? I think it's the this worst guy's two a Democrat. Weeks since He's the in the cuck seat. Uh, Fox 5 has like one guy in the cuck seat every time. This is the guy in the cuck chair today. It's usually Jessica Valen Valentini or whatever her name is or Greg Giraldo. Today he's the guy. Mm. Okay, in the polling he already bottomed out <laughs> at 33% and he's down 6 to Trump. And now you have quotes. Here's a quote. When did I stop being vice president? Yeah. Or another quote. Am I still vice president in 2009? Those are direct quotes from the president. This man is the president. That's hard. And you just imagine if, if, if this was a report about Donald Trump. Mm. <laughs> I think it was. They just made it up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the, the 25th Amendment stuff. All right. Coming up, the big. Wait, imagine if this was a report about Donald Trump. Yeah.
you would you would defend it. And also, you did defend it because this was a report about Donald Trump. That's liberals are behaving in the exact same way that you guys are behaving. That's why it's so funny. It's fucking hilarious. They're like, oh, imagine if Trump was pop for the same shit. It's like, no, we don't have to imagine. You did it. You literally did it. You did that shit. That happened already. If they asked you to be in the cuck chair, would you do it? Yes. Um, what a wonderful time. What a wonderful time that we live in where, you know, we have experts going through piece by piece and analyzing why one senile president shouldn't be charged for charges of retaining classified documents while the other also kind of senile, not as senile president, former president running for president currently is, is it should be given the death penalty. Basically. It's just, it's awesome. It's great. Now I am in it for the content. I don't give a shit. I think these guys are all demons. Okay. That clip is going to go so hard out of context. Which clip I would love to sit on the Fox news cuck chair. Yes. Oh, you mean because I said I would love to sit on the cuck chair? Is that why? Yeah. Situ. Oh, it's gone. Sit. Or no, it's not gone. City. I love that. It's so cute. That's me in the cuck chair. City. That's me in the corner. That's me in the cuck chair. First of all, wow, what an unbelievable report that has been filed by the special counsel. What really strikes me here are the reasons to decline to prosecute this case. Remember, the former president, Donald Trump, also facing charges at this point in time for willful retention of documents. You've got that word willful again here. We are talking about the current president of the United States for behavior when he was the then vice president and following that. Why that's so important is because those two charges or those two allegations certainly track, but one resulted in not a prosecution. The other did. Now, remember, both this person, this Special Counsel Her and Jack Smith have been on parallel tracks investigating the retention of classified documents. Where they vary is the meat of the matter, Brianna. They vary because... Yeah. Donald Trump demonstrated mental competence with his famous woman-man camera TV interview where he showed, without a shadow of doubt, proved to the global population that he has got it. He's all there. His brain works in the nicest ways possible. Brandon, on the other hand, has not passed the mental competence test in the way that, uh, in, in, the, in the most public ways possible. So, that's a big deal. This is a vibe talking about the Trump docs case, dick riding him. Oh, you found like a... Here. Donald Beautiful. Trump gets unsealed. The former president getting hit with 37 charges in the classified documents case. Trump's aide also get. Thank you, Chatter, for sending this. This is what I mean when I say synchronicity. Chatter is is perfect here. This is like let's see what they had to say when when uh, when Donald Trump got charged. Being indicted. The feds say there are two instances of Trump showing classified material to people, including a military plan of attack against an unnamed country. Trump's accused of directing an aide to move documents out of a storage room before an FBI subpoena. The DOJ also claiming that Trump suggested to his lawyer that they should hide or destroy the documents. The former president will appear in federal court Tuesday in Miami and is proclaiming his innocence. And we have tremendous... You could just hire a guy? Yeah, dude, I could, except it would not be the same. I know. I know. Oh, great. You're in... You're the... For the content, but then also we're black billed idiots if we don't want to vote. Yeah, I could. I could just hire a guy. Except, you know, there are plenty of outlets that do that, and it's not as fun because it's not as interactive. The entire point of this, the entire point of this back and forth is not that uh the entire point of this back and forth is not because I can't hire a guy. I am the guy for the most part. Okay. 
It's that this is interactive. No, it's not the free work. Oh my God. You once again are cucking your own content. You are cucking your own content. Always and forever. Twitch chat loves the content, doesn't want to even think about how the sausage is made while they're playing the role of making the sausage. That's it. It's literally the same principle behind like people that make their TTS into their own content, like Forson or XQC or many other, uh, you know, newer uh, Twitch streamers do this where it's like, oh, well, you should pay me to write funny TTS. It's like, dude, what are you talking about? You're the one who's paying to make that joke. I don't do that. Yeah, I can, I can look all of this stuff up myself. It's just not going to be as interactive. <sighs> anyway, it is ironic though, because like that person said that specifically so that I would respond to him and would, you know, interact with him personally. So he's literally doing the thing. He's demanding the interaction, whether he recognized it or not. Let's get back to the video, though. Okay. Let's see what the five had to say when Donald Trump was the one who was under the same exact crosshairs. And more, actually, and then some. Support. But that was a hoax and a scam. And now they're doing it again. It's just a continuation. Seven years. I'm an innocent man. I did nothing wrong. And we will fight this out just like we've been fighting for seven years. It would be wonderful if we could f devote our full time to making America great again. Special counsel Jack Smith breaking his silence, but not taking questions on why he decided to indict Trump. Our nation's commitment to the rule of law sets an example for the world. We have one set of laws in this country and they apply to everyone. It's very important for me to note that the defendants in this case must be presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt in a court of law. Joe Biden saying that he doesn't know what the Joe Biden DOJ was doing. President Biden, have you spoken to Attorney General Merrick Garland yet? I have not spoken to him at all. I'm not going to speak to him. No comment on what happened. And the liberal media has been popping the champagne since the news broke. I don't know. It's, it's, it's sad and it's shocking, but it's also kind of, it's, it makes me feel a bit relieved. Line by line by line of this indictment lays out calculation, deliberate misconduct. You can see the voluminous nature of this, that they have the goods and the receipts. It is bad news. I have never seen anything hit Donald Trump this hard. That sound that you hear is silence, mm -hmm. largely, from Republicans in these moments. Uh, maybe they're reading this 50-page document. The taped conversation. Is that a, a smoking gun? Do they consider as part of a potential plea offer something that would prescribe him, proscribe him from... God, the role from, reversal from is fire. Again? Judge Jeanine Pira, you've been reading the indictment. How would you characterize it? <sighs> you know, I am so livid right now. I am furious. I have spent over three decades in a system that I believe in. I'm a believer. <laughs> but today, I am no longer a believer. What you've got is a weaponized Department of Justice, Department of FBI, and CIA. We saw it from the time he came down that, that escalator. They started with a Russia collusion hoax, and we know that Hillary Clinton made it up. She even told a president, the Durham report, she told Biden and she told Obama she was gonna do it to get rid of her email scandal. So what did they do? The FBI lied. They went to a FISA court judge. They lied three more times. They needed to get this guy, and then they see they violated the Fourth Amendment rights of one American and spied on a presidential candidate. And we now know it was all a hoax started by Hillary Clinton. But that wasn't enough. Then what we had is the FBI telling social media, you can expect that there's going to be Russian disinformation in the form of a Hunter Biden laptop. And that's when they interfered with the presidential election for the second time. And 51 CIA.
it is pretty telling that the bulk of her argument is completely irrelevant to the situation that she's trying to defend. Her argument is the media. I mean, uh, the, the, I got what, more what the good fuck? news. That's the, Oh shit. Her argument here is that they're biased. They're biased towards our big, beautiful boy. And they, she can't show that they're biased towards our big, beautiful boy without spending most of the time talking about all the other ways in which the media and numerous other organs that are completely irrelevant to the feder to the feds are biased towards our big, beautiful boy. I do love it though. She's like to get this guy. And then they see they violated the fourth amendment rights of one American and spied on a presidential candidate. And we now know it was all a hoax started by Hillary Clinton, but that wasn't enough. Then what we had is the FBI telling social media, you can expect that there's going to be Russian disinformation in the form of a Hunter Biden laptop. And that's when they interfered with the presidential election for the second time. And 51 CIA intelligence agents. So we've got the DOJ, the FBI, the CIA say, oh, this is Russian disinformation when we know damn well it wasn't Russian disinformation. And now what you've got is a loser prosecutor, Jack Smith, who's been slapped down by the United States Supreme Court in his in one of his. OK, we still haven't talked about the actual facts of the matter that if I were a lawyer, I would give up my law license. I'd be so embarrassed hiding under a rock. He's the one who prosecuted John Edwards. He's got a political agenda. And this is all over a Presidential Records Act, which is a civil, civil suit, a civil issue. And so what they do is they put out this narrative indictment. Oh, this is a story of wrongdoing, national defense. And let's put in espionage. We can kind of tie it into the Russian collusion. So people will say, oh, it could have been the Russians. This is nonsense. And I want to know how many documents were altered? How many documents were destroyed? Zero. Zero. But who destroyed 33,000 documents that she lied about over and over again? <laughs> and then, and then moving on to Hillary Clinton. There you have it, dude. Not even hitting like, don't, not even hitting the arguments. Basically just like spent the entire time being like Donald Trump the most innocent man of all time, bullshit case, liberals at it again, pivot back to Hillary Clinton. She spent almost zero seconds on the actual information. Hillary Clinton. She destroyed the them. That was tampering with evidence. That was obstruction of justice. And did the DOJ, the FBI care? They didn't give a damn. But now they care. What are they so afraid of? Let him run for office. And if he loses, then that's the end of it. I hate a country that is akin to a third world country. This is a banana republic. When you indict one guy running for president and the guy who's doing it is some old geezer who says, you know what? I don't know anything about it. The day, by the way, the day that we finally get under threat of contempt of the head of the FBI, we finally get a 1023 from a credible FBI source, credible, $200,000 worth of credibility, the FBI paid him, saying Joe took $5 million, Hunter took $5 million from Ukraine. And I'm not done yet. I'll tell you something else. This whole thing with Ukraine, why the heck is everybody going to Ukraine? Why do we put billions and billions and billions of dollars into Ukraine? What the heck is going on over there? Randy Weingarten going to check out education. And Joe Biden goes over there in January of... She not done. She not done. She got smoke for Ukraine too. 2018. And he says, if you don't get the prosecutor off that company where my son makes $80,000 a month, and if you don't get rid of him, I'm not going to give you the billion dollars that the United States promised you. Well, Joe, that's called pay to play. It's an organized criminal enterprise that we have as a president. I think it's really funny that the Ukraine situation with Hunter Biden and Joe Biden is another like avenue attack for them, which is hilarious because like Donald Trump literally on a phone conversation that was recorded and released very openly did pay for play. Pay to win. Like he did that in the perfect phone call. One of the many perfect phone calls that he had a phone call that he got impeached for. If you remember, where he openly stated, give me some dirt on Joe Biden or else I'm going to not give you the, the, 
weapons that Congress had already approved to send you. On Brandon's case, and there is a real distinction here, on Brandon's case, the Burisma prosecutors were, uh, the Burisma prosecutor was literally called upon by the entire fucking global population that had interest in Ukraine to be fired. It had nothing to do with Hunter Biden at all, and that very same Burisma prosecutor had actually helped Hunter Biden, or at least Burisma, at the time, before they called on firing him. The calling on firing the Burisma prosecutor was also bipartisan. There were literally Republicans that wrote a letter to the administration at the time to fire the prosecutor. So it is almost exactly the opposite of the situation that you're trying to present. But of course, it's not even related. It's not even related to the case at all. She spent like five minutes just yapping about all this other shit. The president and his family, they should be ashamed and every American should be ashamed of what happened today. <laughs> well said. Jessica, I assume you agree with most of that. <laughs> I was struck by a lot of what the judge just said, mostly the fact that she didn't address <laughs> the documents that were panning across the Get screen. Him, Jessica! Where is Jessica? Jessica should be fucking shitting on... Uh, Jessica should be defending Biden right now, but she's not on. found in the bathroom, in the shower. Yeah. Or, Here you or, go. Okay, okay, okay. I don't care about the Jessica stuff. I want to hear on, more from the yappers. The well, it's the sole authority to make personal, just as the Bill Clinton sock drawer case proved, and just as an Obama judge ratified, that is the law. It's yeah. a civil situation. It's not criminal. So this is all nothing. Well, and, and I'll tell you why it does matter. And it's not just deflection to talk about Hillary Clinton and to talk about Joe Biden and Hunter Biden. And the fact that classified documents that were taken by Joe Biden when he was a senator ended up in his garage. Wait, Jessica Tarkov? Jessica escaped from Tarkov is pregnant? She's pregante? I thought she was a libtard, bro. There's no pregante. There's no being pregnant when you're a libtard. She didn't get an abortion? Bruh. She should be out there getting abortions. What is happening? Also shocking that Fox has a maternity leave. Maybe because she is the libtard on the... She was able to get that. Waiting for that late term. Yeah. Aborabo. Wake up, drink your coffee, drive your Tesla to the abortion center. Damn, it feels good to be a libtard. Yep. Pregante, yeetus the fetus. I just want to say you gained plus one Hassan Abi fan. My baby was born the other day. See, oh my God, there's more liberals in here that have that are popping out babies. Stop it! Abortions for all. Okay. Anyway, that's the Joe Brandon situation. Uh, we will get back to the Tucker Carlson. Uh, saga when in like the next I would say uh, approximately 18 minutes we will get the Tucker Carlson Vladimir Vladimir Putin interview um, but uh, very quickly let's talk Israel. about Netanyahu rejecting the proposed hostage and ceasefire deal that's right everyone always was like uh, for the past couple of weeks uh, uh, through the the emissaries or through the the uh, third party mediators in Qatar and you know global leadership, uh, Hamas and Israel have been talking about the terms and conditions of a ceasefire. And immediately, I think like before before any terms and conditions were put forward, the the uh, Israeli government brought forward conditions that were ridiculous. It was like everyone in Hamas has to come out and like kill themselves publicly for the ceasefire to happen or some shit like that. Obviously I'm joking. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but now uh, Hamas actually made a pretty solid, very decent, very understandable, very, I mean, very reasonable ceasefire negotiation. They brought it to the table and predictably Netanyahu said, absolutely not. 
Israel Hamas war, Prime Minister Netanyahu rejected Hamas's counter proposal for a ceasefire deal that would free the hostages in Gaza. But U.S. Secretary of State Blinken says a deal is still possible. Our foreign correspondent James. Yeah, they're on. They're on some other shit over here at the State Department. Okay, they're smoking that good crack. Okay, they're smoking that loud Kush. They are on that good shit. They've lost their fucking minds, I suppose. Constantly talking about like, no, 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 you don't understand. This genocidal maniac that you see on television every day, he's actually a small bean and not as genocidal as he presents himself. Blogman is in Tel Aviv with more. Good morning to you, James. Good morning, Robin. Yeah, there was a lot of expectation growing towards this deal, not least from the hostage families. But Prime Minister Netanyahu says he cannot accept Hamas's terms. Despite all this, Hamas. Secretary of State Blinken says he does see space for an agreement. This morning, despite growing pressure to accept a deal to bring home Israel's remaining hostages, Benjamin Netanyahu has rejected a Hamas ceasefire proposal. He called their conditions delusional. Hamas called for the withdrawal of all Israeli troops from Gaza over a four and a half month ceasefire. Over three phases, Hamas would release all hostages with Israel exchanging prisoners. Wow, how delusional. Damn, dog. What a crazy delusional ceasefire negotiation hmm that's it i mean it is pretty much it is pretty basic it's pretty cut and dry uh it is a it is a multi-tiered ceasefire agreement where yes over the course of four and a half months is like a full withdrawal yeah not not a single part of this is delusional it is a super straightforward ceasefire agreement okay like they, but they're basically like, hey, can you please stop killing babies for like three and a half seconds? Okay, just please, please stop killing Palestinian children ruthlessly for like three seconds. And they were like, absolutely not. We will never stop. I'm never stopping the, the uh, wanton punishment, the cruel and unusual punishment that I subject Palestinian babies to. You cannot stop me. Instead, the war rages on, and Gaza's last city still standing, Rafa, now in the crosshairs. The UN says a quarter of a million are sheltering. Um, here, we'll, we'll, actually, you know what? I want to do a deeper dive into the, the, the positions put forward by, uh, the Hamas side of things, because there's more to it than just that. There's also, uh, allowing more aid. They did not, they didn't bring up that part, but they also, uh, asked to allow more aid into Gaza as well, especially in the early stages, which has been a routine request by Hamas from the jump. Okay. It could be due to the people Hamas wants to release. Yes. Marwan Barghouti. Hamas continues to centrally demand that Israel release one of the Fatah, the one Fatah guy that would solidly beat them in a presidential election. That is... One of the craziest parts about this story is that everyone is talking about how like, oh, well, we don't want Hamas. We don't want Hamas. It's like the one guy who's not fucking Hamas that could absolutely unite the Palestinians under a secular banner that is objectively not Hamas is, as we've talked about before, Marwan Barghouti. Osama Hamdan, a senior Hamas official in Beirut, said the group remains committed to his initial demands for a permanent ceasefire. Hamdan also said the group seeks the release of thousands of Palestinian prisoners being held for acts related to the conflict with Israel, including those serving life sentences. He mentioned two by name, including Marwan Barghouti. Marwan Barghouti is the, the uh, I guess, closest you can get to, like, the Palestinian Nelson Mandela, as far as I understand it. And is objectively not Hamas. He is not Hamas at all. And he is so not Hamas that if Hamas had political aspirations, they would never want fucking Marwan Barghouti out. So why are they pushing for it? Why are they pushing for Marwan Barghouti to be released? Well, because Hamas, for all of the bad shit that they have done, whether it be on October 7 or whether... Uh, the the uh, mishandling or or the the 
uh, shitty civil governance that they engage in with the best uh, to their ability, obviously, some good, some bad, is still a nationalist resistance front. Okay? Portraying them as an Islamist fundamentalist, uh, well, not, they do have Islamist fundamentalism uh, baked into their, their uh, especially their inception, but portraying them as a Salafist organization, like akin to ISIS, for example, is really fucking stupid for this reason. Because they have regularly, despite having internal conflict with like the DFLP or the PFLP or even Fatah members, they have routinely, they have routinely advocated for the release of hostages held by the Israeli government that are from other factions, that are from competing political factions. You do not do this if you have legitimate political aspirations of permanent governance, okay? You do not demand that a more popular figure, and I've shown you this before, I showed you Marwan Barghouti and how popular he is amongst the Palestinian population, we looked at polling results even like a couple months ago that showed that he is significantly more popular than Hamas, significantly more popular than the Palestinian Authority, which everyone is more popular than the Palestinian Authority. Palestinian Authority is basically Israel in the eyes of the Palestinians, which is correct. They are a continuation and extension of the Israeli security apparatus. And, uh, and yet, this is completely unacceptable. Like in the eyes of the, I guess in the eyes of the most reactionary uh, uh, factions within the Israeli population. Uh, releasing him would be objectively good, says Elant News, for Israel and tame more radical elements such as the armed wing of Hamas, which would likely decrease attacks and increase the security of Israel. The issue here is that this would increase support internationally for a Palestinian state and remove the we're constantly under attack card, which would invalidate some of Israel's claims. Exactly. That is the major reason. Because to Israel... A militant faction, a militant resistance group is not something that the Israeli right is afraid of, or even Israel is afraid of, really. Okay? They are infinitely more afraid of those who can present a better, more sympathetic argument of the Palestinian plight to an international community. That is why they have routinely assassinated people who have never even held a weapon in their hands. The only weapon they held was a pen which I guess, according to Israel, is mightier than the sword. Ghassan Kanafini is a great example of this. He was killed. He was assassinated by Israel alongside his family members for the crime of being a writer. So, that's something that you have to remember when talking about uh, Israel's interests, okay? This is allegedly the full Paris framework drafted by Qatar for the ceasefire. Hamas has released full uh, its response to the Paris framework agreement drafted by Qatar for a ceasefire. They likely done so to circumvent the ensuing misinformation that will circulate the media as Israel is likely to reject it and to generate public conversation. The response outlines a roadmap to a full ceasefire that would take place over 135 days in three phases, each stage lasting 45 days. This is what I uh, read as well. The guarantors of the agreement are Egypt, Qatar, Turkey, Russia, the United Nations. Phase one, the first 45 days. This humanitarian phase aims to release all Israeli women and children under the age of 19, non-recruits, the elderly and sick in exchange for a specific number of Palestinian prisoners. It also calls to increase humanitarian assistance, the repositioning of forces outside of populated areas, allowing the start of a reconstruction of hospitals, houses, and facilities in all areas of the Strip. For himself, for think of the five the subs, allowing the UN and its agencies to provide humanitarian aid services. It also wants to establishing shelter. It also wants to establish shelter camps for the population. This will accordingly take place along the following: temporary cessation of military operations, cessation of aerial reconnaissance, reposition of Israeli forces away from the populated areas in the entire Gaza Strip. That is, repositioning of Israeli forces away so that they are aligned to the border in order to enable the parties to complete the exchange of detainees and prisoners. Start the indirect discussions on the requirements for the restoration of full peace. My note, this is a key shift in Hamas trying to meet Israel and U.S. halfway 
attempting to secure a full ceasefire agreement within a period implementing this initial phase. The annex below attached to the details of the first phase is an integral part of this agreement, provided that the details of the second and third phases are agreed upon during the implementation in the first phase. Phase two, the second 45 days, the indirect talks on the necessary requirements to continue the cessation of mutual military operation and the return to a state of full peace must be completed and announced before the implementation of the second phase. This phase aims to release all male detainees, civilians, and recruits in exchange for a specific number of Palestinian prisoners. See continuation of humanitarian measures from the first phase. The exit of Israeli forces outside the borders of all areas of Gaza. It begins the start of comprehensive reconstruction of houses, facilities, and infrastructure that were destroyed in all areas of the Gaza Strip according to the specific mechanisms to ensure the implementation of this. See the end of the blockade on the entirety of the Gaza Strip. All of this is perfectly within the bounds of reason. Okay. Honestly, what is the Zionist reasoning for denying this agreement without saying the quiet part out loud? From day one, they have said that their goal this time around is the complete eradication of Hamas. If your goal is the complete, er complete eradication of Hamas, this proposal requires Hamas to continue existing in Gaza. Okay. But we know what their real goals are. The real goal is the ethnic cleansing of all ethnic cleansing of all Palestinians. Oh, the interview is up. The, the following Vladimir Putin interview is two hours long. I'm not watching but all hours of this, by the way. That's crazy, dude. But, but we will, we will have, we will watch some of it. Okay. We'll see. We'll see if it's fucking fire. I'll watch all of it. Who knows? But you won't be watching that shit because at the top of the hour, there's a three minute ad break. If you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe for $5 or for free with a Twitch prime. Why do you keep saying Hamas like that? Uh, that's how racist people say Hamas. Uh, that's how Israeli uh, ultra Zionists say Hamas. And the more you hit the ch, the more reactionary you are to the existence of Palestinian people. That's why I jokingly say it. Pivot starting now. We are so fortunate to have a real leader, a true friend, and a historic vice president, Kamala Harris. We couldn't do this without you, Kamala. No fucking way, dude. No fucking way. Oh my God. Anyway, yes fucking way to the top of the hour ad break, baby. Woo! We are going in to, oh boy, oh boy, big news, big news, Vladimir Putin, big news, oh boy. Family Mart Japan BDS, by the way. Family Mart is one of the umbrella um, under Itochu as well. What is that link to this current war happening? Itochu Corporation, one of the subsidiaries that they have is Itochu Aviation. They are the weapon dealers for Elbit system. Wait, Itochu Aviation literally stopped working with uh, Elbit. This, this interview is old. This is, hey, here's a, here is actually some good news, but Here's what happened. This is correct. Family Mart, okay, uh, famous for Femi Chiki, uh, has a subsidiary uh, under the name of Itochu. Itochu does work with Israel's Elbit Systems, Israel's weapons manufacturer, Elbit Systems, okay? And before you say Femi Chiki is a Zionist op, it is not true. There was a petition in Japan. There was a petition in Japan that got a shit ton of signatures for Itochu to stop working with Israel's Elbit weapon systems. And guess what? Unlike American corporations that say, suck my cock, whenever you fucking demand things like this, Elbit, by the way, is, yes, the number one weapons manufacturer for Israel, okay? Itochu complied. And they stopped working with Israel's Elbit Systems. Systems and Elbit Systems are the biggest weapon company in Israel. And those weapons are killing children, people. Do you think Japanese people... Japanese megacorps are absurd. How are you going to say the Famichiki Corp is on the same umbrella as a weapons manufacturer? Hello, welcome to the world of Hitachi. That's right, Hitachi, famous for the magic wand, which is, of course, the top shelf vibrator that every sex worker loves to use. Okay. They are also famous for anti-aircraft weapon systems and also famous for making HVAC 
uh, systems as well. So the idea that like Japanese corporations do not, or Korean corporations or any number of like different Asian companies love participating in every avenue. These are holding groups, okay? They do that. They do all that shit. My dad works at Hitachi and upper management knows about that meme lol. Exactly. They also make heavy construction machinery. Yep. Another good example in the U.S. Honeywell and Texas Instruments are defense contractors as well. Yes. What's the brand? The brand that makes those little jars. Was it Honeywell that also makes the tanks? Or is it Honeywell? Is it not Honeywell? It is Honeywell, right? Or is it Bell? Or ball. Yes. All right. Anyway, um, a lot of these companies operate like this. Okay. So, so fun fact about the the situation with uh, with with respect to to what we just saw, uh, Femi Chiki, still safe. Femi Chiki is not made with the blood of Palestinian children. Uh, fear not. All right. Let's get to. Let's get to Vladi Poo being glazed up by the King Glazer himself, Tucker Carlson. He is an interview with the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, shot February 6, 2024, at about 7 p.m. in the building behind us, which is, of course, the Kremlin. The interview, as you will see if you watch it, is primarily about the war in progress, the war in Ukraine, how it started, what's happening, and most pressingly, how it might end. One note before you watch. At the beginning of the interview, we asked the most obvious question, which is, why did you do this? Did you feel a threat, an imminent physical threat? And that's your justification. And the answer we got shocked us. Putin went on for a very long time, probably half an hour, about the history of Russia going back to the 8th century. And honestly, we thought this was a filibustering technique and found it annoying and interrupted him several times. And he responded he was annoyed uh, by the interruption. But we concluded in the end, for what it's worth, that it was not a filibustering technique. There was no time limit on the interview. We ended it after more than two hours. Instead, what you're about to see seemed to us sincere, whether you agree with it or not. Vladimir Putin believes that Russia has a historic claim to parts of Western Ukraine. So our opinion would be to view it in that light as a sincere Wait. expression. Vladimir Putin believes sincerely that he has a historic claim to parts of not Eastern, Western Ukraine? Is that a misspeak? Or is this motherfucker on crack cocaine? Oh my lord. ...of what he thinks. And with that, here it is. Mr. President, thank you. On February 22nd, 2022, you addressed your country in a nationwide address when the conflict in Ukraine started. And you said that you were acting because you had come to the conclusion that the United States, through NATO might initiate a, quote, surprise attack on our country. And to American ears, that sounds paranoid. Tell us why you believe the United States might strike Russia. Dude, I've seen Vladimir Putin in such limited ways that immediately when I see him in a situation like this, I, I, my mind goes to that TikTok Vladimir Putin that's always like hitting the nuclear button on the White House, like dancing with the skibbity dope guy. Like, it feels like he, it's not real. It feels like he's not the guy. That this is the, the Vladimir Putin impersonator that's going to start dancing. You know what I'm talking about? You have to know, the, the Vladimir Putin body double guy, like... Uh, out of the blue. How did you conclude that? It's not that America, the United States, was going to launch a surprise strike on Russia. I didn't say that. Are we having a talk show or a serious conversation? <laughs> Here's the quote. Thank you. It's a formidable series. Oh my God. He is sucking on the pee pee, dude. Yo! Yo! Oh God. <laughs> Yo! Oh Jesus Christ. Because your basic education is in history as far as I understand. Yes. So if you don't mind, I will take only 30 seconds or one minute to give you a short reference to history for giving you a little historical background. Please. 
<coughs> Let's look where our relationship with Ukraine started from. Where did Ukraine come from? The Russian state started gathering itself as a centralized statehood, and it is considered to be the year of the establishment of the Russian state in 862, when the townspeople of Novgorod invited a Varangian prince. Bro, are you fucking, are you for real, dude? Are you for really real? That's insane that we are... Bro, he literally... He's like, let me tell you, let me tell you the his let me tell you how we were just all, we were a gas cloud, okay? Let me tell you about the Big Bang. You can't just, dude, he's doing, he's doing Russ lore dumps. Rurik from Scandinavia to reign. In 1862, Russia celebrated the 1000th anniversary of its statehood. Oh my god, he's literally doing Israel. Oh my god, he's doing Netanyahu Israel shit. It's so funny. Oh god, I, this is why I love like Ukrainian flag, Israeli flag in the bio guys who just like don't realize that what Vladimir Putin is doing is literally like it, it's Israel shit. And in Novgorod, there is a memorial dedicated to the 1000th anniversary of the country. In 882, Rurik's successor, Prince Oleg, who was actually playing the role of regent at Rurik's younger son, because Rurik had died by that time, came to Kiev. He ousted two brothers who... He's doing that because Ukraine is stealing Russian history live, he has to explain why it's wrong. ...apparently had... ...once been... Yeah, the Russian claim that the Kievan Rus were Russian, by that logic Ukraine can claim Russia too? Turn it into a real. Why do you keep comparing Russia to Israel? What the fuck? First of all, are you familiar with both of these countries? Fuck you mean. Comparing Russia to Israel is is definitely not out of pocket at all. Okay. Also, Russia and Israel have a pretty solid relationship, despite the fact that Vladimir Putin is always like, oh yeah, I love, I love Palestinians, like you know. A lot of Russians in Israel, okay? So that's number one. Number two, he's literally doing like lore dumps and, and Russian mythology to justify his irredentist actions in Ukraine. Why do you keep comparing Russia to Israel? What the fuck? I'm Palestinian. Okay. So? He has no real nationalist, like, look, if you talk about being genuinely afraid of NATO or wanting to uh, put forward a red line as a matter of national security, as a foreign adversary, that's one argument. If you make irredentist claims with, like, lore dumps about why you should actually invade Ukraine and take it over... Because technically, you know, those are, that's your land. All right. Then, yeah, you're doing directly IDF playbook shit. You're doing Israel, uh, you're doing Israel propaganda to a T. Members of Rurik's squad. So Russia began to develop with two centers of power, <coughs> Kiev and Novgorod. The next very significant date in the history of Russia was 988. This was the baptism of Russia, when Prince Vladimir, the great-grandson of Rurik, baptized Russia and adopted Orthodoxy, or Eastern Christianity. From this time, the centralized Russian state began to strengthen. Why? Because of the single territory, integrated economic ties, one and the same language and, after the baptism of Russia, the same faith and rule of the prince. The centralized Russian state began to take shape. Back in the Middle Ages, Prince Yaroslav the Wise introduced the order of succession to a throne. But after he passed away, it became complicated for various reasons. Okay. The throne was passed not directly from father to eldest son, but from the prince, who had passed away to his brother, then to his sons in different lines. 
All this led to the fragmentation and the end of Rus as a single state. There was nothing special about it. The same was happening then in Europe. But the fragmented Russian state became an easy prey to... <laughs> Connor, this is the stuff that American media uh, doesn't want you to know, I guess. Yeah, incredibly boring, convoluted arguments that don't make any fucking sense unless you're like completely one-sided on the issue. Like, this is what, this is what my, my fucking haters think I'm making a claim on like Taiwan uh, with respect to China. Like, this is what they think I'm saying. When I talk about like Taiwan's historical significance or its inception, while still maintaining the position that if they truly want autonomy, then they deserve it. But I completely understand where the Chinese position comes from as far as like their own security, uh, their own security interests, okay? As, as uh, America utilizes Taiwan as like a weapon against their foreign adversary, wields Taiwan and Taiwanese independence as a weapon against their foreign adversary, and why most people, most people in uh, Taiwan, while they do want independence, understand that the current way, current order of business of economic cooperation is significantly better uh, than, than anything else. This is what they think I mean when I talk about all this shit. They think I'm saying like, well, Taiwan is Chinese and uh, therefore it's, it's, it belongs to mainland China. Was the U.S. not doing that in Ukraine? Not saying that the invasion was justified? No, the, the, U.S. Is, the U.S. is utilization of Ukraine against Russia and claiming that they were going to bring Ukraine into NATO when they weren't actually ever really interested in bringing them into NATO, okay, is a way to inflame the tensions. But the goal is not to eat the bait, especially after you have already annexed Crimea. Anyway, the empire created earlier by King is Khan. His successors, namely Batu Khan, came to Rus, plundered and ruined nearly all the cities. The southern part, including Kiev, by the way, and some other cities simply lost independence, while northern cities preserved some of their sovereignty. They had to pay tribute to the horde, but they managed... I'm precogging him blaming Ukraine's existence on Lenin. I mean, it's not... He's blamed Lenin before for it. ...to preserve it. some part of their sovereignty. And then a unified Russian state began to take shape <coughs> with its center in Moscow. <coughs> the southern part of Russian lands... That's wrong. The U.S. was never reluctant to bring Ukraine into NATO. Quite the contrary. Yeah, no, that's, that's why Ukraine is currently in NATO. And Article 5 was implemented. And that's why there's American troops currently fighting uh, in, a, in a direct hot war with Russia. You're right. No, totally. When George W. Bush said we're going to bring Georgia and Ukraine into NATO on his way out in like uh, in like the last month of his presidency, basically, uh, that was and, and uh, fuck Russia's red lines on that matter. That totally was was real and valid, you know. Dog, for NATO to uh, to operate, you still need cooperation from European states to also vote in for new members. That in even includes like ridiculous guys like Turkey, Erdogan, which are still easy to control, as Erdogan has also chirped about Sweden and Finland and then uh, capitulated immediately, okay? But the notion that they were going to not take seriously Russia's red lines and actually put Ukraine into NATO, fast-track Ukraine into NATO, was always a ridiculous argument. The Russian argument would be just that would just be that the invasion was to prevent uh, Ukraine joining NATO, except Ukraine wasn't joining NATO regardless because they had already successfully annexed Crimea. Including Kiev. Begun to gradually gravitate. To By the way, none of what we just talked about, everything that we just talked about is related to, obviously, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and why it's unjustifiable. And none of what Vladimir Putin has talked about so far is even, in my opinion, remotely related to them invading Ukraine. Unless, as liberals have clearly fucking stated time and time again in their Yapanomics uh, sessions, that Vladimir Putin is irredentist, Vladimir Putin is imperialist, Vladimir Putin does want Ukraine, and he's basically saying, yeah, no, I do actually, they weren't lying. On God, I want Ukraine. I'm so horny for Ukraine. 
towards another magnet, the center that was emerging in Europe. This was the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. It was even called the Lithuanian Russian Duchy, because Russians were a significant part of this population. They spoke the old Russian language and were Orthodox. But then there was a unification, the union of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and the Kingdom of Poland. A few years later, another union was signed, but this time already in the religious sphere. Some of the Orthodox priests became subordinate to the Pope. Thus, these lands became part of the Polish-Lithuanian state. Yep, Emir Putin. He is yap maxing. During decades, the Poles were engaged in Polonization of this part of the population. They introduced their language there, tried to entrench the idea that this population was not exactly Russians, that because they lived on the fringe, they were Ukrainians. Ukraine wasn't joining NATO anyway because there was a war in the east and in occupied areas, which literally stops it becoming a member state. That's until that's resolved, it couldn't join in twenty four since twenty fourteen. So claiming it will join in twenty twenty two is just a justification is a as a justification is a pure lie. No, I'm I I know that. I recognize that, which is why I'm saying that it was ridiculous that Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine to begin with, and I'm also following up on that and saying that it's also gross on the Western side that they kept selling this tall tale to the Ukrainian population. They were like, come on, go die, go die, go die in defense of Ukraine. We're going to get you, we're going to put, uh, you know, we're leading up to uh, the, the last invasion. They were like, no, 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 trust me. We're so going to give you NATO where you're going to be in NATO. Please. I promise you're going to be in NATO. It's bullshit. Why do you think he invaded Ukraine other than to keep their market and economy in the Russian market and prevent it becoming a EU subsidiary? I think he invaded Ukraine because he's a fucking, he very openly is stating it. He's a fucking idiot who uh, personally thought that this would be the most effective way of dealing with uh, any kind of Western involvement that Ukraine would have. Uh, any kind of Western involvement that Ukraine would have, he would be able to like cut short. I also personally think that he greatly uh, overestimated the, the air superiority that they would have. That's what I think. I think he thought, we have air superiority, we'll overtake it, which was stupid from the jump. Like, it was always stupid. And I, as much as people say I'm a fucking Vladimir Putin dick rider, I stated very clearly even before Russia invaded Ukraine and certainly after that it was virtually impossible for uh, the Russian military to permanently annex a country whose national identity is quite literally comprised, like the basic fundamentals of being a Ukrainian is about not being Russian, okay? Is about literally, even in certain instances, basically fucking aligning with the Nazis like Bandera to not be Russian. 44 million people used to live in Ukraine before the invasion, okay? Their entire nationalist identity is comprised of not being Russian. There is no fucking shot. There is no shot that they were going to be able to permanently annex, especially the Western areas, okay? Most analysts agree everyone overemphasizes the effectiveness of Russia's massive air force, coupled with the fact that Russian strikes on the first days failed to destroy Ukraine's air defenses. Yeah. It's stupid. It was stupid. Why? Because Ukraine was fully supplied and filled with all different weapons. No, it was always stupid because it was impossible to permanently annex. It was impossible to permanently annex a country like that. Counterinsurgent. Guys, look at fucking Gaza. Look at Gaza and Israel. Israel has a infinitely stronger military force with, with so much better weapons. And they over the course of the past couple of months, have lost more military members in fucking Gaza than they did against fucking Lebanon over the course of years, okay? Do you understand how devastating that shit is? You cannot do a fucking counterinsurgency in an urban environment against a population that has nowhere else to go and is going to fight tooth and fucking nail. 
this is no longer like war is no longer like, oh, you get your legionnaires out there. They get their legionnaires and you fucking fight in the open field. And then the rest is just peasantry that you roll over with your cavalry. And then now it's your territory. It doesn't work like that anymore. Okay. You got fucking dudes buying drones off of Alibaba and dropping grenades on top of like Russian military positions while filming it and posting it on fucking subreddits. Like, what are we talking about? There is as many as 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 much adma advancement as we've seen in the field of modern war there's also a democratization effect in the form of like bayraktars for example anyway like think about vietnam think about afghanistan 1 think about afghanistan 2 afghanistan 1 with the ussr afghanistan 2 with the united states of america it's just like, it seems that people don't understand. They think like, no, my dad can beat up your dad. My dad's dick is bigger than your dad's dick. And that's how things work. If that's how things work, then America would literally, you know, America would have built one massive McDonald's on Afghanistan and called it a fucking day. Anyway. ridiculous wait what did you say the live stream was watching just went down on youtube so you'd probably be next wait why this is not like this is perfectly valid to watch that's ridiculous what anyway let's continue uh, <laughs> Originally, the word Ukrainian meant that the person was living on the outskirts of the state, along the fringes, or was engaged in a border patrol service. It didn't mean any particular ethnic group. So the Poles were trying to, in every possible way, to polonize this part of the Russian lands and actually treated it rather harshly, not to say cruelly. All that led to the fact that this part of the Russian lands began to struggle for their rights. They wrote letters to Warsaw demanding that their rights be observed and people be commissioned here, including to Kiev. I beg your pardon, can you tell us what period, I'm losing track of where in history we are, the, the Polish oppression of Ukraine. It was in the 13th century. Now I will tell you what happened later and give the date so that there is no confusion. And in 1654, even a bit earlier, the people who were in control of the authority over that part of the Russian lands addressed Warsaw, I repeat, demanding dude. that they send them to rulers of Russian origin and Orthodox faith. When Warsaw did not answer them and in fact rejected their demands, they turned to Moscow so that Moscow took them away. So that you don't think that I'm inventing things, I'll give you these documents. Well, I, I, it doesn't sound like you're inventing it. I'm not sure why it's relevant to what happened. Bro, he, he's like, he has to fake it so hard. Dude, he fakes it harder than Chad's mom every night. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, you brought a document. Or maybe he thinks the document is like laced or something. But still, these are documents from the archives, copies. Here are the letters from Bogdan Hmelnitsky, the man who then controlled the power in this part of the Russian lands that is now called Ukraine. He wrote to Warsaw demanding that their rights be upheld. And after being refused, he began to write letters to Moscow, asking to take them under the strong hand of the Moscow Tsar. There are copies of these documents. I will leave them for your good memory. There is a translation into Russian, you can translate it into English later. Russia would not agree to admit them straight away, assuming that the war with Poland would start. Nevertheless, in 1654, the pan-Russian assembly of top clergy and landowners headed by the Tsar, which was the representative body of the power of the old Russian state, decided to include a part of the old Russian lands into Moscow Kingdom. As expected, the war with Poland began. It lasted 13 years and then in 1654... I like what he's doing. I think we should... <laughs> when all else fails, you can always blame Poland. Okay? And, you know, that's not, not the worst idea. <laughs> a truce was concluded. And 32 years later, I think, a peace treaty with Poland, which they called Eternal Peace, was signed.
отошла к России. Затем во времена Россия вернула все исторические земли. He's like repeating Alexander Dugan. But if this is his justification for invading Ukraine, then yes, the liberals are actually correct that this is just simply pure irredentist action that, they, uh, that he believes is justified due to uh, the, historical, the, the historical reasons as to why Ukraine is actually a part of Russia. Before World yeah, War this is like, this is straight up This is straight up blood and soil shit. For one, Austrian general staff relied on the ideas of Ukrainianization and started actively promoting the ideas of Ukraine and the Ukrainianization. Their motive was obvious. Just before World War I, they wanted to weaken the potential enemy and secure themselves favorable conditions in the border area. So the idea which had emerged in Poland that people residing in that territory were allegedly not really Russians, but rather belonged to a special ethnic group, Ukrainians, started being propagated by the Austrian general staff. As far back as the 19th century, theorists calling for Ukrainian independence appeared. All those, however, claimed that Ukraine should have a very good relationship with Russia. They insisted on that. After the 1917 revolution, Ukraine does not share culture with Russians? Of course it does, man. That's not what I'm saying. I mean, it's like... That, that, that's not... It doesn't matter. That doesn't mean that he can go and, and you know, take it. The Bolsheviks sought to restore the statehood and the civil war began, including the hostilities with Poland. In 1921, peace with Poland was proclaimed, and under that treaty, the right bank of Dnieper River once again was given back to Poland. In 1939, after Poland cooperated with Hitler, It did collaborate with Hitler, you know? Hitler offered Poland peace and a treaty of friendship. Israelis don't share culture with the Palestinians because they're from Europe? Yeah, dude, totally. Every Israeli is from Europe. What are you talking about, dude? There's hella fucking Arab Jews. So many people who are, like, technically pro-Palestinian literally don't understand a very important aspect of this, okay? No, there is a lot of Israeli... There are a lot of Israeli people that are classified as Jewish and therefore not Arab, not seen as Arab in the eyes of the Israeli government even though they're fucking Arab Jews, which means, yes, they do have a, a shit ton of shared culture. It's actually a majority, too. So, no, it's not, it's not, it's not Palestinian citizens of Israel either. I'm not talking about the 22% uh, Arab Christians and Arab Muslims. I'm talking specifically about Arab Jews that are classified as Jewish, Mizrahi and Sephardi, uh, especially, uh, especially Sephardi, in uh, Israel, or yeah, Mizrahi and Sephardi, not Sephardi, especially Sephardi. Mizrahi, especially. An alliance demanding in return that Poland give back to Germany the so-called Danzig Corridor, which connected the bulk of Germany with East Prussia and Königsberg. After World War I, this territory was transferred to Poland, and instead of Danzig, a city of Dansk emerged. Hitler asked them to give it amicably, but they refused. Of course. Still, they collaborated with Hitler and engaged together in the partitioning of Czechoslovakia. But may I ask you, you're making the case that, that Ukraine, certainly parts of Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine, is in, in effect Russia has been for hundreds of years. Why wouldn't you just take it when you became president? 24 years ago. You have nuclear weapons, they don't. If it's actually your land, why did you wait so long? I'll tell you. I'm coming to that. This briefing is coming to an end. It might be boring, but it explains many things. You just don't know how it's relevant. Good. Good. I'm so gratified that you... <laughs> Dude! Dude! He, Tucker said, come on, man, wrap it up. Which is crazy. You can't say that you cannot say 
quit your yapping unless you are so like unless you are playing such a profoundly important role as like a western mouthpiece for russia th there's no shot you can get away with saying that to vladimir putin i feel like bro while tucker carlson is having this conversation just so people understand there are american journalists that are in prison there are russian journalists in prison in russia there are obviously real spies that are also American spies that are in prison in Russia as well. But like there are people who should definitely not be in prison in Russia for the crime of doing actual journalism. Okay. There are also, yeah, I'm not talking about like fucking Paul Whelan. All right. Mr. Passport aficionado. I'm talking like straight up the Wall Street Journal guy, for example, there's like, isn't there, is the Wall Street Journal guy the the Evan Greer or whatever, whatever his name is like that. There are dudes who are, Evan uh, Gershkovich. Um, there are dudes who should not be in prison that are in prison in Russia for doing journalism, for literally doing what Tucker Carlson claims no one is doing in Russia. Okay? That, I think, is, like, pretty fucked up. Obviously, when you look at it from the perspective of... When you look at it from the perspective of, like, uh, uh, all the CNN journalists who, like, turned a blind eye to... To the death and destruction that fell upon uh, every Arab journalist in the region since Israel decided to do ethnic cleansing, right? Um, in in uh, Gaza, they're being they're being kind of phony when they go, "Oh, look at all these journals." But like, I'm not. I I do think that you can't fucking jail prosecute journalists like that. Okay, you can't do that. You can't kill journalists like Israel's doing. You can't prosecute and criminalize journalism like. Russia has done. It's fucked up. You appreciate that. Thank you. So, before World War II, Poland collaborated with Hitler, and although it did not yield to Hitler's... Yeah, we do it too, by the way. Yeah, of course. Of course we do it too. Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning, Julian Assange, and, and you know, Ukraine does a different version of this as well. Like, don't get me wrong. They, they do it too. Everybody does it. But I still think it's fucking wrong and bullshit. Demands it still participated in the partitioning of Czechoslovakia together with Hitler. As the Poles had not given the Danzig corridor to Germany, had went so far, pushing Hitler to start World War II by attacking them. Why was it Poland against whom? Turkey's jailing so many journalists. You say nothing about that. Yeah, I famously never talk about Erdogan being super fucking hardcore anti-freedom of speech yeah that's why i go back to turkey all the time famously that's why um i i don't have a famous story about writing for the huffington post about the turkish coup and how um you know i was threatened personally through a through an intermediary about not writing for uh turkey at all thank you though chatter baram dd turkey's jailing so many journalists you say nothing about that what's next are you gonna be like oh you never talk about the armenian genocide you fucking dumb piece of shit why are my fucking haters so goddamn stupid where they immediately where they immediately go, uh, he's Turkish. He would never fucking talk shit about Turkey. Suck my dick, dumbass. What have you done? What sacrifices have you made in your life? You know what I mean? I get fucking death threats on a on a goddamn basis for the shit that I say. How dare you? I can't even fucking go back to Turkey safely. And you're over here talking this big shit. With no knowledge prior. How dare you? Fucking assholes, man. Address the allegations, bud. Yeah, okay. What's happening here? What, what, are, we, what are we doing? Top of the hour ad breaks? It's not top of the hour. It's middle of the hour. When the war started on 1st September <sighs> 1939. Poland turned out to be uncompromising, and Hitler had nothing to do but start implementing his plans with Poland. By the way, the USSR, I have read some archive documents, behaved very honestly. It asked Poland's permission to transit its troops through the Polish territory to help Czechoslovakia. But the then Polish foreign minister said that if the Soviet plans flew over Poland, they would be downed over the territory of Poland. <coughs> but that doesn't matter. What matters is that the war began. And and Poland fell prey to the policies it had pursued against Czechoslovakia, as under the well-known Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Part of the territory, including western Ukraine, was to be given to Russia. Thus, Russia, which was then named the USSR, regained... There ain't no fucking way he's using Molotov-Ribbentrop as like a... 
as a as a good thing like no shot right he's like no 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 it was actually really good like <laughs> it was really chill when nazi germany gave the ussr ukraine <laughs> in this historical lands after the victory in the Great Patriotic War, as we call World War II, all those territories were ultimately enshrined as belonging to Russia, to the USSR. As for Poland, it received, apparently in compensation, the lands which had originally been German. The eastern parts of Germany, these are now western lands of Poland. Of course, Poland Centrist Jesus Charlie on an alt-right arc when it comes to not genociding Palestinians? What? Dude, come Poland on. regained access to come the on. Baltic We're being serious right now. and Anzik, Take a week off. Which was once again given its Polish name. So this was how this situation developed. In 1922, when the USSR was being related. established, the Bolsheviks started building the USSR Chat validates everything, dude. Come on, Asan, you think Charles is going to talk about Palestinians? No. But I also didn't understand how you could be alt-right in, in defense of Israel. That's what I was, like, trying to comprehend what the fuck that person was saying. Um, Don't validate him, Chad. Come on, that wasn't even good. You, you, you're saluting mid. When you salute mid, you want more mid. Did you buy this interview, lol? No, it's free. And establish the social. The interview is free for all to watch because this is a profoundly important uh, work of journalism, according to Dr. Carlson. Ukraine, he wants everybody which had to never see existed it. before. Right. Stalin insisted that those republics be included in the USSR as autonomous entities. For some inexplicable reason, Lenin, the founder of the Soviet state, insisted that they be entitled to withdraw from the USSR. <coughs> <clears throat> and again, for some unknown reasons, he transferred to that newly established. <laughs> bro, bro, he's like, he's like this <laughs> one shitting on Lenin while also hyping up Stalin, shitting on Lenin for like uh, uh, talking about Ukrainian autonomy while hyping up Stalin while also being a rugged anti uh, communist. He hits like. Like every wrong aspect of the story. He even talked about how Germany gave Ukraine to the USSR. So technically, like how Hitler gave Ukraine to the USSR. So it's technically theirs. It's like, what is he trying to do? He's trying to, he's trying to make a historical argument from literally all of the worst points that you can make. Do you think he's a Nazball? No, man. What are you talking about? He's just fucking, he's a hyper-nationalistic capitalist oligarch. The idea that he is like, even in any way, shape, or form. I talked about this before. The only reason why, the only reason why Vladimir Putin even remotely mentions the USSR in a relatively positive, on relatively positive terms, is because he, like a lot of Russian fucking boomers, does not give a shit about communism. Well, some Russian boomers might give a shit about communism, but he does not give a shit about communism. He is literally a fucking, uh, he, he's a, a capitalist charlatan from the jump. He only cares about Russia having like this mythology of power, like a Russian empire. Okay. That's it. He just wants Russia to be a global superpower. And that is the only reason why he cares about the USSR. He does not care about the USSR. He is the re the reason why he is in power is because of the illegal dissolution of the USSR, which he participated in. Okay, he does not give a fuck about that beyond the actual legacy. There is no there is no like ideological. There's no ideological uh, goals there. There's no agenda for for uh, any kind of like communist restoration project. He just cares about it as like it was a mighty power. It was a mighty power. There was a global superpower. It competed with the United States of America, and that's it. He wants to be a a, a he wants to be a to have a role in a multipolar world. That's it. The Soviet Republic of Ukraine, some of the lands together with people living there. 
even though those lands had never been called Ukraine. And yet, they were made part of that Soviet Republic of Ukraine. Those lands included the Black Sea region, which was received under Catherine the Great, and which had no historical connection with Ukraine whatsoever. Even if we go as far back as 1654, when these lands... Cheating on Lenin and supporting Stalin is the most basic stance. As you said, it should be the opposite, by the way. It should be promoting Stalin, and, or not promoting Stalin, it should be promoting Lenin and, like, criticizing Stalin for, you know... Um, a lot of its mishand a lot of his mishandlings, and yet he does the exact opposite because he is not even remotely pro-socialist. He's not. He's not about. It's not about socialism for him at all. There's no like ideological purpose beyond uh, this restoration of the USSR uh, outside of land ownership. But yeah, uh, as you said, boomer capitalists and nationalists rule the country. Source: M Russian lands returned to Russian Empire. That territory was the size of three to four regions of modern Ukraine, with no Black Sea region. That was completely out of the question. In 1654. Exactly. I'm just, I, you obviously have encyclopedic knowledge of this region, but why didn't you make this case for the first 22 years as president that Ukraine wasn't a real country? The Soviet Union was given a great deal of territory that had never belonged to it, including the Black Sea region. At some point, when Russia received them as an outcome of the Russo-Turkish Wars, they were called New Russia or Novorossiya. But that does not matter. What matters is that Lenin, the founder of the Soviet state, established Ukraine that way. Ah. For decades, the Ukrainian Soviet Republic developed as part of the USSR. And for unknown reasons, again, the Bolsheviks were engaged in Ukrainianization. It was not merely because the Soviet leadership was composed to a great extent of those originating from Ukraine. Rather, it was explained by the general policy of indigenization pursued by the Soviet Union. Same things were done in other Soviet republics. This involved promoting national languages and national cultures, which is not a bad in principle. That is how the Soviet Ukraine was created. After the World War II, Ukraine received, in addition to the lands that had belonged to Poland before the war, part of the lands that had previously belonged to Hungary and Romania. So Romania and Hungary had some of... Is he saying, like, Russification was a good thing, was a good policy? Because it was not a good policy. It was actually objectively a bad policy. Like, it... It didn't work. It failed. He's saying the opposite. I did. I didn't understand. Maybe he was saying the opposite. He says that the Russification didn't happen. Oh, he said the Soviets did the opposite of Russification. Oh. Yeah. No. Totally. Of their lands taken away and given to the Soviet Ukraine, and they still remain part of Ukraine. So, in this sense, we have every reason to affirm that Ukraine is an artificial state that was shaped at Stalin's will. Do you believe Hungary has a right to take its land back from Ukraine, and that other nations? He's complaining that Le Lenin preserved Ukraine. Well, I mean, if you're going to talk about like 2,000 years of like Kiev on Rus or whatever, Kievan Rus or or Ukrainian history and how it's actually Russian from the jump then Russification should not even matter because they are Russian technically, right? Like, how are you going to maintain the position that both, like, there is no autonomous Ukrainian identity, they're all Russian, while simultaneously saying, well, Russification didn't really work, and it was actually uh, all, of the, all of the minority, or not minority, what is it, like, secondary? Altkimnik in Turkish, we have this uh, term uh, in Turkey. Uh, I don't know what it's called. It's like your secondary identity, I guess. When you're a, when you're like a former empire, you have a lot of uh, you have a lot of ethnicities that are now Turkish or that are now Russian. But I guess technically they would have like uh, a a secondary uh, ethnicity as well. Like uh, that would not exist for Ukraine if they were if they were already. Um, they were already Russian, so it wouldn't matter what, uh, it would not matter what Lenin, uh, thought about. Nations have a right to go back to their 1654 <clears throat> borders. I'm not sure whether they should go back to the 1654 borders. But given Stalin's time, so-called Stalin's regime, which as many claim saw numerous violations of human rights and violations of the rights of other states, 
конечно, вполне можно. Wait, now we should not stall it. One may say that they could claim back those lands of theirs while having no right to do that. It is at least understandable. Have you told Viktor Orbán that he can have part of Ukraine? Никогда не говорил. Never. I have never told him, not a single time. <coughs> we have not even had any conversation on that, but I actually know for sure that Hungarians who live there wanted to get back to their historical land. Moreover, I would like to share a very interesting story with you. I digress. It's a person. Bro, this is why I hate talking about uh, Syria. But also, also hate talking about fucking Russia, Ukraine shit. Look, look, look. Putin making anti-Semitic conspiracies about Ukrainians instead of Jews. This guy, he's also a liar. Eastern Ukraine was anarcho-primitivism, part of the hetmanate before the Muscovite settler colonials moved in under Catherine the Great. Actually, Russia is Ukrainian since Rus, uh, uh, since the first Rus was Kievan. Actually, according to this, Russia is Ukrainian since the first Rus was Kievan Rus. And now he's saying, correct, Kiev was the origin of Orthodox civilization in Slavic lands. Moscow was a swamp then. Um, everyone is... It, everyone is going into... Everyone is going into deep lore for no fucking reason, okay? Russia is Russia. Ukraine is Ukraine. That's it. Leave it as is. You don't have to get you don't have to get to like paradox gaming conspiracies and and map making in the chat as you write out paragraphs. <sighs> unless you're Moldovan, unless you're Moldovan Mama Liga, in which case you are allowed because all of Russia belongs to Moldova. Everybody knows this, uh, and except for Crimea, which belongs to Turkey, everybody also knows this. Give Crimea back to the Tatars. So it can be a part of the Turkish Khanate. Once again, the Golden Horde will rise up. As you guys know, I am an Islamist fundamentalist caliphate defender who wants to restore Sharia law globally, specifically in the United States of America, as a fifth column style infiltrator. And um, yeah, and uh, son of oligarchs, private jet lover. Uh, and uh, do, 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 what else? Yeah, secretly a neo Ottomanist as well. Let's continue. One. Somewhere in the early 80s, I went on a road trip in a car from then Leningrad across the Soviet Union through Kiev. Made a stop in Kiev. Why are you pretending that you disagree with your bloody Vladimir? Buddy Vladimir, I used to support you, but you politically have changed. I'll be careful falling down this rabbit hole. The commissioner of the EU has considered levying financial sanctions against Tucker Carlson to the extent he now has to watch the ad break at the top of the hour. Come on, dog. That There's no top of the hour yet. That's bullshit. That doesn't count. It's fucking 346, brother. That's insane. And then went to Western Ukraine. Bro, we are 21 minutes in. This dude is like barely getting to fucking World War II. Is it true that you chartered a private jet to the Burbank airport just to go to Portos? It's true. I went to the town of Birgavoye. In all the names of towns and villages, there were in Russian and in the language I did not understand. In Hungarian. In Russian and in Hungarian. Not in Ukrainian, in Russian, and in Hungarian. I was driving through some kind of village and there were men sitting next to the houses and they were wearing black three-piece suits and black cylinder hats. I asked, are they some kind of entertainers? I was told, no, they were not entertainers, they are Hungarians. I said, what are they doing here? What do you mean? This is their land, they live here. This was during the Soviet time in the 1980s. They preserved the Hungarian language, Hungarian names, and all their national costumes. They are Hungarians and they feel themselves to be Hungarians. And of course, when now there is an infringement. Well, that, that is, and there's a lot of that though. I think many nations are upset about Transylvania as well, as you obviously know. But many nations feel frustrated by the redrawn borders of the wars of the 20th century. Yeah, give it back to fucking Turkey, dog. Yap and... Yapping around for no fucking particular reason, okay? It all belongs to the Ottoman Empire. I've been saying this. I've been saying it. And yet, for some reason, people don't want to respect it, okay? It's bullshit. It belongs to the Ottoman Empire. And that's why I'm going to... I'm going to do it. I'm going to be the guy who does it, okay? I am the... I am Vladimir Yapmir. Yapimir Putin. And wars going back a thousand years, the ones that you mentioned. But 
the fact is that you didn't make this case in public until two years ago, February. And in the case the that you- The Bottomman Empire? <laughs> That's so bad. <laughs> I've never even thought of that before. The Bottomman Empire? More like it? How dare you? How dare you? I'm fucking mad. Oh my God. The Bottomman Empire, unironically, is real. It's like that fucking- Remember that uh, Tanzimat era- thing I used to have on my on my on my desktop that I would show you guys sometimes uh, of like the dudes doing a, a circle of ass fucking from the Ottoman era like that uh, that poster the gay uh, butt fucking circle that is the bottom of empire true he stole that joke from a twitter account named Jihad Al-Haq Damn. The bottom of an empire destroys the Byzantine Empire. I can't show you the actual uh, butt fucking circle, but I used to have that shit directly on my desktop. Like it's uh like it's the fucking horse porn folder of a particular content creator <laughs> next to my taxes. <laughs> Oh, okay. Let's continue. Made, which I read today. Jessica, you you explain at great length that you felt a physical threat from the West in NATO, including potentially a nuclear threat, and that's what got you to move. Is that a fair characterization of what you said? He said, I understand yapping. that my long speech is probably fall outside. Oh my God, he is saying he's yapping. Yapping mash. I'm yapping. Of the genre. Yep. From the West in NATO, Look. including potentially a nuclear threat. And that's what got you okay. to move. Is that a fair? Dude, Tucker Carlson's literally like, dog, stop talking about how you want Ukraine and Ukraine is yours. <laughs> you, you wanted to do it because like uh, NATO, right? Like that's the reason why you wanted to do it because NATO, right? Please, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> he's like, he's like, come on, come on. Just say you're doing it because of NATO. That's what you said before the interview. Why are you saying all this stuff about how Ukraine is Russian? And how it's been a thousand years of being Russian and how you must take it back. Characterization of what you said. Yeah, yeah I'm yapping. I know. <laughs> I understand that my long speeches probably fall outside of the genre of the interview. That is why I asked you at the beginning. Yeah, he's saying yapping much. <laughs> Are we going to have a serious talk or a show? <laughs> you said a serious talk. So bear with me, please. We're coming to the point where the Soviet Ukraine was established. Then, in 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed. And everything that Russia had generously bestowed on Ukraine was dragged away by the latter. I'm coming to a very important point of today's agenda. Thank you. It is very telling that the first 23 minutes of him was literally talking for like a thousand years of history and like he hasn't even gotten the NATO yet and Tucker had to like put him back on the rails and be like you're doing it because of NATO right like you're doing it because of NATO and the only thing he talks about is like oh the dissolution of the USSR it's just like and that's when Ukraine after formed. all the collapse of the Soviet Union was effectively initiated by the Russian leadership yeah I want to I wonder who in the Russian leadership effectively engaged in the collapse of the Soviet Union. I, obviously, he would have nothing to do with that, right? I mean, Vladimir Putin himself, he would... <laughs> it'd be real weird if he was... Uh, what a fake friend. I do not understand what the Russian leadership was guided by at the time. But I suspect there were several reasons to think everything would be fine. First, I think that then Russian leadership believed that the fundamentals of the relationship between Russia and Ukraine were, in fact, a common language. More than 90% of the population there spoke Russian. Family ties. Every third person there had some kind of family or friendship ties. Common culture. Common history. Finally, common faith. Azan sounding like another tongue-bathing establishment mouthpiece, to be honest. Yes, famously, I love uh, being a tongue-bathing establishment mouthpiece, which is precisely why I'm simultaneously called uh, a Hamas terrorist, a dick writer for Iran, a dick writer for China, 
and even a dick writer for Vladimir Putin. Having a nuanced perspective on uh, global conflicts means that I am, you know, that's it. I'm, I'm dick riding everybody and simultaneously none at all. I'm actually dick riding Anderson Cooper and, and, uh, and uh, Jake Tapper. Existence with a single state for centuries and deeply interconnected economies. All of these were so fundamental. All these elements together make our good relationships inevitable. The second point is a very important one. I want you, as an American citizen, and your viewers to hear about this as well. The former Russian leadership assumed that the Soviet Union had ceased to exist, and therefore there were no longer any ideological dividing lines. Russia even agreed voluntarily and proactively to the collapse of the Soviet Union and believed that this would be understood by the so-called civilized West as an invitation for cooperation and associateship. That is what Russia was expecting, both from the United States and the so-called collective West as a whole. There were smart people, including in Germany, Egon Barr, a major politician of the Social Democratic Party, who insisted in his personal conversations with the Soviet leadership on the brink of the collapse of the Soviet Union, that a new security system should be established in Europe. Help should be given to unify Germany, but a new system should be also established to include the United States, Canada, Russia and other Central European countries. Is he talking about NATO now? Is that what it is? He like went back to post-World War II, I think. He talked about the dissolution of the USSR and then like, I can't tell, I can't keep track. Is he, is he now going back to NATO? Because if he had started talking about NATO, if he started talking about NATO from the jump, yeah, he, he started talking about NATO. If he had started talking about NATO from the jump, he would have a better argument, in my opinion. Yes. One, because, like, Americans don't... Uh, sorry, the right is, like, I guess, ostensibly isolationist, even though they would love NATO in principle. I think they just hate it because, like, Trump said he doesn't like it. Because I, I really don't understand why the right doesn't like NATO in general, because, like, it's everything that they love, just, like, destroying Libya. You know what I mean? I don't really know why NATO is European, which is gay. Yeah. I, I don't think they understand what NATO is. That's why they kind of hate it or they hate on it because of taxes. Yeah. It's so dumb. They just don't, they don't really get it. Huh. Anyway, but NATO needs not to expand. That's what he said. If NATO expands, everything would be just the same as during the Cold War, only closer to Russia's borders. That's all. He was a wise old man, but no one listened to him. In fact, he got angry once. If he's... I guess this is why... This is why he had to describe, like, how Ukraine is Russia, technically. Because if your only security concerns are NATO, then you can deal with that without invading Ukraine. But if, you're, if your security concerns come from NATO, and on top of that, Ukraine is technically a Russian, then he can justify uh, why he's just taking back his land and protecting his own people that are being oppressed by, uh, you know, the scary... Ukrainian administration that's like uh, Western dogs or something. Said, you don't listen to me. I'm never setting my foot in Moscow once again. Everything happened just as he had said. Yeah, well, it, of course, it did come true. And, I, and you've mentioned this many times. I think it's a fair point. And many in America thought yeah. that relations between <clears throat> Russia and the United States would be fine with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, that the opposite happened. But you've never explained why you think that happened, except to say that the West fears a strong Russia. But we have a strong China the West does not seem very afraid of. Uh <laughs> what? <laughs> Wait. <laughs> the fuck do you mean? Tugger, what the hell are you saying, dude? The West does not fear a strong China? Brody, where is it? There's a there's like one article about like how uh US Army Special Force on long term basis uh being placed uh uh, Green Berets being stationed in the Republic of China's uh, 101st Amphibious Reconnaissance Battalion on a long-term basis on Kinmen and Matsu. There's literally fucking new defense positions opening up surrounding China. The notion that, like, America isn't trying to fucking put, a same, put the same stranglehold on China, 
that it did on the USSR and then uh, subsequently Russia is is crazy. I mean, he's not completely wrong militarily. There is more fear against Russia than China since China is relatively in inactive militarily. I guess there's that. Uh, what about Russia, do you think, convinced policymakers they had to take it down? The West is afraid of strong China more than it fears a strong Russia. Because Russia has 150 million people and China has 1.5 billion population, and its economy is growing by leaps and bounds, or 5% a year, it used to be even more. But that's enough for China. As Bismarck once put it, potentials are the most important. China's potential is enormous. It is the biggest economy in the world today in terms of purchasing power parity and the size of the economy. It has already over taking the United States quite a long time ago, and it is growing at a rapid clip. Let's not talk about who is afraid of whom, let's not reason in such terms. And let's get into the fact that after 1991, when Russia expected that it would be welcomed into the brotherly family of civilized nations, nothing like this happened. You tricked us. I don't mean you personally when I say you. Of course, I'm talking about the United States. The promise was that NATO would not expand eastward. But it happened five times. There were five waves of expansion. We tolerated all that. We were trying to persuade them. We were saying, please don't. We are as bourgeois now as you are. We are a market economy and there is no communist party. <laughs> I mean, this part is true. He's not wrong. He, he ain't wrong about that. I mean, worst guy to say that, but he's, he's right. He's like, we're capitalists. We love capitalism. I love yapping just like you do. I love, I hear, suka bliat, I hear Hassan Hassanabi serving top of the hour at break. He says he's socialist, yet he served at break at top of the hour. What's that about? Your socialists are also just as bourgeois as we are. We love capitalism. If you no longer want to see those ads, use Amazon Prime. Connect to your Twitch Prime. Or by getting gifted a sub, if you are lucky. Dude, by the way, that accent is going to be coming back in a little bit when I'm playing, when I'm defending the borders of Ojaristan. A not fictional nation in a game I call Comrade Border Patrol. CBP. Uh, it is the three minute ad break now. Let's negotiate. Moreover, I have also said this publicly before. There was a moment when a certain rift started growing between us. Before that, Yeltsin came to the United States. Remember, he spoke in Congress and said the good words. God bless America. Everything he said were signals. Let us in. Remember the developments in Yugoslavia before the Yeltsin was lavished with praise? As soon as the developments in Yugoslavia started, he raised his voice in support of Serbs, and we couldn't but raise our voices for Serbs in their defense. I understand that there were complex processes on the way there. I do. But Russia could not help raising its voice in support of Serbs because Serbs. Just gump! Thank you for the 20 gifted subs! Serbs are also a special and close to this nation, be. with orthodox culture and so on. It's a nation that has suffered so much for generations. Well, regardless, what is important is that Yeltsin expressed his support. What did the United States do? In violation of international law and the UN Charter, it started bombing Belgrade. It was the United States that led the genie out of the bottle. Moreover, when Russia protested and expressed its resentment, what was said? The UN Charter and international law have become obsolete. Now everyone invokes international law, but at that time they started saying that everything was outdated. Everything had to be changed. Indeed, some things need to be changed, as the balance of power has changed. It's true. But not in this manner. Yeltsin was immediately dragged through the mud, accused of alcoholism, of understanding nothing, of knowing nothing. He understood everything, I assure you. Well, I became president in 2000. I thought, okay, the Yugoslav issue is over, but we should try to restore relations. Let's reopen the door that Russia had tried to go through. And moreover, I said it publicly, I can reiterate. At a meeting here in the Kremlin with the outgoing president Bill Clinton, right here in the next room, I said to him, I asked him, Bill, do you think if Russia asked to join NATO, do you think it would happen? Suddenly he said, you know, it's interesting. I think so. But in the interesting. Yeah. Weird. Weird to... Uh, weird to be this, like, uh, supposedly uh, pro-socialist guy, red scare shit, while he's, like, very openly talking about his um, relationship with Bill Clinton evening when we met for dinner he said you know i've talked to my team no no 
It's not possible now. You can ask him. I think he will watch our interview. He'll confirm it. I wouldn't have said anything like that if it hadn't happened. Okay. Were well, you sincere? It's impossible now. Would you have joined NATO? Look, I asked the question, is it possible or not? And the answer I got was no. If I was insincere in my desire to find out what the leadership position was... But if he had said yes, would you have joined NATO? If he had said yes, the process of reproachment would have commenced, and eventually it might have happened, if we had seen some sincere wish on the other side of our partners. But it didn't happen. Well, no means no. Okay, fine. Why do you think that is? Just to get to motive, I know you're clearly bitter about it, um, I understand. But why do you think the West rebuffed you then? Why the hostility? Why did the end of the Cold War not fix the relationship? What motivates this from your point of view? You said I was bitter about the answer. No, it's not bitterness. It's just a statement of fact. We're not bride and groom, bitterness, resentment. It's not about those kind of matters in such circumstances. We just realized we weren't welcome there, that's all. Okay, fine. But let's build relations in another manner. Let's work for common ground elsewhere. Why we received such a negative response, you should ask your leaders. I can only guess why. Too big a country with its own opinion and so on. And the United States, I've seen how issues are being resolved in NATO. I will give you another example now concerning Ukraine. The US leadership exerts pressure and all NATO members obediently vote, even if they do not like something. Now, I'll tell you what happened in this regard with Ukraine in 2008, although it's being discussed. I'm not going to open a secret to you, say anything new. Nevertheless, after that we tried to build relations in different ways. For example, the events in the Middle East, in Iraq. We were building relations with the United States in a very soft, prudent, cautious manner. I repeatedly raised the issue that the United States should not support separatism or terrorism in the North Caucasus. But they continued to do it anyway. And political support, information support, financial support, even military support came from the United States and its satellites for terrorist groups in the Caucasus. I once raised this issue with my colleague, also the President of the United States. He says, it's impossible, do you have proof? I said yes. I was prepared for this conversation and I gave him that proof. He looked at it and you know what he said? I apologize, but that's what happened. I'll quote. He says, well, I'm gonna kick their ass. We waited and waited for some response. There was no reply. I said to the FSB director, write to the CIA, what is the result of the conversation with the president? He wrote once, twice, and then we got a reply. We have the answer in the archive. The CIA replied, we have been working with the opposition in Russia. We believe that this is the right thing to do, and we will keep on doing it. Just ridiculous. Well, okay. We realized that it was out of the question. Forces in opposition to you. So you're saying the CIA is trying to overthrow your government? Of course they meant in that particular case the separatists, the terrorists who fought with us. Dude. There you go. You want this? You think this is readable? Okay. In the Caucasus. That's who they call the opposition. This is the second point. The third moment is a very important one. Is the moment when the US missile defense system was created. The beginning. We persuaded for a long time not to do it in the United States. Moreover, after was invited by Bush Jr.'s father, Bush Sr., to visit his place on the ocean, I had a very serious conversation with President Bush and his team. I proposed that the United States, Russia and Europe jointly create a missile defense system that, we believe, if created unilaterally, threatens our security, despite the fact that the United States officially said that it was being created against missile threats from Iran. That was the justification for the deployment of the missile defense system. I suggested working together, Russia, the United States and Europe. They said it was very interesting. They asked me, are you serious? I said, absolutely. May I ask what year was this? I don't remember. It is easy to find out on the internet when I was in the USA at the invitation of a Bush senior. 
It is even easier to learn from someone I'm going to tell you about. I was told it was very interesting. I said, just imagine if we could tackle such a global strategic security challenge together. The world will change. We'll probably have disputes, probably economic and even political ones, but we could drastically change the situation in the world. He says yes, and asks, are you serious? I said, of course. We need to think about it, I'm told. I said, go ahead, please. Then Secretary of Defense Gates, former director. I feel like he wants to be Israel so bad. Like, think about it. Like, if I'm to take everything he's saying at face value, okay, he kind of wants to be Israel. He's like... I want to fucking, I want to be America's ally so I can do whatever the fuck I want. And I also want to take like, I want to take Ukraine. I want to expand into Ukraine. Ukraine is mine. I have laid historic claim to Ukraine. Okay. I'm literally your guy. Let me also participate in, in like this allegiance. So I can just be, you know, I can be your role dog. Do you think you want to be like Turkey? No. Ain't nobody want to be like Turkey. of CIA and Secretary of State Rice came in here, in this cabinet, right here at this table. They sat on this table. Me, the foreign minister, the Russian defense minister on that side. They said to me, yes, we have thought about it. We agree. I said, thank God, great. But with some exceptions. So twice you've described US presidents making decisions and then being undercut by their agency heads. Why you hate your own kind? Wait, what? My own kind? Brother, talking about Turks like they're fucking a different species. Holy shit, dude. <laughs> Least racist American guy. So it sounds like you're describing a system that's not run by the people who are elected in your telling. Yeah. That's right, that's right. In the end, they just told us to get lost. I'm not going to tell you the details because I think it's incorrect. After all, it was confidential conversation. But our proposal was declined, that's a fact. It was right then when I said, look, but then we will be forced to take countermeasures. He's literally like, dog, why don't you want us to be like your, you know, Russian Israel? We also blow up Muslim populations like all the time. Okay, we love blowing up Muslim populations like come on dog. Let me be your fucking Israel homie What the fuck? We will create such strike systems that will certainly overcome missile defense systems the answer was we are not doing this against you and you do what you want Assuming that it is not against us not against the United States why does his simping America make uh, America look kind of weirdly Russophobic? I don't know what you mean States. by that. I said, okay, very well. <clears throat> That's the way it went. And we created hypersonic systems with intercontinental range, and we continue to develop them. We are now ahead of everyone. The United. By the way, the interview uh, is now, for me at least, becoming clear. The purpose of this interview is to be as sympathetic to like American Republicans as possible. That's why I said the Israel thing. Like, Republicans love Israel. And he's making Israel-ass arguments without the obvious, like, religious association that is also profoundly important for uh, the evangelical Christianity side of things. And I, I feel like he's just trying to be like, look, I I'm a small bean. I'm a small bean conservative nationalist. Like, you're a small bean conservative nationalist. Why don't we just, like, get it together? Because I was trying to figure out, like, what... Obviously, he wants to do propaganda. But his line of attack... Like, what... What his line of attack... Like, what his, uh, his goals are here was interesting to me. And it seems like he's just trying to come across as, like, rational, reasonable. Don't really even talk about, like, the atrocities in Ukraine. Don't even fucking talk about what the Ukrainians have done, right? Because, like, if he was making an argument internally, domestically, 
If he was making a similar argument to Tucker Carlson about the same argument that he makes domestically, he'd be talking about uh, he'd be talking about Ukraine and like how Ukrainians are so violent and so bad and LPR and DPR has a, a bunch of Russians that they wouldn't allow to separate. But instead he's like, I love America. I, I love linking up and building. Um, and America doesn't want me to link up and build. It's states and the other countries in terms of the development of hypersonic strike systems. And we are improving them every day. But it wasn't us. We proposed to go the other way, and we were pushed back. Now, about NATO's expansion to the east. Well, we were promised no NATO to the east, not an inch to the east, as we were told. And then what? They said, well, it's not enshrined on paper, so we'll expand. So there were five waves of expansion. The Baltic states, the whole of Eastern Europe, and so on. This is why people say I'm a Putin dick rider, by the way. Because I... Because... There are parts of what he's talking about that make total fucking sense and nothing, nothing about like Ukraine being Russian or whatever, but as far as like NATO expansion goes and that being seen as a genuine threat for Russia. Yeah, of course, of course, that makes total sense. And now I come to the, especially post USSR dissolution when fucking Russia literally is in his own words, a capitalist lapdog, like run by oligarchs that sold the fucking country piecemeal to Western banks. So he's like, why the fuck can't we be friends? Is what he's saying. Why are you still propping up NATO? Let me join NATO. Now, I don't know if he's like being serious about joining NATO or not, but he's basically saying like, you're using NATO against me, but I'm your guy, which he was. The main thing. They have come to the Ukraine, ultimately. In 2008, at the summit in Bucharest, they declared that the doors for Ukraine and Georgia to join NATO were open. Now about how decisions are made there. Germany, France seem to be against it, as well as some other European countries. <coughs> but then, as it turned out later, President Bush, and he's such a tough guy, a tough politician, as I was told later, he exerted pressure on us and we had to agree. It's ridiculous, it's like kindergarten. Where are the guarantees? What kindergarten is this? What kind of people are these? Who are they? You see, they were pressed, they agreed. And then they say, Ukraine won't be in the NATO, you know? I say, I don't know. I know you agreed in 2008. Why won't you agree in the future? Well, they pressed us then. I say, why won't they press you tomorrow? And you'll agree again. Well, it's not. One thing that I do find very funny is that um like he's like oh well why don't you put it in writing this is a thing that like americans also say about russia where they're like well russia always reneges on like um prior deals why could we trust them and it's like bro you're america like look at what trump did with the iran denuclearization agreement and that's one of many different instances we literally have a policy in china called strategic ambiguity which is just a fancy word for lying it's a fancy substitute for just lying and saying no, 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 you don't understand. It's one China, but also we do uh, uh, believe that, uh, you know, we're going to keep arming and utilizing Taiwan as like a military base, a forward operating base directly into China. So American history, American foreign policy is filled with uh, America writing up treaties or having handshake agreements that they do not follow through on. And the same, of course, goes for Russia as well. But it is, it is ridiculous that, um, it is ridiculous that, that we, we have this like one-sided approach in this, uh, in this situation where we're like, oh, it's only the Russians that violate agreements when, uh, NATO expansion is correct. Like it did happen time and time again. And, uh, it happened after the dissolution of the USSR as well. My opinion on it is that it happened because it is a moneymaker. It's a moneymaker. And Russia's existence, uh, Russia's uh, actions, Russia's existence is a way to perfectly continue justifying NATO and continue expanding NATO. That's it. Nonsensical. Who's there to talk to? I just don't understand. We're ready to talk. But with whom? Where are the guarantees? None. So they started to develop the territory of Ukraine. Whatever is there, I have told you the background, how this territory developed, what kind of relations they were with Russia. 
Every second or third person there has always had some ties with Russia. And during the elections in already independent, sovereign Ukraine, which gained its independence as a result of the Declaration of Independence. And by the way, it says that Ukraine is a neutral state, and in 2008, suddenly the doors or gates to NATO were open to it. Oh, come on. This is not how we agreed. Now, all the presidents that have come to power in Ukraine, they relied on electorate with a good attitude to Russia in one way or the other. This is the southeast of Ukraine. This is a large number of people. And it was very difficult to dissuade this electorate, which had a positive attitude towards Russia. Viktor Yanukovych came to power and how? The first time he won after President Kuchma, they organized the third round, which is not provided for in the constitution of Ukraine. This is a coup d'etat. Just imagine someone in the United States. All those sovereign countries shouldn't have the right to join NATO, Hassan, Real, Politik, Piker. Oh, God, dude. Come on, brother. Jesus Christ. Christ, it is literally a fucking protection racket. Stop fucking playing with me. Oh my God. I already ran the top of the eye break if you're trying to fucking do this. Yeah, it's always a voluntary association. Yes, yes, countries want weapons. Okay, they like having guns. America sells them. Okay, America gives them to you when you join NATO. Great. It's still bad. It's also additionally funny because it's contentious with uh, the supposed socialists that claim to be socialist and then they dick ride NATO. It makes no fucking sense. It is, an, it is an institution designed to eviscerate socialism and communism. It was directly created. It was directly created to reinforce American hegemony and, and uh, set up, uh, set up a, a protection racket, sometimes for valid reasons, but other times specifically to create a uh, self-reinforcing cycle of, of steady flow of weapons and, and um, asses changing hands in that process from Europe back to America and vice versa. Literally hired actual Nazis and actual fascists in every fucking country that it existed in and it operated in, destabilized quietly all of the European nations that it operated in from Italy to Germany. Well, Germany was a little bit more willing, West Germany specifically, um, and everywhere else. Okay. And it's like hidden under the guise of, see, this is, this is the problem. Would you consider NATO expansion as colonial conquest? It's not actual straight up colonialism because it's a, a voluntary military alliance that countries are joining. Okay. You say that. And it's, it's the same as saying like, well, technically, why is the World Bank and IMF actual imperialism, a continuation of imperialism? How could you say that? Those are just financial contracts. Like, what? I don't really understand it. It's still the same exact fucking way. They, these, they, they operate in the exact same way. If you want to think about it, if you want to understand it, just imagine if it wasn't America doing it, but like China doing it. And then you can maybe uh, recognize that it's, you know, it's not being done with the, with the most honest intentions. Oh, yeah, just imagine. Imagine it's like a, it's a, a Chinese uh, deal. States wouldn't like the outcome. In 2014? Before that. No, this was before that, after President Kuchma, Viktor Yanukovych, won the elections. However, his opponents did not recognize that victory. The U.S. supported the opposition, and the third round was scheduled. What is this? This is a coup. The U.S. supported it, and the winner of the third round came to power. Imagine if in the U.S. something was not to someone's liking, and the third round of election, which the U.S. Constitution does not provide for, was organized. Nonetheless, it was done in Ukraine. Okay, Viktor Yushchenko, who was considered... I don't support NATO, it's just real politic. Countries join NATO because it protects them against Putin. Yeah. No, the real politic is not that countries join NATO because it protects them against Putin. Well, now they do, and now they can. 
the real politique of it is the same reason why countries have uh, signed on to the Abraham Accords. They want American weapons. That's it. And they also don't want to be an enemy of the United States of America. Because if you're an enemy of the United States of America, you don't get away with shit that Turkey does. That's kind of what he was basically describing when he's saying like, I, you know, I want to, I want to deal with you guys. I want to deal positively. We're bourgeois as well. Look, look at us. We're a bourgeois democracy. We liberalized our markets. That's what it is. Look at Turkey. You know what I mean? The pro-Western politician came to power. Fine, we have built relations with him as well. He came to Moscow with visits. We visited Kiev. I visited Sioux. We met in an informal setting. If he is pro-Western, so be it. It's fine. Let people do their job. The situation should have developed inside independent Ukraine itself. As a result of Kuchma's leadership, things got worse and Viktor Yanukovych came to power after all. <laughs> Maybe he wasn't the best president and politician. I don't know. I don't want to give assessments. You are not beating the Russia allegations? However, the issue of the association with the EU came up. We have always been lenient to this. Suit yourself. But when we read through the Treaty of Association, it turned out to be a problem for us, since we had a free trade zone and open customs borders with Ukraine, which under this association had to open its borders for Europe, which could have led to flooding of our market. We said, no, this is not going to work. We shall close our borders with Ukraine then. The customs borders, that is. Yanukovych started to calculate how much Ukraine was going to gain, how much to lose, and said to his European partners, I need more time to think before signing. The moment he said that, the opposition began to take destructive steps which were supported by the West. It all came down to Maidan and a coup in Ukraine. So he did more trade with Russia than with the EU? Ukraine did? Of course. It's not even the matter of trade volume, although for the most part it is. Look at Turkey. What? Turkey has its whole eastern border being destabilized by NATO? Nobody's taking anything easy on Turkey for being in NATO? What do you mean? Turkey gets to fucking literally overtake the northern Syrian corridor without a single fucking peep from Western media. Why is that the case? Because Injilik is a fucking nuclear armed, uh, is an is a American base with nuclear arms on it. The fuck do you mean? Also, partially the reason why Erdogan is to talk a big game about how like, oh, Israel this, Israel that, Satan Yahoo, one minute, I will fuck you in the ass, all this shit. While simultaneously, there's literal fucking... Turkey's doing that to Syria despite that, despite NATO? Yeah, you're fucking ridiculous if you think that Turkey's position as a NATO nation doesn't play a role in America not coming down hard on Turkey. Isn't it odd that only, only NATO-aligned nations are able to engage in such actions? The fuck do you mean? As long as you are an ally to the United States of America, you get away with whatever the fuck you want. You have childlike politics. If you personally do not recognize that, your politics are silly if you don't recognize it. Also, what NATO did in Turkey, ironically identical to what it did in, you know, also aligning, propping up ultra-nationalist fascists like the fucking Grey Wolves against the socialists, the trade unionists, and the communists in Turkey, okay? So that's another, uh, that's another, that's another mark for uh, my anti-NATO uh, anti perspective, okay? Like these ultra-nationalist fascists that have also been prominent and propped up the Erdogan regime with their coalition is there's a direct thorough line there's a direct through line there between NATO involvement in Turkey obviously nuclear bases being set up missiles pointing directly on the USSR soil the Cuban missile crisis all the way to Recep Tayyip Erdogan being able to do whatever the fuck he wants in the region because he's a part of NATO It's not an accident after the, the 
700th time that America aligns with fascists in their endless endeavor to eradicate socialism. It is the matter of cooperation size, which the entire Ukrainian economy was based on. The cooperation size between the enterprises were very close since the times of the Soviet Union. One enterprise there used to produce components to be assembled both in Russia and Ukraine, and vice versa. They used to be very close ties. A coup d'etat was committed, although I shall not delve into details now, as I find doing it inappropriate, the US told us. Calm Yanukovych down, and we will calm the opposition. Let the situation unfold in the scenario of a political settlement. We said, all right, agreed, let's do it this way. As the Americans requested, Yanukovych did use neither the armed forces nor the police, yet the armed opposition committed a coup in Kiev. What is that supposed to mean? Who do you think you are? I wanted to ask the then US leadership. With the backing of whom? With the backing of CIA, of course. The organization you wanted to join back in the day, as I understand. We should thank God they didn't let you... Oh! Yo! He's right! Tucker Carlson's dad is CIA, by the way. Voice of America. God damn! Fucking God is ass. Tucker Carlson's dad is uh is is literally CIA. Tucker Carlson wanted to join the CIA. That's crazy that Vladimir Putin just fucking dropped that in the with the backing of CIA, of course. The organization you wanted to join back in the day, as I understand. We should thank God they didn't let you in. Although it is a serious organization. I understand. My That's so funny. Anakovich's Burkid Force is literally shot and killed over 100 people in my Former vis a vis in the sense that I served in the first main directorate, Soviet Union's intelligence service. They have always been our opponents. A job is a job. Technically, they did everything right. They achieved their goal of changing the government. However, from a political standpoint, it was a colossal mistake. Surely, it was political leadership's miscalculation. They should have seen what it would evolve into. So, in 2008, the doors of NATO were open for Ukraine. In 2014, there was a coup, they started persecuting those who did not accept the coup, and it was indeed a coup. They created the threat to Crimea, which we had to take under our protection. Dude, Russia saying they have to come in and involve themselves in Ukraine because, like, they're being undemocratic to the Russian, like, to the ethnic Russians in the eastern territories is so funny because it's literally America shit, okay? It is identical to America shit. It's like America being like, yeah, we're going to Afghanistan because they're not treating gay people right. <laughs> it's what Israel does about uh, their defense of, of uh, their ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. Straight up. And no, for those who are, for those of you who are dense as fuck, I know there's a lot of people who are horny to like cut anything and everything I say here that even comes across as like even remotely pro-Putin as like uh, a, a yet another instance where I'm dick riding Putin or some shit. I'm not saying that that's good, okay? I'm saying that that's bad. I'm using America shit in a way uh, in a way that is bad, okay? Objectively bad. It's kind of funny saying it's America shit when Russia has been doing this before white people walked in NA. Yes, but I say it's America shit because obviously in the way that we understand contemporary politics, it's America that does that, okay? It is a continuation of obviously the oldest colonial trick in the book, which is we are civilizing the barbarians, right? The indigenous forces that we must wipe out and enslave deserve or are worthy of the civilizing force of colonial, uh, uh, you know, the, the supreme colonial cultures. That's the, the same thing. When I say America shit, I'm just talking about the same exact continuation of that policy, of that principle. Like Tibet? Yes. Yes, dude. Um, yes, you're right. Tibetan, uh, like actual Tibetan slaves uh, joining, uh, joining the revolutionary forces is identical to uh, the, the colonial violence and the enslavement of an indigenous population. Thank you.
No, there are differences between a feudal population and the subjects of said feudal population joining forces, joining the revolutionary forces to abolish the feudal slave-like conditions that they existed under versus a barbarian, uh, a barbaric indigenous population, which by the way, yes, they had practices that were violent, of course, in, in uh, tribes and whatnot, getting uh, brutalized in infinitely worse ways by an outside alien superpower. Apparently Moscow was on fire right now during the release of this interview. Wait, what? Multiple fires being reported in Moscow? Hashtag Tucker Putin? I don't believe that. No, nah, this seems like fucking fake news to me. It's 31. It's got 31 likes. That seems fucking bullshit. They launched the war in Donbass in 2014 with the use. Brother, check your mouth. Not all indig indigenous nations were openly violent. No, man. I, that's why I said, yes, certainly there were violent practices in indigenous populations, but that does not mean that it was justifiable to enslave all of them. You are so silly. I did not say what you think I said. Just really... Take a breather before you get mad. Using aircraft and artillery against civilians. Huh. This is when it all started. There is a video of aircraft attacking Donetsk from above. They launched a large-scale military operation, then another one. When they failed, they started to prepare the next one. All this against the background of military development of this territory and opening of NATO's doors. How could we not express concern over what was happening? From our side, this would have been a culpable negligence. That's what it would have been. Why are so many folks on our dick today? Because I'm watching a, a massive interview with uh, Vladimir Putin and Tucker Carlson. And there's going to be a lot of like uh, Ukraine watchers who are very hawkish towards me that used to be former fans who then got like, who uh, I was probably very mean to, if I'm being real leading up to uh, Russia invading Ukraine in a very snarky way, to which I have apologized since then for getting it wrong and even being snarky uh, about getting it wrong, but they haven't given up. It's been two years and they still have not let go. Um, they will not let go forever, I'm pretty sure. So they, they mostly just come in here to, to look for any and every opportunity that uh, they can claim that I'm actually very much pro-Putin to keep that love uh, affair alive in their own circles. Whereas if they genuinely listened to what I had to say, they would understand that I'm anti-NATO for sure. I've never, uh, you know, I've never missed words on that, but certainly even more anti-Putin. The Moscow fires are real? Oh shit, that's crazy. Of course, that, that big, like, there were, there was a, there was a, a big split during the Sam Harris, Jenk Uyghur three hour debate many, many years prior amongst the progressive left, where there were people who were like, no, I'm actually Islamophobic and it's perfectly valid to be Islamophobic. Okay, versus the Jenk Uger coalition of the left at the time, the online left, the online progressive movement that was like, no, I think we should be like more understanding of Muslim populations and not engage in like such severe acts of violence and destabilization upon them. Um, I think that in my community, a similar split happened in the invasion, in the Russian invasion of, uh, in the Russian invasion of Ukraine where a lot of people that were like, oh no, you're fucking totally wrong. And you were an asshole to me. Uh, they, a, a lot of those people basically became like complete aligned with the United States of America, no matter what they do with some deviations every now and then, like, but reluctantly pro American imperialism. Not you just leftist media in general. I'm so tired of being called a tangy. Yeah. 
To my shame, I was in the Harris camp back then. I know better now. Yeah. Ironic because a lot of people who used to be in the Harris camp then then turned around from the Sam Harris Islamophobia camp uh, that were anti-Trump for a very long time, looked at what was going on in Ukraine and like kind of took on another more reactionary position that like America reluctantly has to keep being violent and and engage in acts of imperialism. Um, you know, that kind of thing. And now that. Uh, yeah, now they call me a terrorist for interviewing a Yemeni kid who they fucking uh, obviously call a terrorist, an anti-Semite, a slaver, and numerous other things. Still to this day. <laughs> In spite of the fact that he is none of those things at all. They were very mad that I uh, humanized um, a person from Yemen when America was blowing up positions inside of Yemen. Oh, and a son of an oligarch as well, which is really funny. But yeah, to answer your question in the most uh, long-winded, convoluted way possible, I think those are the reasons. But once again, I have to ask for charitability as always. Be charitable. Don't be motivated by what you have watched as far as like videos that other content creators have made of me. Um, as long as you are willing to learn my position, I will always tell you I'm honest to a fault in that regard. I don't hide it. I will tell you always, which is why so many people simultaneously hold the position that like I'm doing this to be popular while also... Uh, they recognize that it is a deeply unpopular position to hold. Yeah, all the drama lefty said you're pro-terrorist. I know. It's just that the U.S. political leadership pushed us to the line we could not cross, because doing so could have ruined Russia itself. Besides, we could not leave our brothers in faith, in fact, a part of Russian people, in the face of this war machine. What was the, so that was eight years before the current conflict started. So what was the trigger for you? What was the moment where you decided you had to do this? We'll, we'll get to Biden talking in the White House in like 15 minutes, okay? Once again, though, to all my haters that are in here, I love you, okay? I do. And I hope that one day you will understand my position. Why are you triggered? Wait, what? I'm not triggered. Why am I triggered? Initially, it was the coup in Ukraine that provoked the conflict. By the way, back then, the representatives of three European countries, Germany, Poland, and France, arrived. Biden's trying to, Biden's trying to steal uh, Pootie Poo's thunder. They were the guarantors of the signed agreement between the government of Yanukovych and the opposition. They signed it as guarantors. Despite that, the opposition committed a coup and all these countries pretended that they didn't remember that they were guarantors of the peaceful settlement. They just threw it in the stove right away and nobody recalls that. <laughs> Ukraine is also a neo-imperialist counter-revolutionary project propped up specifically to prevent socialism from spreading in Eastern Europe. Russia is literally acting in self-defense. Putin represents the last bastion for the dictatorship of the proletariat. It's so funny. Because one, he literally started this interview and even his like invasion of Ukraine by shitting on Lenin. Okay. And even in this interview, like 20 minutes in, he was like, we're bourgeois. We're a bourgeois democracy. We liberalized our markets. Why are you guys not letting us kill Muslims? Just like you, we want to kill Muslims alongside you. Please give us money to kill Muslims instead of trying to kill us with this NATO shit. Okay. So the idea that like, dude, it's so sick. Yeah. Vladimir Putin, the, the eminent upholder of proletarian dictatorship. The only thing he's upholding is the dictatorship part of that, but certainly not at the behest of the proletarian and, uh, and more so for what he is, which is an oligarch and uh, definitely firmly within, uh, within, you know, in the context of being a capitalist uh, 
It's a joke? Oh, okay. I don't know if the US know anything about the agreement between the opposition and the authorities. And it's three guarantors who, instead of bringing this whole situation back in the political field, supported the coup. Although it was meaningless, believe me. Because President Yanukovych agreed to all conditions. He was ready to hold an early election, which he had no chance of winning, frankly speaking. Everyone knew that. Then why the coup? Why the victims? Why threatening Crimea? Why launching an operation in Donbas? This I do not understand. That is exactly what the miscalculation is. CIA did its job to complete the coup. I think one of the deputy secretaries of state said that it cost a large sum of money, almost 5 billion. But the political mistake was colossal. Why would they have to do that? All this could have been done legally, without victims, without military action, without losing Crimea. That's pretty funny. He's like, dude, come on, dog. I can't believe the CIA did military actions in Ukraine. Yeah, all of this could have been done without any deaths is like a really funny thing to say when, you know, you've been pummeling. You've been pummeling Ukraine. Just destroying Eastern Ukraine. Still, all this shit is USA's fault? No, USA involvement only goes... Um... USA involvement only goes as far as, like, the moment that Russia invaded Ukraine. It is entirely, and I've said this time and time again, it is entirely Russia's fault after that moment. America can continue its uh, interest in, in pilfering Ukraine, okay, in its weakest moment. Keep whispering sweet nothings to the Ukrainians that they are going to permanently support them when... uh they don't have that same interest, especially when, you know, another ally, another ally is, is uh, uh, all of a sudden more important uh, because they're doing um, some, some genocide, a quick genocide on the side. Okay. But overall, there are a lot of viewers in here who 100% think Putin is right to attack because NATO US triggered it. Yeah, I don't think that. And I have said this since day one, and I make fun of those people all the time. Um, but you might not know that because maybe you're not in here all the time. I routinely joke about people who push Z or the MAGA communists. <sighs> I know there's a Biden speech chat. I know we're waiting on it. It's not live yet. What would you have Putin do other than invade NATO after repeatedly cross Russian red lines? Not saying he's right. He already annexed Crimea. What are you talking about? It's Jover. He annexed Crimea. There is no world in which he actually has to fucking invade Ukraine. It's ridiculous. He knows that uh, the, the Western forces are never going to expand and allow uh, Ukraine into NATO. He knows that. He already took parts of Ukraine especially parts that are mostly occupied with, uh, with Russian people in general because of a prior Russification and relocation of the, the indigenous Tatar population. Okay. There's literally a Russian base there already. How would you stop him? So you'd have him annex LPR and DPR without invading? How? No. No, you don't annex LPR and DPR at all. At all. Like, people say that Vladimir Putin invaded eastern Ukraine because of 20,000 mostly ethnic Russians died in LPR and DPR. No, that's just a fucking Putin justification for it. That's ridiculous. How many fucking ru ethnic Russians have died since then? What are you talking about? Yeah, dude, that was a really good that was a really good tactical moment for Vladimir Putin. He really he really saved a lot of ethnic Russian lives in in eastern Ukraine when he invaded Ukraine. Come on, dude. I think that I think personally that he greatly miscalculated maybe due to how easy it was to dominate uh, Ukraine in, you know, in 2014 when its military prowess was and its military uh, equipment was significantly, I mean, it was nothing in comparison to what it is now. 
and they were wrong. They did not, they were not able to maintain air superiority. They bombed the shit out of even Western positions and they failed. They failed. He thought that he could do it. He thought he could annex it, which I literally think was impossible regardless. Okay. It was a massive misstep. It was a massive failure. There's a reason why European countries are still very much purchasing Russian gas, for example, through secondary markets. You could have just kept doing, you could have just kept your fucking head down and kept uh, dealing with your European trade partners and just didn't have to engage in like weird hyper nationalistic shit. Um, for the purpose of, I guess, like, I don't know, galvanizing patriotic support, not getting outflanked by even more nationalist forces within your country, or maybe because you personally genuinely believe in the fucking uh, hyper-nationalist uh, mentality that, like, Ukraine belongs to Russia. It, that, that much is, that much seemingly is true. I mean, he's basically saying it. <sighs> it shows that <coughs> war against more evenly matched countries firepower not manpower ends up in a standstill we're too used to, for big countries attacking smaller and weaker ones no because big no 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 you don't understand if ukraine <clears throat> was not armed in any way by the UN, or of a, not UN, sorry, by NATO, by America, by Western forces, Vladimir Putin would still not be able to permanently annex the country. This has been my position since day one. That is the, oftentimes people point to that one uh, tweet about me saying like, Vladimir Putin is uh, uh, bad, not mad. He would never invade Ukraine. That would be a fucking major foolish, uh, major foolish decision. Remember, I never deleted that tweet on purpose because I never deleted that tweet because the part that people literally forget is why I said that, which is because it would be impossible for Vladimir Putin to engage in a counterinsurgency. It would destroy, it would destroy Russia. Even without, even without arms being funneled into Ukraine, by the thousands, by the billions of dollars worth, okay, old old e equipment or not, you cannot go against a country with 44 million people in it that have nowhere else to fucking go that are not going to sit there idly and take it. That's the reason why he was like, oh, it's a special operation. Fuck no, it wasn't a special operation at all. You are wrong twice, actually. He did invade, and it yet hasn't destroyed Russia. Brother, if you think that this is a... If you think that the, the, the invasion of Ukraine has been a W for either side, you are huffing on maximum as a copium. It uh, obviously is a standstill, and the counteroffensive failed in the way that the American government and the Western media presented it at first. It never came to be. Ukraine has hemorrhaged uh, combatants. Russia also has hemorrhaged combatants in this process by a, a, a significant chunk. It comes down to a major Russian intelligence failure, which believes there would be far less Ukrainian resistance and far more support among ethnic Russians, which wasn't the case. Yes. I think that they maybe thought that it would be like Crimea, which was ridiculous. I always point to Kharkiv as a great example of an area that was more pro-Russian uh, pre-invasion due to uh, Russian sympathy and ethnically Russian people living there. And look at it now. Ain't nobody is fucking pro-Russia after their, after their entire uh, existence is wiped out, after their homes are wiped out, after their fucking apartment complex are reduced to rubble. You're not going to be pro-Russia at that point. Ethnic Russian is such a misleading term. Many Russian-speaking cities are mostly pro-Ukrainian. Look at Kherson. Yeah, I, I'm just... I don't know how else to communicate that point. Like, more, um, more sympathetic to Russia. 
there are there were areas in eastern Ukraine that are more sympathetic to Russia. The further east you go in Ukraine, the more people used to be sympathetic to Russia. This doesn't mean that they wanted to be invaded by Russia or anything like that. Okay? Clearly, they did not want to be invaded by Russia. They are now invaded by Russia, and look at them. They are not pro-Russia at all. Like, I'm not saying that they wanted to be liberated by the glorious uh, Putin, Vladimir Putin. That's not what I'm saying at all. The point I was basically making is that even those areas that he thinks, even those areas that I think Vladimir Putin thought he would be able to easily annex similar to, uh, easily annex similar to Crimea, he was not going to be able to do so. I'm et ethnically Russian hardly makes any sense because if we're getting into the history like Putin, there are a fuck ton of ethnic groups that aren't in the, the Russian ethnic group, but are native to the land. Yeah. I don't know what the proper way to communicate that would be. To be fair, it doesn't matter what they think. I know people in Mariupol who are pro-Ukraine, but Russia pushed Azov shit in, and now the people are pro-Russia. It's just power and position. Yeah, okay. Come on. I'm not missing the Biden speech. He's not live yet. Shut the fuck up. Anyway. Yeah, you're convincing me now that this whole thing was a justification to flush out ethnic and political groups not aligned with Putin and solidify his position in nationalistic fervor to those to fervor of those left. Now, I think internally, maybe Putin was a little worried about being outflanked from the right, from other ultra-nationalist forces, but I don't really know. I, I feel like he's got that shit on lock. But his justifications for invading Ukraine were fraught. It was fraudulent. There is no real justification for invading Ukraine. And I think a lot of people personally that claim that like, oh, he did it to like defend Donbass or whatever are wrong. Like, that's ridiculous. It's like when America says we have to go and invade a place because <laughs> they're killing women there or something. You know, it's just fucking bullshit. That previous dude is simply wrong. Ukraine destroyed a huge percentage of the Russian army. By the way, for the counteroffensive, you might have heard this somewhere, but NATO U.S. generals told Ukraine to attack in one direction with most of the force being there, but Zeluzhny was against that, and he decided to do it all across in the front in Zaporizhia, Donetsk, Luhansk, and Kharkiv. This is one of the generals why Zeluzhny was fired. Okay. Um... I am at the uh, 50th minute on the interview. We'll keep going until Biden goes on. We would have never considered to even lift a finger if it hadn't been for the bloody developments on Maidan. Because we agreed with the fact that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, our borders should be along the borders of former Union's republics. We agreed My to bourbon that. gamer, thank you for the five. We never agreed to NATO's expansion, and moreover, we never agreed that Ukraine would be in NATO. <laughs> we did not agree to NATO bases there without any discussion with us. For decades, we kept asking, don't do this, don't do that. And what triggered the latest events? Firstly, the current Ukrainian leadership declared that it would not implement the Minsk agreements, which had been signed, as you know, after the events of 2014 in Minsk, where the plan of peaceful settlement in Donbass was set forth. But no, the current Ukrainian leadership, foreign minister, all other officials and then President himself said that they don't like anything about the Minsk agreements. In other words, they were not going to implement it. A year or a year and a half ago, former leaders of Germany and France said openly to the whole world that they indeed signed the Minsk agreements, but they never intended to implement them. They simply led us by the nose. Was there anyone for you to talk to? Did you call a U.S. President, Secretary of State, and say, if you keep militarizing Ukraine with NATO forces, this is going to get... This is going to be a, we're going to act. 
By the way, here's why this is like pure, pure, unadulterated pro-Putin propaganda hour from Tucker. Notice how every single time, including like in the first 30 minutes where Putin was like talking about fucking, I don't know, the history of how every Ukrainian is technically Russian in real life or whatever. He kept trying to bring the conversation back to rails in a way that is like more appropriate for Western audience consumption. That's basically what he's doing every single time he feels like Putin is deviating away. Like he straight up said, okay, but let's talk about NATO. You invaded Ukraine because of NATO, right? While he literally was like, everyone in Ukraine is actually Russian. And I, I think that uh, we will liberate, <laughs> we will liberate the glorious Russians uh, that live in Ukraine. He's like, no, no, but NATO, right? Like NATO. Um, is there no one that you could talk to in America? What's going on? It's kind of awesome. I won't lie. It's kind of awesome that he gets to be so patriotic, quote unquote, while eating Russia's dick so hard, or Putin's dick so hard. I wish I could do that. Today, about their look into my handling of classified documents. <clears throat> I was pleased to see he reached a firm conclusion that no charges should be brought against me in this case. This was an exhaustive investigation going back more than 40 years even in the 1970s when I was still a new United States Senator. Uh-oh. <clears throat> the special counsel acknowledged I cooperated completely. I did not throw up any roadblocks. I sought no delays. In fact, I was so determined to give the special counsel what he needed, I went forward with a five-hour in-person, five-hour in-person interview over two days on October the 8th and 9th of last year, even though Israel had just been attacked by Hamas on the 7th and I was very occupied. <laughs> was in the middle of handling an international crisis. I was especially pleased to see special counsel make clear the stark distinction and difference between this case and Mr. Trump's case. The special counsel wrote, and I quote, several material distinctions between Mr. Trump's case and Mr. He's Biden's not are clear, continuing to quote, most notably, after giving multiple chances to return will classified they, will documents. Will they talk about the part where they say he's like decrepit? Mr. Trump allegedly did the opposite. According to the indictment, he not only refused to return the documents. They called me for senile, months, Jack. He also obstructed justice by enlisting others to destroy evidence and then to lie about it. In contrast, he went on to say Mr. Biden turned in classified documents to the National Archives and the Department of Justice, consented to the search of multiple locations, including his home, sat for a voluntary interview, and in other ways cooperated with the investigation. End of quote. I've seen the headlines since the report was released about my willful retention of documents. This, these assertions are not only misleading, they're just plain wrong. On page 215, if you had a chance, I know it's a long, it's a thick document. On the page 215, document. the report of the special counsel found the exact opposite. Here's what he wrote. There is, in fact, a shortage of evidence that I willfully retain classified materials related to Afghanistan. On page 12, Special counsel also wrote for another documents. The decision to decline criminal charges was straightforward. The evidence suggests that Mr. Biden did not willfully retain these documents. Will they the talk about how they think he's I did senile? Not willfully retain these documents. Will they talk about how addition, he's senile? I know there's some attention paid to some language in the report about my recollection of events. There's Ooh. even reference that I don't remember when my son died. How in the hell dare he raise that? Oh, he's Frankly, mad. When I was asked the question, I thought to myself, it wasn't any of their damn business. Let me tell you something. Some of you have commented, I wear since the day he died, every single day, the rosary he got from Our Lady of... Every Memorial Day, we hold a service remembering him, attending by friends and family and the people who loved him. I don't need anyone. I don't need anyone to remind me when he passed away or passed away. Simple truth is I sat for a five-hour interview over two days of events going back 40 years. At the same time I was managing an international crisis, their task was to make a decision about whether to move forward with charges in this case. That's their decision to make. That's the council's decision to make. That's his job. And they decided not to move forward. For any extraneous commentary, they don't know what they're talking about. It has no place in this report. The bottom line is the matter is now closed. I'm going to continue what I've always focused on, 
my job of being President of the United States of America. And I thank you, and I'll take some questions. President oh, Biden. shit. Something the special counsel said in he his said, report is that died. one of the reasons you were not charged is because, in his description, you are a well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. I'm well-meaning, and I'm an elderly man, and I know what the hell I'm doing. I've been president, and I put this country back on its feet. I don't need his recommendation. It's How totally bad out. is your memory, and can you continue as president? My memory is so bad, I let you speak. That's uh, that's Do you that's. Feel my, your memory has gotten worse, Mr. No, president. Look, my memory is not good. My memory is fine. My memory. Take a look at what I've done since I become president. None of you thought I could pass any of the things I got passed. How'd that happen? You know, I guess I just forgot what was uh -oh. going on. Uh-oh. Mr. President, Mr. President, this is not. This is kind of a wild thing for him to do. He's being a wild card. Uh-oh. Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, Bro, this is like what I tell people all the time. Don't feed the trolls. He's feeding the trolls. I take responsibility for not having seen exactly what my staff was doing. There's, it goes in and points out things that appeared in my garage, things that came out of my home, things that were moved, were moved not by me, but my staff, but my staff. Mr. President, for months when you were asked about your age, you would respond with the words, watch me. Watch Many me. American people have been watching, and they uh -oh. have expressed concerns about your age. That is they, your judgment. They, that is your judgment. To public that is oh not God. the judgment concerns. of the press. Oh, my God, he's yelling at reporters individually about how he's not old. Mr. President, in December, you told me that you believe there are many other Democrats who could defeat Donald Trump. So why does it have to be you now? Why, what is your answer to that question? I'm the most question? qualified person in this country to be President of the United States and finish the job I started. Do you believe that the president, why are you confusing the names of world leaders? I did not share classified information. I did not share it with, your ghost writer, with my ghostwriter. Bro, not. what is Guaranteed he doing? But Dude, Whatever Dark Brandon Unleashed. Bro, this is like when I start yelling at all my fucking haters and pull them up to debate them. Question. The fact of the matter is, what I didn't want repeated, I didn't want him to know, and I didn't read it to him, was I had written a long memorandum to President Obama why we should not be in, this, in Afghanistan. And I was of this, multiple pages. And so what I was referring to, I said classified, I should have said it was, should be private because it was a contact between the president and the vice president as to what was going on. That's what he's referring to. It was not classified information in that document. That was not classified. <laughs> When you look back at this incident, is there anything you would do differently now? And do you think that a special prosecutor should have been appointed in the first place in both of these cases? First of all, what I would have done is oversee the transfer of the material that was in my office, in my offices. I should have done that. If I go back, I didn't have the responsibility huh. to that. That was my staff was supposed to do that, and they referenced that in the report. And my staff did not do it in the way that, for example, I didn't know how half the boxes got in my garage until I found out staff gathered them up, put them together, and took them to the garage in my home. And all the stuff that was in my home was in filing cabinets that were either locked or able to be locked. It was in my house. It wasn't out in, like, in Mar-a-Lago in a public place where and none of it was high classified. Didn't have any of that red stuff on it. You know if he had a stroke right now, none this would that. dramatically so change I everything. Wish I had paid Due more to attention the to how the documents were medical being moved grade cocaine work. that he I has coursing through his veins. I thought all of those being moved. That's what I thought. Now, what was the last part of your question? Whether a special counsel should have been appointed in this case and in the case of your rival president, former president. I think a special counsel should have been appointed. And the reason I think a special counsel should have been appointed is because I did not want to be in a position that they looked at Trump and weren't going to look at me, just like they looked at the vice president. And the fact is they made a firm conclusion. I did not break the law, period. Thank you all very, very much. Oh, dude. Oh.
Oh my god, the media is gonna eat him, dude. The hostage negotiation. Oh! Oh! He's back! He's back for more! Oh! He said, I got that dog in me! One more! You, as you know, that the conduct of the response in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip oh, no. has been um, over the top. I think what? that, uh, as you know, initially, the president of Mexico, Sisi, did not want to open up the gate to allow Sisi, president of Mexico? That's Egypt, in. dog! I talked to him. I convinced him to open the gate. Oh! I talked to Bibi to open the gate on the Israeli side. <laughs> I've been pushing really hard, really hard to oh! get humanitarian assistance into Gaza. There are a lot of innocent people who are starving. A lot of innocent people who are in trouble and dying. And it's got to stop, number one. Number two, I was also in a position that I'm the guy that made the case that we have to do much more to increase the amount of material going in, including fuel, including other items. I've been on the phone with the Qataris. I've been on the phone with the Egyptians. I've been on the phone with the Saudis to get as much aid as we possibly can into Gaza. There are innocent people and innocent women and children who are also in bad, badly in need of help. And so that's what we're pushing. And I'm pushing very hard now to deal with this hostage ceasefire because, as a, you know, I've been working tirelessly in this deal. How can I say this without revealing it? To lead to a sustained pause in the fighting, in the actions taking place in, in the Gaza Strip. And, uh, because I think if we can get the delay for that, uh, the initial delay, I think that uh, we would be able to uh, extend that uh, so that we could increase the prospect that this fighting in Gaza changes. There's also negotiations. You may recall, in the very beginning, right after, right before Hamas attacked, I was in contact with the Saudis and others to work out a deal where they would recognize Israel's right to exist, let them make them part of the Middle East, recognize them fully in return for certain things that the United States would commit to do. And the commitment to, that we were proposed to do related to two, uh, two, two items, I'm not going to go in detail, but one of them was to deal with uh, um, the protection against their arch enemy to the Northwest, the Northeast, I should say. The second one, by providing ammunition and material for them to defend themselves. Coincidentally, that's the time frame when this broke out. I have no proof what I'm about to say, but it's not unreasonable to suspect that the Hamas understood what was about to take place and wanted to break it up before it happened. Wait, what? Thank you, everybody. We're going to need everybody to hold for a moment. He said Hamas uh, knew that. Oh Jesus! Wait, he said Hamas knew that uh, that that. <laughs> the fuck! Hamas knew that the Abraham Accords were coming to completion, and that's why they did it. Is that what he's saying? With no proof whatsoever. While also openly recognizing that he's got no. He said, "I got no evidence for this." Saudi officials' comments about normalization. Looks like Saudi Arabia just signed the death warrant of the Biden administration's efforts to normalize their relations with Israel. We've communicated our firm position to the U.S. administration that there will be no diplomatic relations with Israel unless an independent Palestinian state is recognized on the 1967 borders with East Jerusalem at its capital. Yeah, bro, I don't fucking believe anything that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia says. Okay, get the fuck out of here. Uh, okay, couple notes. Actually, not bad. At first, I was going to say... I'm going to give Biden high marks on this. I'm going to give Biden high marks on this. Controversial. Two things. One, definitely more aggressive in his stance against Israel. Probably the first time that he's actually been a little bit more aggressive uh, against Israel 
most likely because he's been most likely because they are you high? No, listen, listen, molten hot take. I'm not, I'm not fucking, I'm not joking at all. Okay. Way better than I thought it was going to be partially because partially because yelling at reporters oftentimes will play very well with the American population that also fucking hates the media for understandable reasons. Willfully retain classified documents. However, he did openly fucking say, I never gave classified information up. He pulled a Trumpian ass move. Okay. He pulled a Trumpian ass move. He did some Trump shit. Okay. Saying like, oh, uh, one, I didn't fucking uh, reveal or leak classified information. Uh, he had one major flub where he said the Mexican president, Sisi, when he was talking about Egypt, that part is not good. 100%. He keeps fucking doing stuff like that. I'm shocked that he didn't do more of it, to be honest. But him yelling at reporters could actually play well. It could actually play well. He looked more dynamic than he ever has in months. Okay? He looked more dynamic than he ever has in fucking months. Now, he still looks old as hell, obviously up there. Uh, but I don't know. I think that him yelling at reporters... Might play well. However, it might also backfire on him because I think that, like, when you engage with the media in that way, when you engage in the media that way, they're going to fucking keep digging. They're going to dig their heels in and they're going to start, uh, they're going to start going crazy mode over, like, why did Biden say this? Is Biden turning just like turning into Trump? That sort of shit. Um, it's like when people who are dying get one last burst of energy before they croak. He had the smoke for the first like five minutes and it clearly wore off. Wild how it was like a switch. Yeah. That, it's crazy when you see him like off script when he like goes back for the second and you can just see his like synapses no longer are firing. That part is awful. But the first yelling part, depending on like how much they cover, depending on how what they cover and what they choose to pay attention to, I don't know him yelling at fucking reporters. Not a bad look, especially when your major point, when your major, uh, like when your major, uh, propaganda against you, like your biggest weakness is how not dynamic you are and how fucking old you are. Okay. Um, yelling at reporters can play really well, but not when it's about your senility in a conversation where you also display your senility just because you like yelling doesn't mean it will play well. No, the people fucking hate the media. So, and the people don't expect Biden to ever like, uh, pull out some non, uh, pull out some like non-civil shit. Um, shaming their media about like his son, like, or the shaming the special prosecutor about his son thing is a really solid way in my opinion, to fucking neuter that conversation, even though it was bullshit, okay? If I'm being for real, I think being like, oh, yeah, I forgot my son's death. How dare you? It's a good way to try and basically uh, dive on that grenade and just completely neutralize it, even though it's fucking bullshit, okay? Yes, he 100% is demented. So that's something that, that's something that you also have to consider. Uh, but I do think... I do think that, um, huh, yeah, I, I think that, that overall, like when he came back, it was really interesting. The second time when he came back, like he, his, his brain was like obviously short circuiting. Being a good leader is not that easy. People need to put themselves in a shoe. What? No, dude, shut up. Hassan, you literally said, I wear the rosary, I got it, and just moved on. He was trying to prove a point about how his memory was sharp about Bo's death and funeral, and he couldn't even do that. This was a massive Biden hell. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. You admit he's demented, but yelling about how he's not demented is a dub. Dude, he is so not fucking dynamic that any, any instance where he has, like, life can be portrayed, in my opinion, as, like, uh, 
from people who want to desperately see him as like a valid candidate, they're going to, they're going to look at it. Like maybe, maybe he has some life in him. Maybe he's got that dog in him. I think if he hadn't gone back, we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, addressing the allegations that you have dementia, not a great move regardless. I don't think that that's like smart. If he had this level of smoke for Israel, constantly talking about like, here, here's what I would do if I was Biden. Okay. Here's what I'm doing. I'm having that level of energy singularly for Netanyahu. Because right now, if you're a liberal Zionist, you're only out. Your fucking parachute, your ripcord in this circumstance is to blame Benjamin Netanyahu as the sole contributor to the death and destruction in Gaza. He can't even get himself to do that. This is the first time he said something along the lines of like Israel's actions are unconscionable. This is the first time. First time I've heard Brandon legitimately fucking like say anything that is like remotely, remotely critical of Israel. Okay. Under even, and even then there is also like, uh, obviously a, a little bit of uncertainty in the way that he, uh, uncertainty in the way that he delivered that. And, um, that's not a bad thing politically to do, in my opinion. It's not a bad thing to do politically. And it's something that he should have been doing a long ass fucking time ago. Okay. And I assume that if this is the start of like a new wave of, of Brandon, he'll probably start uh, positioning himself against Benjamin Netanyahu and saying, this is Benjamin Netanyahu's war. It's gone too long. And CNN hitting Biden on Mexico, Mexico, Mexico. That's the only thing from the press conference. Anyone's going to remember Jeffrey Tubin says on CNN. God damn. CNN is being fucking extra hard on our boy here. Jesus Christ. Okay. That's interesting. Um, I love seeing him be dynamic. The biggest hurdle has been for him to have a sense of personality. It's definitely a change up for sure. Yes. Dude, he's always looking like a senile old bird, okay? He's looking like he's looking like a cat that is like really old and doesn't fucking have the same step and is just like kind of look like kind of looking like bruised up all the goddamn time. Any kind of like pop off for Brandon at this moment is going to be like uh, you know, like that moment from the campaign trail where he would have we would turn around and be like, "Look alive, fat. Listen, fat." Shit like that played well for him overall. I think that uh, CNN is positioning itself as like more conservative. Talking about the guys who showed his meat to everyone. Wait, what? Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how this, uh, we'll see how this plays out. It, it is definitely above my expectations. I thought he was going to be real fucking bad. Okay. I thought he was going to be really, really, really fucking bad. I think the reception Blinken got in Israel and Netanyahu's refusal for a ceasefire, which Biden has been presenting himself as working on, pushed him over the edge. Yeah, that's what I think too. I think that this, um, this time around, I think Benjamin Netanyahu openly being like, fuck off. I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want has probably finally gotten the liberals to, to recognize that, you know, this shit's not manageable at all. It's far too late. A genocide has already occurred and it's continuously occurring. Um, but, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. But I do, I do foresee a change of pace here in the way that he talks about Israel. He didn't spend the entirety fucking shitting on Hamas and being like, it's all Hamas's fault and there is no genocide happening and that the death tolls are wrong and like UNRWA is also Hamas. That's usually what his fucking perspective is, okay? His perspective is like basically in, in lockstep with Benjamin Netanyahu. So... Um, the Mexico thing was a big slip up, especially when basically you're doing it, uh, when you're doing it in the midst of a press conference about how you're not actually brain broken. Like that's kind of fucked up. You can't have any moments that you, where you flub, but having said that, 
Um, having said that, I do think that two things that I think uh, I will give higher marks on average to Biden on. Uh, two things that I think uh, allow Biden to get higher marks on this is the fact that he was at least a little bit more critical of Israel. And I think that that spells a little bit of a change of pace, not to read the tea leaves too much. Um, and the other thing is like, he looked a little bit dynamic in the beginning rather than like old and incredibly senile when he was yelling, even if the conversation that he was having was about how he is not senile. And I do think that he neutralized the, uh, I do think that he neutralized the, the, he forgot his son's death thing relatively well, making it like a, making it like really, really fucked up to talk about almost. You know what I mean? But we'll see. We'll see how it plays out. He said, I was elected to be the president for red states and green states. I uh, hadn't heard that one before. <laughs> yeah. I think it's the red states Dr. Seuss line. and blue states. But <laughs> go back to the picture that we're going to show now. Look at the garage. This is the president of the United States garage, Stephen Miller. This is where he was keeping information about U.S. weapons capabilities. For what about when he said he's the most qualified for the job? Yeah, that kind of stuff is just seasoning. Of course he's going to say that. It's fucking bullshit. Of course he's not the most qualified for the job. Okay was so dilapidated and crumbled that they couldn't even pick it up. They had to take the classified documents and put it in another box. Now, this is a garage that Hunter's in and out of with Jackie Bao, who's tied to Chinese intelligence. This is where the garage doors open. They're going on a joyride in the Corvette. Now, you take this. Okay, shut the fuck. Come on, dude. Come on. There's so many better avenues of attack for Biden. If I'm fucking, if I'm on Fox News right now, I'm not doing this dumb shit, okay? If I'm on Fox News right now, I'm going, man, how demented. Imagine being so demented that you think you can yell at the at the press like this. When Donald Trump used to yell at the press, we loved it because he was actually clear. Uh, he was actually clear and coherent in his yelling at the press. When Brandon tries to do it, it seems like a desperate old man. These guys fucking suck at their jobs, dude. I swear to God, I would be a better right wing commentator. God, they suck so much ass. They're like, oh, look, this is a garage versus the Mar-a-Lago basement. Like, imagine, imagine being like, oh, well, Donald Trump's boxes had lids on them, uh, whereas Brandon's boxes didn't. You guys fucking suck at your job, dude. Huh. Yeah, Donald Trump's boxes were in the bathroom, and nobody used that bathroom. What? K-Hive, new display name? I feel like, honestly, I feel like CNN is probably being more blistering in their commentary against Brandon than, than Fox is right now. Let's supposedly hear Supposedly cleared her of the use of classified information and then talked about how reckless and terrible she was. You know, pro the job of prosecutors is to put up or shut up. If you have a case, bring your case. If you don't have a case, shut the hell up or say as little. Do you think he's playing politics? I absolutely do. You know, Merrick Garland picked a Republican prosecutor, a someone who worked for Donald Trump. I don't know why Merrick Garland chose him. Democrats seem to have this idea that if they pick Republicans for these tough jobs, they'll get some credit for it. It didn't work with James Comey, who was appointed by a Democrat. It didn't work um, with her. And I think this was um, there was no case to be brought here. But her did his best to damage Biden politically. Now, unfortunately for Biden, Biden didn't help himself today in his response. But the idea that this was put in this report, you know, that he was elderly and that, that didn't belong in that report. So some of it did feel very gratuitous. I do agree with that. But I do caution. I see an emerging narrative on, from Democrats oh, God. that this is a partisan investigation by the DOJ. This was a Republican and a Trump appointee. So therefore, he's putting... Yes, to the chatters who are asking, that's Jeffrey Tubin, who is most famous for being caught zerking it on his goddamn Zoom call. Yes, that's Mr. Gooner. Jeffrey Tubin is probably 
the greatest political prisoner of our generation because like he literally was a gooner before gooning became as prominent like sometimes you just got a goon sometimes you're gooning while you're on a zoom call okay yeah who up playing with their tube jeffrey tubin did there. This comes with a lot of backdrop and a lot of concerns, and it's not just one moment in the report either. Also, in the last week, he, he's referenced dead European leaders who haven't been alive since the 90s, confusing them with, with current or, or almost current leaders. I, I think it's a bigger picture of the questions, and clearly the White House felt the need to address that, and that's why they made him come out for these abruptly scheduled remarks tonight. Yeah, a couple of points. First, Joe Biden and Donald Trump are both old. Americans, and there's nothing that we're going to be able to do in this election cycle to change that narrative, except go directly at it. And um, I think, I mean, I hear a lot of people tonight saying, I don't think it was a good move. Well, you can't just hide because that's the, uh, we're not in a normal political media atmosphere. You have to Voters want a fighter. Voters want to say, you come at me and you talk about my son and me not remember when my son died. I'm going to tell you something. And so, will See, it be I told the thing you. that... Dude, liberals are such suckers for that shit. Okay? See? Liberals immediately eating that. Liberals are immediately eating that, dude. I'm telling you. They, they, they love that Mixed shit. Mixed up Mexico and... Dude, Biden literally won... I mean, a, a, people forget. Biden won an election. Talking about how every single person he's ever loved has died, okay? Do you guys not remember? The 2020 election cycle literally was just like an endless sequence of Biden being like, everyone I know dies. Okay? He was li literally doing an extended cut of Johnny Cash uh, Hurt. What have I become my sweetest friend? Mourner in chief, 100%. He did that. He pulled the fucking mourner in chief ripcord again. He's doing, he's going for the pity play, dude. Mr. Pity Pussy himself. Um, behavior. It might not work for all voters, but he can't hide on this. Doug, is that the case? Because when you look at polling, voters way more register that concern of age with Biden than they do with Trump, even though Trump is, as Ashley noted, just a few years behind him. Uh, I, that's very true. And you hear that from younger voters. You hear it from older voters. My 90-year-old aunt in Little Silver, New Jersey today said, this guy's too old. And we hear this over and over again. And the problem for Biden is, yes, the issue's not going away because Biden's not going away. And every time he presents himself, there's a problem like this. You know, uh, David Axelrod was praising earlier when he invoked um, when he evoked his son, Beau, what I heard was he mentioned the rosary from Our Lady of, and then he didn't name the church because he got stuck on a moment there. It reminds me very much of in 1994 in the fall, going to see Frank Sinatra in concert at Meriwether Post, not far from here. And one minute come fly with me was amazing. A few minutes later, he could barely remember the words from my way. And what did, what did we remember? that he couldn't remember the words to my way. This is going to be a recurring problem for Biden. And ultimately, the Biden uh, White House right now is saying three things. One, hey, a lot of people forget things. Two, he was slightly less responsible than Donald Trump. And three, there was a lot going on in the world with Israel. So let's cut him some slack. That's not strong messaging. Audie, what did you hear in that? I mean, I guess I'm the only one who's not as alarmed <laughs> because I'm looking at it kind of holistically. This report comes out and this line is in it, and they have to address it right away. There's no scenario where you let that sit. And in terms of media management, you want to be out there because what happened after he had his speech, we played a clip of him saying, how dare you speak about my son that way. We didn't play a clip of him you know, saying Mexico instead of Egypt. And I think people take these things in a different way than they used to. They're not sitting home at the couch waiting for him to speak. What they're gonna do is see a number of clips. Mm -hmm. And your point is very well taken, that essentially there's a lot of young people who have been waiting for him to speak in some kind of striking way about Israel and Gaza, and specifically him saying, I think they've gone oh. overboard using that kind of language. Oh. That's going to be very striking in the social media space. And also seeing all the reporters barking at him, yelling at him, saying, rah, 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 and then he's got quick, fast, snappy, 
defensive replies. I don't necessarily think, again, generationally, they're going to be like, whoa, he was sarcastic. I like a nicer Biden. That hasn't been what they've been asking yeah. for. So I'm just going to put it out there. I know everyone has said that this was bad for a number of reasons, but I would challenge our thinking on this and that people don't take it in the way we do, nitpicking at it because that's our job. They're going to get these emotional clips and they're going to walk away with his emotion, which was very intense, almost enraged, use, use the word seething. And people may hear particular clips and think, hmm, maybe it was justifiably so. Yeah, I think some people, you know, covering Biden, you realize he does have a temper. His whole yeah. staff, his allies, Kate Bedingfield, I'm sure would acknowledge that, that it is something that is known about him. But if Ellie, this report is saying he's Mr. Magoo, he can't come out and be Mr. Magoo. He's got to come out and be punchy and be the guy you're talking about. This report, and a key part of this, Ellie, and to go back to what Jeffrey Tubin was saying there, the special counsel, Robert Hur did have to issue a report. Those are his regulations. It was this lengthy report, which we were expecting. It was that him trying to explain why? why he didn't charge Biden, why that was going to be so long. What was your read on what that on what he said? So first of all, this report is required by the special counsel regulations. And if we want a precedent of somebody issuing a very long special counsel report without recommending a charge, look no further than Robert Mueller, who issued a 400 page special counsel report and did not specifically say, I recommend criminal charges. He and was testified. ambiguous and testified. Let me be clear about this. This is a very close call. I have written and read a thousand of these documents. They're called prosecution memos. You lay out the facts and you say, here's my recommendation as to charging or not charging. Joe Biden is correct that Donald Trump's conduct was worse, but his conduct was still very close to the line. Here are the facts. Joe Biden, established by this report, Joe Biden retained sensitive classified documents after he left the vice presidency. Marked the, classified? Or? Yes, marked classified, highest level, top secret SCI. They related to our international affairs, to war plans, to foreign relations. He knew it, he knew it. He's on tape after he's out of the vice presidency saying to his autobiographer, the classified documents are in the basement. He knew it. But he just denied that. That's, exactly. That, that so was that's a key part of the report. It's the second sentence in the report and he just denied sharing that with the ghostwriter. And I yep. just looked at this closely. Uh, they had recorded conversations between Biden and this ghostwriter. Exactly. That is what blew my mind about Joe Biden's statement. Sev two major things he just outright contradicts or is contradicted by, however you look at this, this report. There are two things he said that are completely the opposite of what Robert Hur found. And who do you believe is up to, I guess, the individual consumer? First, Joe Biden says, I did not act willfully. Willfully just means voluntarily, intentionally. Are liberals well, abandoning Biden? CNN, I think, wants Trump to be president so they can get their ratings back. I'll say it. CNN has openly positioned itself as being more openly conservative. And I think part of that is because they want Trump back so they can get their ratings back. Nobody gives a fuck about the media. Nobody gives a fuck about the news. Nobody gives a fuck about politics. And I do think that, I do think that, like, uh, CNN is making a play. Which, by the way, bro, I don't think it's openly conservative. I think he did badly in that interview. No, no, no. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, no, no, no. Your opinion on the interview or your opinion on the situation in and of itself is not uh, related to what I'm talking about with respect to CNN. I think CNN... Um, yeah, I think, I think CNN desperately wants to go back to the days where like they could shit on Trump. Uh, and have a lot of people pay attention, but I don't, I don't, but I think it's a, it's a, it's not going to happen because part of the reason why I think, uh, the view counts have gone away from at least these places is because people are just not watching television as much. And I think CNN trying to be more conservative is not going to win over a conservative audience that already gets all the conservative messaging in a much more entertaining way from fucking Fox news. Um, so they they will probably like radicalize some of the liberals that are moderate and <clears throat> to become more conservative. But then the rest of the more progressive people will stop watching CNN because they're going to get mad. They're, they'll alienate more and more of their base of like reliable watchers. You are not very smart. I agree. I'm not a very smart guy. I don't think I am. Um, anyway, I watch you in place where I used to watch CNN. Yeah. I mean, there's people like myself, there's TikTok. There's so many more avenues to get news, uh, 
get av- uh, so many more avenues to get news from. I think that's part of the reason. Uh, U.S. cable news struggling as Trump bump fails to materialize. It's a rerun. Yeah. Uh, well, I think as I as I all I'm fucking experiencing this. I'm a media person. I am a media operation on my own, and I'm telling you this is real. I think that a lot of people don't want to fucking pay attention to politics. Talk to your normie friends and you will see that most people don't give a fuck. They were so dialed in during Trump that they just got like outrage fatigue. People are burned out. People are, people have outrage fatigue. Um, they just don't care as much. And I don't know. Uh, I don't know if like, uh, th- that will ever recover unless there's like more dynamic candidates that are genuinely getting people interested in politics again, making them believe again, you need like a Barack Obama style candidate. And we are so far removed from that. Trump is the last guy that was a Barack Obama style candidate, but for, you know, white supremacists. Not for you. You're not going to understand what his appeal was if you're, if you're obviously uh, disgusted by his politics, which is totally fair and totally valid. But for a lot of fucking, for a lot of racist people, like he is the Barack Obama for racist. For my white liberal friends, they just notice how much more enjoyable their life is not paying attention to politics. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. Big Gretch could be Barack Obama for white women, dude. 2024 could have been the year of white women, dude. Taylor Swift, Big Gretch, Mama Gretch and Taylor Swift side by side. T-Swift pushing for Big Gretch. It would be Jover, okay? Permanent cultural democratic regime victory, okay? We would be, we would be regime pilled. We would be democracy maxing. Everyone would be talking about preaching the gospels of liberalism up and down. A world that you could see. <coughs> Chad, has he talked about the um, so online? What the fuck are you even talking about? So online? Wait, what? No. Big Gretch, is, Big Gretch has movement uh, power for sure. Anyway. Big Gretch, her story maxing. Well, Big Gretch is like actually like a real person uh, and and, uh, a a relatively, a very popular bit. You'd want that, huh? Wait, what? Why'd you ban this guy? Hassan is a capitalist. No, I'm saying I'm white supremacist and I still don't like Trump. Bet you'd want that, huh? Lol, I'm joking. I'm black. Boom. Immediately got fucking banned. Jesus Christ, Lake McGrew. Not a single voter under the age of 50 knows who Gretchen is. Wait, what? First of all, who gives a shit? You know who votes? People over the age of 50. And secondly, being a relatively unknown entity is a positive in this situation. You have every opportunity to build a story for yourself, okay? Rather than being a known entity, because a known entity equals institutionalist, equals elite, equals bipartisan, or not bipartisan, sorry, bicoastal elite. It, it spells baggage, okay? I did unban him. She's super popular in Michigan. She's comfortable enough for establishment Dems are very progressive on some issues. Yeah. Less opposition messaging. Hillary was hated far before she had a nomination. Yes. 
Hillary came from a background of like an entire industry designed around Oppo for her, and it was a horrible candidate for that reason. The elections once more, like they did in 2020. So I, I think we're just in a completely, completely uncharted territory where the Democrats don't care about the Constitution, they don't care about actual fair and free elections, and they don't care about legitimately making their case to the American people because their case is to completely and totally destroy the nation. We're gonna get we back to it. the Pooty Poo yeah, interview in a second. This is, for all right, this is boring. All right, let's get back to Pooty Poo. Bloody Poo talking to uh, Tucker Carlson about. I mean, this is a real. This is real yaponomics, okay? I've never seen yappington of this variety, okay? Two hours and fucking seven minutes of it. Holy moly. Let's continue. We talked about this all the time. We addressed the United States and European countries' leadership to stop these developments immediately, to implement the Minsk agreements. Frankly speaking, I didn't know how we were going to do this, but I was ready to implement them. These agreements were complicated for Ukraine. They included lots of elements. Yes, I will be doing Comrade Border Patrol after this, don't worry. ...of those Donbass territories' independence. That's true. However, I was absolutely confident, and I'm saying this to you now. I honestly believe that if we managed to convince the residents of Donbass, and we had to work hard to convince them to return to the Ukrainian statehood, then gradually the wounds would start to heal. When this part of territory reintegrated itself into common social environment, when the pensions and social benefits were paid again, all the pieces would gradually fall into place. No, nobody wanted that. Everybody wanted to resolve the issue by military force only. But we could not let that happen. And the situation got to the point when the Ukrainian side announced, no, we will not do anything. They also started preparing for military the oh, fuck? Bro, your comments are trash now. Just because you're disillusioned doesn't mean you should propagate it into your audience. Stop claiming leftism if you don't live up to the standard. You're one of, if not the biggest voice on the left. Where's your revolutionary optimism? Are you okay? We're fucking... Have you thought that maybe there is valid criticism of how you as a leftist major online voice use your excess capital to benefit the desperate movement in the U.S.? I think I'm probably, if I'm coming across as disillusioned, I think this is probably a big part of the reason why. Because, like, a lot of people who fancy themselves to be, like, rugged leftists are just so fucking stupid. Like, I'm sorry, you're a 39-month subscriber, and, like, Hassan is shifting towards reactionary tendencies would ultimately side with capitalists, like he's telling you now. Like, for the past month, for the past couple of months, you've just, like, been nonstop talking about like how I'm grifting and all this shit and, and, and like, honestly, I'm not, I'm not disillusioned. I think I'm very realistic about like America's uh, hopes and chances, but I'll be honest. It's LARPers like yourself that, that do make me just absolutely fucking hate being a leftist. I thought it was a, I, I thought it was a, <laughs> I thought this guy was like trying to get me to do a top of the hour ad break, but no, this guy literally thinks that like watching Twitch streams or Twitch streamers or practices or some shit. Jesus Christ, dude, please. Brother, go outside, okay? Huh. 39 month subscriber talking about fucking how I've like lost the revolutionary optimism and I'm a reactionary or something. Let's continue. Reaction. It was they who started the war in 2014. Our goal is to stop this war. And we did not start this war in 2022. This is an attempt to stop it. Do you think you've stopped it now? I mean, have you achieved your aims? 
No, we haven't achieved our aims yet, because one of them is the Nazification. This means the prohibition of all kinds of neo-Nazi movements. This is one of the problems that we discussed during the negotiation process, which ended in Istanbul early this year. And it was not our initiative, because we were told by the Europeans, in particular, that it was necessary to create conditions for the final signing of the documents. My counterparts in France and Germany said, how can you imagine them signing a treaty with a gun to their heads? The troops should be pulled back from Kiev. I said, all right, we withdrew the troops from Kiev. As soon as we pulled back our troops from Kiev, our Ukrainian... It's because Boris Johnson, that Ottoman fail son, okay, that escaped, did not want Turkey to to be known as the country that finally brought peace, okay, to Ukraine. That's why he did that shit. I'm going to tell you right now, that son of a bitch. <laughs> it was going to be it was going to be glorious when Turkey was able to it was going to be glorious when Turkey was going to finally secure peace in Ukraine, okay? And then Boris Johnson was like, "No, I will not have it. I will not have it." The negotiators immediately threw all our agreements reached in Istanbul into the bin. Read a good comment for a change. I'm a libtard that is slowly getting his mind's eye opened by you. Worst part is I'm Palestinian. That's probably why you're. This, it took this long for you to have your uh, opinions shifted in the leftmost direction. You probably started realizing that a lot of liberals' contents that you consume personally. Uh, did not have your best interest in mind and that they were just unconditionally lapping up American State Department propaganda and you saw that when it came to Israel and you were like, wait a minute, this doesn't actually correspond to their own fucking values at all. What the fuck? I thought these guys were progressive. Well, anyway, I hope your family is all right. And got prepared for a long-standing armed confrontation with the help of the United States and its satellites in Europe. What? That is how the situation has developed, and that is how it looks now. <laughs> but, but what is part of my ignorance? What is denazification? What would that mean? That? Tucker's like, wait a minute, you don't like Nazis? Hold on, what am I doing here? <laughs> Tucker Carlson's like, wait, hold on, I feel very unsafe. <laughs> I thought you were pro-Nazi. Um. <laughs> yeah, dude, he's so. He's so Vladimir Putin is so anti-Nazi. He even he even uh, dealt with the Wagner Group. <laughs> Just kidding. Obviously, the denazification thing is bullshit. Please, I know I can't make any jokes on this stuff because people are very quick to pounce on it. I've maintained the position that uh, Vladimir Putin's like denazification sentiment has always been a lie from the jump. That is what I want to talk about right now. It is a very important... It's not bullshit. Ukrainian army has a lot of Nazis. No, dude, it's fucking bullshit because, like, so does the Russian army, okay? That is not a, that is not a good reason, nor even remotely a reason at all to invade Ukraine. Again, another thing that I said literally the day of the invasion was... All you do when you invade a country that has a lot of nationalistic sentiment, okay, is galvanize the Nazis and the nationalists as the emancipatory force, okay? That's it. If you want to denazify Ukraine, you probably should have never, you definitely should have never invaded Ukraine. There is no denazification occurring in that sort of that sort. Anyway, issue, denazification. After gaining independence, Ukraine began to search, as some Western analysts say, Elant News, yeah, exactly. So the many armies law, most Ukrainian soldiers are Nazis invading a country using Nazis to denazify them. I'm just saying he did fucking deal with Wagner leadership. That's denazification, point one for Putin. He did. Its identity. <laughs> and it came up with nothing better than to build this identity upon some false heroes who collaborated with Hitler. I like that he was talking about Molotov, uh, Molotov Ribbentrop, 
and and how that is a good justification for why Russia is actually Ukraine is actually Russian, like how Ukraine belongs to Russia. And now he's like, yeah, um, they had a lot of Nazi collaborators in Ukraine. Yeah, you know what they also had? A shit ton more people in the fucking Red Army. You know what I mean? Anyway, that's besides the point. I have already said that in the early 19th century, when the theorists of independence and sovereignty of Ukraine appeared, they assumed that an independent Ukraine should have very good relations with Russia. But due to the historical development, those territories were part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Poland, where Ukrainians were persecuted and treated quite brutally as well as were subject to cruel behavior. There were also attempts to destroy their identity. All this remained in the memory of the people. When World War II broke out, part of this extremely nationalist elite collaborated with Hitler, believing that he would bring them freedom. The German troops, even the SS troops, made Hitler's collaborators do the dirtiest work of exterminating the Polish and Jewish population. Hence this brutal massacre of the Polish and Jewish population, as well as the Russian population too. How uncomfortable do you think Tucker is right now? <laughs> like, fuck, man. <laughs> this guy's going real hard on Nazis. <laughs> I don't like this. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> this was led by the persons who are well known, Bandera, Shukevich. It was those people who were made national heroes. That is the problem. And we are constantly told that nationalism and neo-Nazism exist in other countries as well. Yes, they are seedlings, but we approve them. And other countries fight against them. But Ukraine is not the case. These people have been made into national heroes in Ukraine. Monuments to those people have been erected. They are this. Okay. To be fair, I don't think Ukraine is the only country that has like propped up Nazi collaborators as like national heroes. There's a lot of countries that have done that. Like almost the entirety of the Western aligned world in some shape or another, even though they fought against the Nazis, very clearly, holy shit, Hassan is actually Nazi apologizing here? No, I just, this is not Nazi apologia in any shape or form. The only country, Lamau, imagine thinking Putin is also not a Nazi. Does Hassan really think Putin is not a Nazi? Wait, what? What is, are this guy's broken? I think I thought this guy was like pushing Z. Turns out he just thinks I'm not like going hard against Putin uh, when I literally am going hard against Putin currently. You're all over the place, brother. You're fucking brain broken. How about you focus on the top of the hour ad break? Huh. <sighs> Anyway, no chatter. Tucker is thinking Putin is not a Nazi and he isn't okay with that. Listening comprehension is at an all time low. Yeah, no, it's because like we're talking about this one thing that is like a, is like a lightning rod for the worst type of chatters to come in. But yeah, no, I didn't take your fucking silly ass Armenian genocide top of the hour debate because I saw that you were using hoggers right before then and I knew immediately that the top of the hour ad break was going to be debated. So I clicked away. Okay, guess what? Suck me at the top of the hour. But if you don't want the top of the hour to suck, all you need to do is subscribe for $5 worth for free. Here's the three minute ad break now. I did beat Tekken 8, yes. ...displayed on flags. Their names are shouted by crowds that walk with torches, as it was in Nazi Germany. These were people who exterminated Poles, Jews, and Russians. 
It is necessary to stop this practice and prevent the dissemination of this concept. I say that Ukrainian... Putin's pull... Dude, this is why I said it's so Israel of him. Okay? Like, it's annoying because there is truth to the problem of nationalism within Ukraine. Football hooligans, Azov Battalion, and the Western world propping up those militant factions leading up to the Russian invasion. Okay? I've said all of this even before uh, Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine, which many people used to get so mad at me over because like, they were like, oh, dude, you are not supporting the cause. You think it's like justified to invade Ukraine when I very clearly said it's not justifiable to invade an entire fucking country because of nationalist elements. You're, it's bullshit. All you're doing is galvanizing those nationalist elements and making them infinitely more popular, which, in my opinion, he did. Um, but overall, it's, a, it's, it's, the, it's the same, like, Israel-ass argument to be like, yeah, dude, there's, like, Nazis there. We have to go and invade with our Nazis. <laughs> Hooligans Lamau, bro, you serious? Yes, I am serious. Yes, football hooligans play a gigantic role in, in places like Ukraine. Yeah. No, I. W what do you mean? Yeah. The fuck? Chatters be like, I don't understand. Like, I'm from fucking Iowa. I have never heard of, like, ultras. They're national in every European country. Yeah, the difference is, like, when they join battalions and get armed and trained by the American government. That's when they are no longer just ultras, but also now a militant force, a paramilitary. Anyway. Lazio SS. It's our part of the... Israel is not the same, though. No, what I was saying is like Israel's justification for like Hamas, Hamas, Hamas is that um, like they've eradicated any kind of secular leftist opposition to the Israeli apartheid. And then like the only thing that remains that violently is willing to resist the state of Israel is a more Islamist faction, an Islamist uh, faction that is like the only one that remains. And they see that as a solid position to keep uh destroying gaza all i mean destroying gaza whenever they feel like it and then they're like yeah these guys are actually anti-semitic and they hate jews that's why then they're nazis that's why we have to go in and fucking kill every palestinian it's almost identical to putin's platform obviously like the 75 year occupation is a little different than like uh the the uh, russian involvement in ukraine but the vibes are not dissimilar. I'm pro-Israel and pro-Russia, said no rational human ever. I don't think you've ever met a lot of Russian Israelis. That's number one. Okay. You're so, you're so stuck in, you are so stuck in like an American understanding that it's like either you're pro-Ukraine and pro-Israel, or you're pro-Ukraine and pro-Palestinian, there are definitely a shit ton of pro-Israel, uh, pro-Russia people. Rational is not a word he understands. I mean, okay. I don't think it's rational to be fucking uh, uh, pro-Ukraine and pro-Israel either, but it's a very commonly held position. The one Russian people. They say, no, we are a separate people. Okay, fine. If they consider themselves a separate people, they have the right to do so, but not on the basis of Nazism, the Nazi ideology. Would you be satisfied with the territory that you have now? I will finish answering the question. You just asked the question about neo-Nazism and the Nazification. Look, 
The president of Ukraine visited Canada. This story is well known, but being silenced in the Western countries. The Canadian parliament introduced a man who, as the speaker of the parliament said, fought against the Russians during the World War II. Well, who fought against the Russians during the World War II? Hitler and his accomplices. It turned out this kind of shit is like he's not wrong and it fucking sucks because of the the anti-communist sentiment in the west they have legitimately aligned with like straight up fucking nazis okay it's just he's the worst person to say it especially because he himself is currently engaging in and they have not talked about this at all by the way it has been literally 59 fucking minutes and not one single moment has been talked about like him killing a shit ton of people in Ukraine. Okay. Which is wild. F 59 minutes. And we haven't gotten to a single fucking Ukrainian or Russian conscript death. Okay. You said back then that it would bite the West in the ass with the Canada Nazi. Of course. And it should, by the way. It's fucking ridiculous. And the only reason why... The only reason why we prop up these fucking Nazis over and over again is because they are the most rugged anti-communists, okay? That was the historical reason as to why the Western world always aligned with Nazis post-World War II. Obviously, it's not a justification for invading Ukraine or anything like that, especially considering that he is an ultra-nationalist uh, person, engaging in in violent actions but it is i don't know it's just like that kind of stuff is important to reckon with especially if you yourself are a rugged anti-communist i guess l that this man served in the ss troops <clears throat> he personally <clears throat> killed russians poles and jews the SS troops consisted of Ukrainian nationalists who did this dirty work. The president of Ukraine stood up with the entire parliament of Canada and applauded this man. How can this be imagined? The president of Ukraine himself, by the way, is a Jew by nationality. Really, my question is, what do you do about it? I mean, Hitler's been dead for 80 years. Nazi Germany no longer exists. And so, true. And so... Wait, Tucker is not... Wait, what? Tucker, Tucker, whoa! Really, my question is, what do you do about it? I mean, Hitler's been dead for 80 years. Nazi Germany no longer exists. Damn, he's being like, are they really Nazis? Is he going to hit that line? He's going to be like, are they really Nazis? Because, like, you know, not, the Nazi party doesn't exist anymore. So what's up? And so, true. And so I think what you're saying is you want to extinguish or at least control Ukrainian nationalism. But how? How do you do that? Очень... Listen to me. Your question is very subtle, and I can tell you what I think. Do not take offense. Of course. This question appears to be subtle. It is quite pesky. You say Hitler has been dead for so many years, 80 years, but his example lives on. People who exterminated Jews, Russians and Poles are alive. And the president, the current president of today's Ukraine, applauds him in the Canadian parliament, gives a standing ovation. Can we say that we have completely uprooted this ideology if what we see is happening today? That is what denazification is. God, it's such good fucking propaganda. God, the West is so dumb. Holy shit. Is in our uh, Tucker Carlson is literally fucking playing the clip too. We have to get rid of those people who maintain this concept and so Once again, just a reminder that he has killed a shit ton of people in Ukraine. Which, of course, has not been mentioned at all. And also, he's being interviewed by a literal neo-Nazi, okay? Vladimir Putin is currently being interviewed by a neo-Nazi who has hired neo-Nazis. Just pointing that out for the record. So, you know. For this practice and try to preserve it. That is what denazification is. That is what we mean. Right. My question was a little more specific. It was, of course, not a defense of Nazis, neo or otherwise. It was a practical question. You don't control the entire country. You don't control Kiev. You don't seem like you want to. So how, how do you eliminate a culture or an ideology or feelings or a view of history 
in a country that you don't control. What do you do about that? You know, as strange as it may seem to you, during the negotiations in Istanbul, we did agree that we have it all in writing. Neo-Nazism would not be cultivated in Ukraine, including that it would be prohibited at the legislative level. Mr. Carson, we agreed on that. This, it turns out, can be done during the negotiation process. And there's nothing humiliating for Ukraine as a modern civilized state. Is any state allowed to promote Nazism? It is not, is it? Uh, that is it. Bro, this is so funny. Yeah, Putin sucks. Obviously. But you gotta you gotta see the irony a little bit of him straight up being like, it should be illegal to promote Nazism to Tucker Carlson, who can't really say anything about it for two reasons. One, because obviously he's there to like suck Putin's dick. And also, Putin is not genuine about, like, denazification anyway. But, like, regardless, one, he's there to suck his dick. Two, I feel like if he were to, you know, do the classic, like, what's going on? That's freedom of speech. <laughs> well, that's called freedom of speech, sir. He he get hit with a fucking uranium dart. So, it's really interesting. The dynamics here are very interesting. You got a guy who falsely is claiming that he's doing denazification when you know of course that's not the case uh, uh talking to another guy who very much is a nazi um will there be talks and why haven't there been talks about resolving the conflict in ukraine peace talks they have been they reached a very high stage of coordination of positions in a complex process, but still they were almost finalized. But after we withdrew our troops from Kiev, as I have already said, the other side threw away all these agreements and obeyed the instructions of Western countries, European countries and the United States to fight Russia to the bitter end. Moreover, the president of Ukraine has legislated a ban on negotiating with Russia. He signed a decree forbidding everyone to negotiate with Russia. But how are we going to negotiate if he forbade himself and everyone to do this? We know that he is putting forward some ideas about this settlement, but in order to agree on something, we need to have a dialogue. Is that not right? Well, but you wouldn't be speaking to the Ukrainian president, you'd be speaking to the American president. When was the last time you spoke to Joe Biden? I cannot remember when I talked to him. I do not remember. We can look it up. You don't remember? No. Why? Do I have to remember everything? I have my own things to do. We have domestic political affairs. Well, he's funding the war that you're fighting, so I would think that would be memorable. Dude, how can Tucker get away with this? Dude, I'm so jealous. I'm jealous, dude. Republicans can just, like, literally be, like... Republicans, unironically, can say, like, I hate America, and then still be, like, considered patriotic. I can't even fucking criticize America without... A thousand people saying, I want to, like, be, is, is strap myself with a suicide, strap myself with TNT and blow myself up. Because I'm a terrorist, Islamist, fundamentalist. It's so fucked up. He literally is, like, talking to Putin and saying he's pro-Putin and that he's more pro-Putin than he is pro-Biden. What the fuck? I talked to a fucking Yemeni teenager with a TikTok account. Motherfucking liberals are like, yeah, dog. Yeah, I, I bet you love sucking terrorist cock, dude. You and your fucking anti-Semitic slaver terrorist Houthi pirates are trying to disrupt global commerce. I hope America blows both of you guys up. Tucker Carlson's over here literally being like, I hate America and I love Russia. Okay. Fuck! Relax, it's starting to sound like Alex Jones. I mean, I'm not wrong about what I just said. People do fucking say that I'm an Islamist fundamentalist, oligarch, neo-Ottomanist, who denies the Armenian genocide and only has one note, and it's hate, hating America, blah, 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 blah. 
Well, yes, he funds, but I talked to him before the special military operation, of course. And I said to him then, by the way, I will not go into details, I never do, but I said to him then, I believe that you are making a huge mistake of historic proportions by supporting everything that is happening there, in Ukraine, by pushing Russia away. I told him, told him repeatedly, by the way. I think that would be correct if I stop here. What did he say? Ask him, please. It is easier for you, you are a citizen of the United States. Go and ask him. It is not appropriate for me to comment on our conversation. But, but, but you haven't spoken to him since before February of 2022? No, we haven't spoken. Certain contacts are being maintained, though. Speaking of which, do you remember what I told you about my proposal to work together on a missile defense system? Yes. You can ask all of them. All of them are safe and sound, thank God. The former president, Condoleezza, is safe and sound. And I think Mr. Gates and the current director of the intelligence agency, Mr. Burns, the then ambassador to Russia, in my opinion, are a very yes. successful ambassador. They were all witnesses to these conversations. Ask them. Same here. If you are interested in what Mr. President Biden responded to me, ask him. At any rate, I talked to him about it. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely interested, but from the outside, it seems like this could devolve or evolve into something that brings the entire world into conflict and could um, initiate some, a nuclear launch. And so why don't you just call Biden and say, let's work this out? What's there to work out? It's very simple. I repeat, we have contacts through various agencies. I will tell you what we are saying on this matter and what we are conveying to the US leadership. If you really want to stop fighting, you need to stop supplying weapons. It will be over within a few weeks. That's it. And then we can agree on some terms. Before you do that, stop. What's easier? Why would I call him? What should I talk to him about? Or beg him for what? And, and what messages do you get back? You're going to deliver such and such weapons to Ukraine? Oh, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, please don't. What is there to talk about? Do you think NATO is worried about this becoming a global war or a nuclear conflict? At least that's what they're talking about. And they're trying to intimidate their own population with an imaginary Russian threat. This is an obvious fact. Come on, dog. An imaginary Russian threat? The fuck? Dude. Like, what? The, is he... Is he just saying that, like, Russia never invaded Ukraine or something? Like, what the fuck's going on? Is he just like, yeah, all the territories we annexed is actually Russian territory to begin with. So we technically invaded ourselves? Like, is that what he's saying? The fuck? I don't understand it. The invasion isn't real. It's a figment of your imagination. All of the people that have died on the Russian side, on the Ukrainian side, it's like not real, actually. That's not real at all. And thinking people, not Philistines, but thinking people. And not going to invade, by the way, said the guy one day before invading with 200k troops on the border, but Russian threat is imaginary. Yeah, I don't understand what, like, like he's saying imaginary Russian threat, and it's like, Like, where, 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 how would that be imaginary? He's saying that there won't be a war beyond Ukraine? Oh. Yeah, I don't think you can... I mean, I don't think that you can do that. I don't think that uh, he has the capabilities of doing that, which I think a lot of other countries also very quickly realize, which is why they dropped the fake neutrality agreements or anything like that uh, and, and joined NATO. Bro, he can't fucking... He can't even invade... Ukraine. I mean, he obviously can't say that. He can't be like, we, we can barely uh, do a decent job holding Ukrainian positions. We're not going to go into Poland. Like, don't worry. <laughs> Analysts, those who are engaged in real politics, just smart people, understand perfectly well that this is a fake. They're trying to fuel the Russian threat. The threat I think you're referring to is a Russian invasion of Poland, Latvia. Expansionist behavior is... Can you imagine a scenario where you sent Russian troops to Poland? Only in one case, if Poland attacks Russia. Why? Because we have no interest in Poland, Latvia or anywhere else. Why would we do that? 
We simply don't have any interest. It's just threat mongering. Well, the argument, I know you know this, is that, well, he invaded Ukraine. Yeah, Latvi Latvians are so hype right now that they got mentioned. They're like, fuck yeah, dude, we're here. Hell yeah, baby. It's like, it's like Moldova mention. Very extra rare, extra rare Latvia mention. Let's go, Latvia, rise up. He made the Russia threat perception very real. That is, this is the issue. That's why Finland and Sweden joined NATO. This is another L. He didn't want a massive NATO border, so he invaded and caused Russia to have a massive NATO border. I mean, I think the, I think the real reason why Finland and Sweden uh, did the dual agreement with NATO isn't because he just invaded Ukraine. I think it's because he invaded Ukraine and failed. Because if he had actually rolled through Ukraine, then yes, there is a very real fear for Finland to potentially join NATO, but that fear also translates to the fear that Russia might retaliate to them. It's the worst of both worlds for Russia in this situation, because not only did they justify fears that other countries might have that Russia might invade them, but he also did it in a way where he failed. So that is precisely the reason why I think Finland felt um, Finland felt uh, uh, strong enough to be able to drop the neutrality and join NATO because what are they going to do? Fucking go and, and invade? Yeah, Putin literally threatened Sweden and Finland. Like we forget now, but there was definitely very valid threats against Sweden and Finland, at least in the beginning. You actually think he wanted to invade them? Come on, bro. No, I don't. But I do think that if there was a more successful special military operation in Ukraine, if they were able to take out like all the anti-aircraft, uh, all of the anti-aircraft guns. Okay. Oh shit. My mom is texting me. If they were able to do all of that, if they were able to like, um, take over more territory, If they were able to successfully uh, successfully take over Ukraine, even though that annexation would have been virtually impossible to uphold. Sorry, I had to unlock my door. Um, if they were able to do all of that, then Finland would be at least a little bit more concerned with threats from Russia. When they saw that their hands are busy and they're incredibly occupied with like, taking over even the eastern positions of Ukraine, that threat basically died. Do you understand? What the fuck is going on, man? Anyway. Ukraine, uh, he has territorial aims across the continent, and you're saying unequivocally you don't. Surely it is incredibly reductive to say that the invasion was stupid because it legitimizes NATO. The existence of NATO as an imperialist alliance is already the status quo in the global north. Yes, I'm simply stating that it basically gave more popular support amongst the populations in European countries to feel like their NATO alliances were valid. And it also showed countries like Finland and countries like Sweden that previously had dual neutrality agreements with Russia that, that Russia is not capable of actually harming them if they were to in if they were to join NATO. Someone just threatened you in chat. People threaten me all the time, brother, you know? They got to join a long, long line of people that want to kill me. If, if, if Russia was able to demonstrate more military competence, I guess, uh, in, uh, if, 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 Russia was able to demonstrate better military competence and actually actually annex Ukraine, let's say, in a hypothetical scenario. Take out their anti-aircraft uh, weapons, immediately have air superiority, and, um, and, you know, 
just march their troops all the way to the Polish border or whatever. At that point, if they were able to steamroll through Ukraine, then their ground invasion capabilities would be genuinely scary for a country like Finland. Therefore, they would most likely not be as... Uh, like the threat of a Russian invasion, the, if it's a credible one, is the reason why countries will maintain neutrality, is what I'm trying to say. Once that threat is eliminated because of uh, an actual... Once that threat is eliminated because of an actual fucking... Um, because you actually saw that they failed in Ukraine, then they're much, uh, much more ready to join NATO. It is absolutely out of the question. You just don't have to be any kind of analyst. It goes against common sense to get involved in some kind of a global war. And a global war will bring all humanity to the brink of destruction. It's obvious. There are certainly means of deterrence. They have been scaring everyone with us all along. Tomorrow Russia will use tactical nuclear weapons. Tomorrow Russia will use that. No, the day after tomorrow. So what? In order to extort additional money from US taxpayers and European taxpayers in the confrontation with Russia in the Ukrainian theater of war. The goal is to weaken Russia as much as possible. What? One of uh, our senior United States senators from the state of New York, Chuck Schumer, said yesterday, I believe, that we... Yeah, what's up, Tugger? Go ahead. Explain why, explain why that's a bad thing to your audience. This is why I mean it's, like, very odd for him to have this conversation because it's like, if you describe to Republicans what the liberal position is on Russia on terms that are not uncertain, they probably would be like, yeah, okay, it's not a bad idea, actually. Russia is scary. They're communists. And that's why taking down their military by throwing Ukrainians in the, in the fucking fire pits, probably not the worst idea. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I know that there's a lot of uh, political polarization in this country, but the bipartisan support for uh, American foreign policy exists for a reason. Right wingers are very reactionary against America's foreign adversaries that they have been they have been conditioned into hating for their whole lives. That's why I find it really funny that there's like a pro-Russian contingency amongst the right because they're like they went they went their whole lives with the Red Scare propaganda thinking that these guys are going to come and invade, you know? Um and then all of a sudden through like one Telegram group, they immediately were able to rewrite all of that Red Scare propaganda and now are pro-Russia because Russia is like anti-trans so fucking stupid we have to continue like you got to be extra dumb to be able to rewrite everything in your brain rewire everything in your brain with like one telegram group to fund the ukrainian effort <clears throat> or u.s soldier citizens could wind up fighting there how do you assess that this is a provocation and a cheap provocation at that I do not understand why American soldiers should fight in Ukraine. There are mercenaries from the United States there. The bigger number of mercenaries comes from Poland, with mercenaries from the United States in second place and mercenaries from Georgia in third place. Well, if somebody has the desire to send regular troops, that would certainly bring humanity to the brink of a very serious global conflict. This is obvious. Do the United States need this? What for? Thousands of miles away from your national territory. Don't you have anything better to do? You have issues on the border, issues with migration, issues with the national debt. More than 33 trillion dollars. You have nothing better to do. Dude, he is so good at being a right-wing commentator in America. It's crazy. Like, he literally just hit like three lines that you hear on Fox News. He knows all the American talking points. He's such a fucking good hog. He's oinking. Oh my lord. To Jesus. do so, you should fight in Ukraine? Wouldn't it be better to negotiate with Russia? Make an agreement? Already understanding the situation that is developing today? Realizing that Russia will fight for its interests to the end? And realizing this, actually return to common sense, start respecting our country and its interests, and look for certain solutions. 
It seems to me that this is much smarter and more rational. Who blew up Nord Stream? <laughs> you for sure. I was busy that day. <laughs> Nate, it, do you have... Do you have <laughs> uh, Why are they having so much fun? They're having... They're yucking it up, dude. Big time, okay? I jokingly refer to Vladimir Putin as Pooty Poo, but like... I feel like this is this is ultra national as Riz, you know what I mean? Like they're they're straight up flirting. I did not blow up Nord Stream. Uh, <laughs> thank you though. <laughs> you personally may have an alibi, but the CIA has no such alibi. Do, do you have evidence that NATO or the CIA did it? You know, I won't get into details, but people always say in such cases, look for someone who is interested. But in this case, we should not only look for someone who is interested, but also for someone who has capabilities. Because there may be many people interested, but not all of them are capable of sinking to the bottom of the Baltic Sea and carrying out this explosion. This is a really interesting time to reveal this, but Sweden has closed the investigation of the pipeline blast, but stay silent on the cause. The natural gas connection was sabotaged in September 2022, seven months after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, prompting rampant speculation about who's to blame. Remember when everybody was yelling at me, another fucking history will vindicate me moment? Oh my lord, remember that one? Remember how quickly, it was actually an exercise in collective psychosis, in my opinion. How quickly liberals will immediately adopt a position, no matter how insane it sounds, where they were like, oh, it must have been Russia. It must have been Russia that blew up its own pipeline. And there were unironically hella people. There were unironically hella people repeating that when it made no fucking sense whatsoever. There were so many people. I don't think people still believe that, but... You're believing Putin law? See, dude, this is like the, the brother, I'm believing the New York Times. <laughs> what the fuck? No, I don't have to believe Putin, dumbass. What are you talking about? I have eyes, ears, a brain. The fuck? <laughs> Why is it that Sweden did not reveal who did it? America basically admitted that it was um, Ukrainian aligned actors. Sweden closed the investigation and did not uh, did not reveal who did it because they were like, oh, shit, I don't know. Mm. Have you considered the bad guys can be never corrected by anything? Exactly. They didn't reveal because the question of jurisdiction was more complicated than where the crime had been committed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's why they didn't reveal it. They just couldn't. Bro, I'm sorry. If it was if it was Russia, they would not give a fuck about jurisdiction, okay? I guess we'll never know. Anyway, who knows? I guess it just kind of did it. Dude, pipelines. Hey, uh, pipeline expert here. Pipelines only do this when they're under severe stress. So it's not funny nor cute, okay? <laughs> it just kind of did it on its own. <laughs> These two. You're using prejudice, not logic. If you knew exactly who did it, but I won't. If you knew exactly who did it, but I won't tell. Yeah, I'm using prejudice, not logic, when I say that it is prejudicely not remotely sound to blow up your own pipeline that is like your major point of leverage for for European uh, for for uh, like a stress point and a, a leverage point for your uh, allegiance with Europe. Two components should be connected. Who is interested and who is capable of doing it? But I'm confused. I mean, that's the biggest act of industrial terrorism ever. 
and it's the largest emission of CO2 in, in history. Okay, so if you had evidence, and presumably given your security services, your intel services, you would, that NATO, the US, CIA, the West did this, why wouldn't you present it and win a propaganda victory? <laughs> In the war of propaganda, it is very difficult to defeat the United States because the United States controls all the world's media and many European media. Bro, they literally, they literally full-throatedly immediately said Russia must have blown up its own pipeline. Like, that was such a major holy shit moment. Like, it made no logical sense whatsoever. And everyone just kind of went along with it. Okay. You're treating Russia like a monolith. There's been power struggles in Russia. Oligarchs falling out of windows. Dugan's daughter killed by a car bomb. The Wagner rebellion. Yeah. This is one of your bad takes. The U.S. avoided direct involvement and in escalation in Ukraine. It's not our style to commit essentially an act of war against Europe. Ukraine is going off the reservation. Makes more sense. Wait, I never... What do you mean? I said that... I said that it was... If you think that there was no involvement in Ukraine and, and it was just Ukrainian actors in and of itself, you're still admitting that it wasn't Russia. And that's really odd. Unless you were trying to say... Uh, you said the U.S. was most likely responsible. It's not our style. Yes, I said U.S. or U.S. trained actors or U.S. involvement is absolutely, in my honest assessment, is absolutely the most likely scenario. But it's but it's the same opinion that I have for, like, the Contras. You know what I mean? I Would you say that the Contras do not have any U.S. involvement? in their actions? Do you think that they were just operating on their own? You know what I mean? Also, the idea that it's not our style is so dumb. It is absolutely our style. Yeah, it was a Ukrainian sabotage group and the Poles likely knew the boat reportedly set off from their coastline and basically ignored it, it seems. Yeah. It absolutely is our style. It's like perfectly aligned with our style. What's also crazy is still people turning around and, and immediately, like, I think you're forgetting my major point of contention here is that people immediately went with the least rational option, which is Russia must have done it to itself. Like, that's insane to me. The amount of people that just lap that up, I cannot overcome. Like, I cannot. It was so nuts. Seymour Hirsch revealed information. Sure, he's a little bit old now. And immediately people were dunking on him. They were saying he's like Russian. He's a Russian op. It's like Russian backed rebels, the BUK missile system who shot down the passenger plane a decade ago. Did Putin order or intend that? Wait, what? <laughs> Dude, how are you comparing these two things? That's insane to compare these two things. Russia is in active conflict at this point with, um, and, and the pipeline is a major point of leverage for them. Like the likelihood that this was a, some Russian actor inside of the state is crazy. The ultimate beneficiary of the biggest European media are American financial institutions. Don't you know that? So it is possible to get involved in this work but it is cost prohibitive, so to speak. We can simply shine the spotlight on our sources of information and we will not achieve results. It is clear to the whole world what happened and even American analysts talk about it directly. It's true. Yes, I, but, but here's a question you may be able to answer. You worked in Germany, famously. Um, the Germans clearly know that their NATO partner did this, but they, and it damaged their economy greatly. It may never recover. Why are they being silent about it? That's very confusing to me. Why wouldn't the Germans say something about it? <laughs> this also confuses me. But today's German leadership is guided by the interests of the collective West rather than its national interests. Otherwise, it is difficult to explain the logic of their action or inaction. After all, it is not only about Nord Stream 1, which was blown up, and the Nord Stream 2 was damaged. 
But one pipe is safe and sound and gas can be supplied to Europe through it. But Germany does not open it. We are ready, please. There is another route through Poland, called Yamal Europe, which also allows for a large flow. Poland has closed it, but Poland packs from the German hand, it receives money from the pan-European funds and Germany is the main donor to these pan-European funds. Germany feeds Poland to a certain extent. And they close their route to Germany. Why? I don't understand. Ukraine, to which the Germans supply weapons and give money. Germany is the second sponsor of the United States in terms of financial aid to Ukraine. There are two gas routes through Ukraine. They simply closed one route, the Ukrainians. Open the second route and please get gas from Russia. They do not open it. Why don't the Germans say? Look guys, we give you money and weapons. Open up the valve, please. Let the gas from Russia pass through for us. We are buying liquefied gas at exorbitant prices in Europe, which brings the level of our competitiveness and economy in general down to zero. So you yeah, now he's now he's speaking to all of the fucking far right EU uh, EU audience. As far as saying like Germany is cucked by America, we want to give Germany uh, oil and gas. Your gas bills are cooked because of the United States of America. Now he's hitting. Now he's hitting the fucking right wing uh, European uh, audiences too. You want us to give you money? Let us have the decent existence. Dude, he's Make money. God, for he's a very good propagandist. Like again, we are now one hour and fifteen minutes uh, into this interview, where not a single mention of Ukrainian invasion. Not a single mention of the casualties, how that's going, what the plans are for the future. It's crazy. He's just basically using Tucker Carlson as a bounce board to, to telegraph all of his ideas and communicate all of his ideas to a, a different various far right groups. For our economy, because this is where the money we give you comes from. They refuse to do so. Why? <laughs> Ask them. That is what is like in their heads. Those are highly incompetent people. Well, maybe the world is breaking into Kyle. two hemispheres, one with cheap energy, the other without. And I want to ask you that. If, if we're now a multipolar world, obviously we are. Can you describe the blocks of alliances? Who, who is in each side, do you think? Listen, you have said that the world is breaking into two hemispheres. A human brain is divided into two hemispheres. One is responsible for one type of activities, the other one is more about creativity and so on. But it is still one and the same head. The world should be a single whole. Security should be shared rather than meant for the golden billion. That is the only scenario where the world could be stable, sustainable and predictable. Until then, while the head is split into parts, it is an illness, a serious adverse condition. It is a period of severe disease that the world is going through now. But I think that, thanks to honest journalism, this work is akin to work of the doctors. This could somehow be remedied. Well, let's just give one example, the, the US dollar, which has kind of united the world uh, in a lot of ways, maybe not to your advantage, but certainly to ours. <coughs> is that going away as the reserve currency, the, the, common, the universally accepted currency? How have sanctions, do you think, changed the dollar's place in the world? You know, to use the dollar as a tool of foreign policy struggle is one of the biggest strategic mistakes made by the U.S. political leadership. The dollar is the cornerstone of the United States power. I think everyone understands very well that no matter how many dollars are printed, they are quickly dispersed all over the world. Inflation in the United States is minimal. It's about 3 or 3.4 percent, which is, I think, totally acceptable for the U.S. But they won't stop printing. What does the debt of 33 trillion dollars tell us about? It is about the emission. Nevertheless, it is the main weapon used by the United States to preserve its power across the world. As soon as the political leadership decided to use the U.S. dollar as a tool of political struggle, a blow was dealt to this American power. I would not like to use any strong language, but it is a stupid thing to do and a grave mistake.
Look at what is going on in the world. The brain rot over this interview on Twitter is insane. What do you mean? Remember when we thought he was we weren't going to watch the whole thing? I didn't think I was going to watch the whole thing, but honestly, it's pretty it's pretty solid. Like How did Tucker manage to get a interview with Putin? Uh easy. He is a very obvious propagandist. Also the timing of this um the timing of this interview is also kind of interesting because it's coming on the heels of uh, it's coming on the heels of like Zelensky. Uh, it's coming on the heels of like America, obviously uh, changing its direction and attitude uh, about Ukraine, not wanting to give more money to Ukraine. Um, it's also happening as like Zelensky fired as general uh, it, it's, um, it's a really, it's a really interesting time to like disseminate this level of propaganda to the Western world because it really drives home. It, 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 it really works actively to divide Western audiences. If you're a right winger, you watch this interview I suspect you're not going to come across, you're not going to look at this and go, yeah, this guy's a fucking uh, bloodthirsty monster who uh, we have to keep funding money and give, uh, give money to Ukraine. Like he presents himself very well, obviously, because he is a really good propagandist and, and it's not, it's not too terrible that uh, for him that like Tucker Carlson is eating his dick. What? Zelensky and the whole of Western media spoke of a night of the long lives, long knives in Ukraine. Seriously, this is not wrong. Wait, what do you mean? How much of the money we gave to Ukraine was cash and how much was the military equipment? I don't know what the exact percentage breakdown is, but it's really funny that people think that we're just like giving bags of cash to Ukraine. We have given a lot of cash to Ukraine for economic development, but a lot of the fucking money that we give to Ukraine is just money being recycled back into the military industrial complex that is now able to send all of their refurbished and older fucking weapons. It's just equipment. When we say we're giving, you know, $10 billion to Ukraine, it's not fucking actually bags of cash. That would probably be less damaging overall for the ecosystem, okay? It's actually just straight weapons. And yes, a lot of those old equipment and a lot of the old weapons that we send them is also not exactly accounted for perfectly either. But yeah, it's just, I think Americans just like misunderstand that. You know what I mean? Sabanja Holdings, lol. Dude, this is so funny. Yes, brother. Yes, my dad was a vice president at a fucking holding group like 25 years ago. What the fuck is this? These dudes like try to dox my family members and not even do a good job at it. Like, what do you mean? What is this an own? I've always talked about this shit, dumb fuck. It's so stupid. They also literally think that like the entire holding group's like wealth is my dad's or something. That he's like a fucking billionaire. They're so stupid. Like... That's the new Hassan bad line. It's so wild to just be like, damn, dog. I can't believe your dad uh, worked at a fucking holding group. Like, they're, they're so dumb. They're so fucking dumb. Four channers are not the smartest people I know. They literally think that I'm like personally a fucking billionaire trust fund kid. It's so fucking stupid. If I was a trust fund kid billionaire, what the fuck would I be doing this here? And not only that, but also, I mean, I assist my family now with finances. So that's also additionally funny that they're like, wow, dude, your dad's a billionaire. It's like, no dog. I wish wouldn't be having to put up with your fucking bullshit online.
Anyway, yeah, I'm a I'm the only multi billionaire generational fucking oligarch that spends eight to ten hours every fucking day online getting yelled at by literally the most mentally ill cyber stalkers that have ever existed on the fucking planet. Even the United States. It's just sad because like so much of it is just like pure mental illness and they don't recognize it. I don't know what to do. It's like, bro, snap out of it, please. Fucking snap out of it. You're, you're not saying. Allies are sound. now downsizing their dollar reserves. Seeing this, everyone starts looking for ways to protect themselves. But the fact that the United States applies restrictive measures to certain countries, such as placing restrictions on transactions, freezing assets, etc., causes great concern and sends a signal to the whole world. What did we have here? Until 2022, about 80% of Russian foreign trade transactions were made in US dollars and euros. US dollars accounted for approximately 50% of our transactions with third countries. Well, currently it is down to 13%. It wasn't us who banned the use of the US dollar. We had no such intention. It was decision of the United States to restrict our transactions in US dollars. I think it is complete foolishness from the point of view of the interests of the United States itself and its taxpayers as it damages the US economy, undermines the power of the United States across the world. By the way, our transactions in Yuan accounted for about 3%. Today, 34% of our transactions are made in rubles and about as much, a little over 34% in Yuan. Why did the United States do this? My only guess is self-conceit. They probably thought it would lead to full collapse, but nothing collapsed. Moreover, other countries, including oil producers, are thinking of and already accepting payments for oil in Yuan. Do you even realize what is going on or not? Does anyone in the United States realize this? What are you doing? You are cutting yourself off. All experts say this. Ask any intelligent and thinking person in the United States what the dollar means for the U.S. But You're killing it with your own hands. I think that's a fair, I, I think it's a fair <coughs> assessment. The question is what comes next, and maybe you trade one colonial power for another much less sentimental and forgiving colonial power. I mean, are, is the, the, the BRICS, for example, in danger of being... Damn, dude. Is he, does he... It's kind of wild that a guy who has spent every waking moment shitting on China has to sit there and eat the Chinese dick, too. Not only is he eating Russian dick, but he has to sit there and also eat Chinese dick? Is that not a bridge too far for you, Tucker? God damn! All kinds of all kinds of dick eating going on here. Nice, dude. Being completely dominated by the Chinese, the Chinese economy, uh, in a way that's not good for their sovereignty. Do you worry about that? <laughs> um, it's also funny because he's like, he's like talking about anti-colonialism and shit when talking about China. <laughs> yeah, and BRICS colonialism. <laughs> Oh, bricks. I love that. Oh, yeah. Well, we have heard those boogeyman stories before. It is a boogeyman story. We're neighbors with China. You cannot choose neighbors just as you cannot choose close relatives. We share a border of thousand kilometers with them. This is number one. Second, we have a centuries-long history of coexistence. We're used to it. Third, China's foreign policy philosophy is not aggressive. Its idea is to always look for compromise, and we can see that. The next point is as follows. We are always told the same boogeyman story, and here it goes again. Through an euphemistic form, but it is still the same boogeyman story. The cooperation with China keeps increasing. The pace at which China's cooperation with Europe is growing is higher and greater than that of the growth of Chinese-Russian cooperation. Ask Europeans, aren't they afraid? They might. No, BRICS bros come from the same place of just like genuinely failing to understand how the global economy operates. Whether it's like a right-wing guy who's like, oh man, de-dollarization, brother, BRICS is happening. And uh, same for, are you having a seizure? No, Kaya is, I have a chew toy in my hand and Kaya's pulling on it. Um, and, and, and the same thing goes for like leftists who also fantasize about this like weird allegiance between fucking 
fucking Brazil, Russia, India, China, and then South Africa, which was just included specifically so that it it's uh, so that it makes more sense. Like it's easier to say than a brick might be i don't know but they are still trying to access china's market at all costs especially now that they are facing economic problems chinese businesses are also exploring the european market or was it saudi arabia sorry do chinese businesses no, have small presence in the South united Africa. states yes the political Originally. decisions are such that they are trying to limit their cooperation with china it is to your own detriment mr tucker that you are limiting cooperation with china you are hurting yourself it is a delicate matter, and there are no silver bullet solutions. Just damn, he's like, yo, eat this Chinese dick. Eat the Chinese dick right now. Go ahead. Say you love China. Say you love China. He's got him in a fucking. He's got him in an arm bar. Going, come on, come on. Say it, bitch. Get the fucking polonium dart. Get the polonium dart. Say you like China right now. Says it is with the dollar. It's like weird because I, I obviously I fucking hate Vladimir Putin. However. I also really hate Tucker Carlson. So like, and, and Tucker Carlson is so bitch made here. Like he is being made to be a bitch. Okay. In this, in this interview, he has to like sit there. He has to sit there and, and straight up just do whatever the fuck Vladimir Putin tells him. Okay. You're the cock watching. Goddamn. All I'm saying is, Oh, look at this. She got height. She got hops. Come on. Get it. Oh, Anyway, look at his pained expression. Yeah, he's like, bro, you got to do cooperation with China. Yeah, it's funny because like when, here's the thing. Here's what I will say. Um, how do you benefit from your rich father, but then LARP is a socialist? Um, I wish I benefited more from my rich father um, and LARP is a socialist. Straight up. Here's the thing I was, uh, here's the thing I was going to say. Assam viewers right for China? No. Um, the thing I was going to say is this. When not talking about all of the very obvious faults and all of the very obvious failures and all the violent suppression, authoritarianism, corruption, uh, of course, the invasion of Ukraine, like all the bad shit, when... The conversation simply surrounds like American action and how bad it is for the world or, or like normal allegiances, things of that nature, like, uh, or, or countries aligning with one another. Basically in that circumstance, in that circumstance, like he comes across very normal, like a, like a coherent dude. But of course, when you when you allow Putin to steer the fucking interview in that direction, which is what Tucker is doing here. I fell for some tweet that was old. Biden isn't running for presidency. That's so funny. Like. So you say you would not stream if you had that much money, so you're only in it for the money? Yes, dude. Yes, you got it. You got it. You caught me. That's what I meant. Oh my God. Oh my God. Why are you holding a yellow cock ring? You think that's like, it's very nice of you to say. People need to stop doing really lazy top of the hour ad break debates like that one chatter because at the top of the hour, you just got to let it happen. Okay. You just got to let it happen. At the top of the hour, there's a cock of the hour. Okay. And if you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe for $5 or for free. Now, obviously, because I'm an oligarch, I don't see any of the ads, you know, because I've, you know, I've paid for all the Twitch streams that I watch as the son of an oligarch and an oligarch myself. Hopefully, maybe you'll get lucky by another oligarch who will give you a sub, but here's the three-minute ad break now. Hello. So, before introducing any illegitimate sanctions, 
illegitimate in terms of the Charter of the United Nations. One should think very carefully. For decision makers, this appears to be a problem. I think the better way to answer that would be, so what if even if I did have a rich power, a rich father, even if that were the case, does that mean I can't be a socialist now? I'm disqualified? Yeah, I know. It's like so dumb to be like, huh, dude, imagine you come from a rich family and you're a socialist. What a fucking meme. It's like, okay, what do you want me to do? Fucking, do you want to crawl under my boots? Is that what you want? Let's say I am a fucking oligarch, okay? Let's say I am an oligarch. Let's say I'm a neo-Ottomanist oligarch secretly thank you king henry the fourth for the 50 get the subs it's like what's the what's the expectation that you think like i you should grovel and beg for my forgiveness as i tell you about how like this structure is actually perfectly good and valid it's so strange it's such a weird thing to just fucking constantly harp on and it makes no sense you're not addressing you're not addressing anything that I'm saying, and you're simply trying to, like, bait hypocrisy where no such hypocrisy exists, right? It's a weird, surf-brained-ass approach to just be like, wow, dude, fucking guy, he's rich, and he thinks the situation, uh, the, the organization, the economic organization we exist under is kind of fucked up. It makes no sense. It makes no goddamn sense. Okay. You want me to basically be like an Andrew Tate style person when you say that. If my position, my finances have changed dramatically over the course of the past 10 years. My positions, on the other hand, have not. Why is it that you want... You know, why is it that you want me to change with my finances and like start advocating for my best interest, I guess, or what you suspect is my best interest? It also doesn't really make sense as far as like what my goals are. Like they think I'm doing this to make money. Like what? You want me to, you think I, I want to play on expert difficulty as an oligarch? Is that why? You think I want, I'm like, it's the same energy as people being like, Hassan, you're secretly racist. It's like, yeah, dude, that's why I um, dedicate a whole lot of time to anti-racist propaganda so I can make it extra hard for all the people around me that'll constantly catch me in my moments where I am being racist. I like it. You know, it was a left of center take. And I, you should play the Mark Cuban clip. And I hate Mark Cuban, but he was definitely like, it's luck. I should pay taxes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Classic famous son of an oligarch donating hundreds of thousands of dollars to strike funds and unions actively promoting unionization. If this shit was a grift, I could grift way better on this side of the pol political equation, okay? On this side of the spectrum, I'd be grifting up a fucking storm. You know? That's it. So you said a moment ago that the world would be a lot better if it weren't broken into competing alliances, if there was cooperation globally. One of the reasons you don't have that is because the current American administration is dead set against you. Do you think if there were a new administration after Joe Biden that you would be able to reestablish communication with the U.S. government? Or does it not matter who the president is? I will tell you, but let me finish the previous thought. We, together with my colleague and friend, President Xi Jinping, set a goal to reach $200 billion of mutual trade with China this year. We have exceeded this level. According to our figures, our bilateral trade with China totals already 230 billion, and the Chinese statistics says it is 240 billion dollars. One more important thing, our trade is well balanced, mutually complementary in high tech, energy, scientific research and development. It is very balanced. 
As for BRICS, where Russia took over the presidency this year, the BRICS countries are, by and large, developing very rapidly. Look, if memory serves me right, back in 1992, the share of the G7 countries in the world economy amounted to 47%, whereas in 2022, it was down to, I think, a little over 30%. The BRICS countries accounted for only 16% in 1992, but now their share is greater than that of the G7. It has nothing to do with the events in Ukraine. This is due to the trends of global development and world economy, as I mentioned just now. And this is inevitable. This will keep happening. It is like the rise of the sun. You cannot prevent the sun from rising. You have to adapt to it. How do the United States adapt? With the help of force, sanctions, pressure, bombings, and use of armed forces. This is about self-conceit. I usually skip this part. When do they get to the sex? Brother, if you don't recognize that this has been a one hour and 26 minutes of straight fucking, I don't know what to tell you. Vladimir Putin has been fucking Tucker Carlson, okay? Straight up. Sexual intercourse, baby. It's already happening. Your political establishment does not understand that the world is changing under objective circumstances. And in order to preserve your level, even if someone aspires, pardon me, to the level of dominance, you have to make the... For people saying, uh, well, Tucker Carlson seems really good at this. It's because one, he's literally had multiple decades of experience at doing this in particular. And two, while he is a piece of shit personally, so is America. So he has a shit ton to talk about with respect uh, to what America's involvement in the world is. So he could just sit there and constantly chirp about America all day, every day, and kind of still be in the right. Even though he himself is engaging in a shit ton of America-style activities. That's the problem. So in situations like this, you just, you have one of two options. You just immediately watch this and you get... Uh, and, and, and you, I guess, figure out where your perspective is. Uh, and you go, okay, you know what? I've realized that like, well, fuck Tucker Carlson. Everything he's saying is wrong because he's a bad guy. So we must be also wrong on a lot of the stuff that he's saying with respect to America. Okay. And, and, and I think a lot of liberals do do that. They see this and they go, oh, he's talking to Tucker Carlson. They're in agreement. I hate all these guys. Um, I hate Putin. And so I think, I guess I'm pro-America. Like, I, I agree with the things that America's doing because P Putin is saying that they're bad. Right decisions in a competent and timely manner. Such brutal actions, including with regard to Russia and, say, other countries, are counterproductive. This is an obvious fact. It has already become evident. You just asked me if another leader comes and changes something. It is not about the leader, it is not about the personality of a particular person. I had a very good relationship with, uh, say, Bush. I know that in the United States he was portrayed as some kind of a country boy who does not understand much. I assure you that this is not the case. I think he made a lot of mistakes with regard to Russia too. I told you about 2008 and the decision in Bucharest to open the NATO's doors to for Ukraine and so on. That happened during his presidency. He actually exercised pressure on the Europeans. But in general, on a personal human level, I had a very good relationship with him. He was no worse than any other American or Russian or European politician. I assure you, he understood what he was doing as well as others. I had such personal relationship with Trump as well. It is not about the personality of the leader, it is about the elite's mindset. If the idea of domination at any cost, based also on forceful actions, dominates the American society, nothing will change. It will only get worse. But if, in the end, one comes to the awareness that the world has been changing due to the objective circumstances, and that one should be able to adapt to them in time, using the advantages that the U.S. still has to... He hated Obama for some reason? Brother, he does not like Democrats. I mean, I think the last Democrat that he was kind of, he said, like, remotely positive things about, was Bill Clinton. And even then, he was like, he was still... Like he he's not I mean dude he's a fucking right wing hyper nationalist 
That's it. He he literally well one he's talking to Tucker Carlson, so of course he's gonna say like nice. Uh, he's gonna say nice things about Republicans because he wants, uh, his Tucker Carlson's Republican audience to like him. No, I don't. I don't think he's just playing to the audience. I think he he does think that he probably vibes better with the, the likes of George Bush and and Trump. Democrats have like this. Democrats are just as reactionary when it comes to foreign policy as the Republicans are, but they don't have that like cowboy gunslinger style. They have this like elitist approach to uh, right wing foreign policy where they are like, we're doing this and we're doing it for you. It's actually a good thing that we're invading whatever country we're invading type shit maybe that's annoying i don't know today then perhaps something may change very snobby look china's economy has become the first economy in the world in purchasing power parity in terms of volume it overtook the us a long time ago the usa comes second then india one and a half billion people and then japan with russia in the fifth place russia was the first economy in europe last year despite all the sanctions and restrictions is it normal from your point of view? Sanctions, restrictions, impossibility of payments in dollars, being cut off from swift services, sanctions against our ships carrying oil, sanctions against airplanes, sanctions in everything, everywhere. The largest number of sanctions in the world which are applied are applied against Russia. And we have become Europe's first economy during this time. The tools that US uses don't work. Well, one has to think about what to do. If this realization comes to the ruling elites, then yes, then the first person of the state will act in anticipation of what the voters and the people who make decisions at various levels expect from this person. Then maybe something will change. But you're, you're describing two different systems. You say that the leader acts in the interest of the voters, but you also say these decisions are not made by the leader, they're made by the ruling classes. <coughs> You've run this country for so long, you've known all these American presidents. What are those power centers in the United States, do you think? Like who actually makes the decisions? I don't know. America is a complex country, conservative on one hand, rapidly changing on the other. It's not easy for us to sort it all out. Who makes decisions in the elections? Is it possible to understand this when each state has its own legislation? Each yeah, because he's not a fucking socialist. That's why, bro. He's like, oh, I don't know. Who does? Each state regulates itself. Someone can be excluded from elections at the state level. It is a two-stage electoral system. It is very difficult for us to understand it. Certainly there are two parties that are dominant, the Republicans and the Democrats, and within this party system the centers that make decisions, that prepare decisions. Then, look, why in my opinion after the collapse of the Soviet Union, such an erroneous, crude, completely unjustified policy of pressure was pursued against Russia? After all, this is a policy of pressure. NATO expansion, support for the separatists in Caucasus, creation of a missile defense system. These are all elements of pressure. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Then, dragging Ukraine into NATO is all about pressure, pressure, pressure. Why? I think among other things because excessive production capacities were created. During the confrontation with the Soviet Union, there were many centers created and specialists on the Soviet Union who could not do anything else. They convinced the political leadership that it is necessary to continue chiseling Russia, to try to break it up, to create on this territory several quasi-state entities and to subdue them in a divided form, to use their combined potential for the future struggle with China. This is a mistake, including the excessive potential of those who worked for the confrontation with the Soviet Union. It is necessary to get rid of this. There should be new, fresh forces. The mistake to pressure Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union, or should we have brought them into the fold? No, he's saying, like, he would have been a willing participant in Western hegemony if they were brought into the fold after uh, the dissolution of the USSR. That's what he's saying. Forces, people who look into the future and understand what is happening in the world. Look at how Indonesia is developing. 600 million people. Where can we get away from that? Nowhere. He was the West's darling. What is he blabbering about? I mean, Russia has been presented as a foreign adversary. Not immediately after the dissolution of the USSR, but I mean, I would say that 
it's it like in almost perpetuity. Yeah, it's just like we looted it and then booted it, even though Vladimir Putin is like our guy or was our guy. The um the notion that the notion that there was like any kind of pro the notion that uh, there was any kind of like pro Russia sentiment ever is is I don't know. It's just it's always been a very effective it's always been a very effective way to keep pumping uh reactionary sentiment and and have them as a portray them as a foreign adversary we just have to assume that indonesia will enter it is already in the club of the world's leading economies no matter who likes it or dislikes it yes we understand and are aware that in the united states despite all the economic problems the situation is still normal with the economy growing decently the gdp is growing by 2.5 percent if i'm not mistaken but if we want to ensure the future, then we need to change our approach to what is changing. As I already said, the world would nevertheless change, regardless of how the developments in Ukraine end. The world is changing. In the United States themselves, experts are writing that the United States are nonetheless gradually changing their position in the world. It is your experts who write that. I just read them. The only question is how this would happen, painfully and quickly, or gently and gradually. And this is written by people who are not anti-American. They simply follow global development trends. That's it. And in order to assess them and change policies, we need people who think, look forward, can analyze and recommend certain decisions at the level of political leaders. I just have to ask, you've said clearly that NATO expansion <coughs> eastward is a violation of the promise you all were made in 1990. It's a threat to your country. Right before you sent troops into Ukraine, the Vice President of the United States went to the Munich Security Conference and encouraged the President of Ukraine to join NATO. Do you think that... Putin and rambling interview barely lets Tucker Carlson get a word in. I think they're just... Uh, this analysis is probably to, like... To, to get a liberal audience that's not going to watch two hours to just be like, yeah, this sucked. I mean, it's, it's definitely this... Uh, like, Republicans that do actually watch this are going to be like... They're going to be... They're going to get the message. The message being that um, Vladimir Putin is our guy. Doesn't seem like a bad guy at all. I'm actually shocked that he hasn't like ta uh, hyped up more of the anti-trans sentiment. You know what I mean? Like he hasn't done more of like the anti-queer stuff. But maybe that's like for the last half or, or last half hour. I that don't know. was an effort to provoke you into military action. I repeat once again, we have repeatedly, repeatedly proposed to seek a solution to the problems that arose in Ukraine after 2014, coup d'etat, through peaceful means. But no one listened to us. And moreover, the Ukrainian leaders who were under the complete US control suddenly declared that they would not comply with the Minsk agreements. They disliked everything there and continued military activity in that territory. And in parallel, that territory was being exploited by NATO military structures under the guise of various personnel training and retraining centers. They essentially began to create bases there, that's all. Ukraine announced that the Russians were a non-titular nationality, while passing the laws that limit the rights of non-titular nationalities in Ukraine. Ukraine, having received all these southeastern territories as a gift from the Russian people, suddenly announced that the Russians were a non-titular nationality in that territory. Is that normal? So is Putin's goal to combat Russia hysteria in the USA via pandering to conservatives for what purpose? Uh, one, always to destabilize. And two, it. I think he recognizes that He's never going to get the liberals to fucking stop funding Ukraine, but he can definitely get, he can definitely get a bunch of like Republicans with isolationist policies, uh, to that also hate the Brandon agenda. Anyway, they hate the Brandon regime that associate like actions in Ukraine with Joe Brandon. Um, he can get those guys to just be like anti-funding 
um, Ukraine. It's actually pretty interesting, uh, as far as, as, as far as like what his tactics are. It's also an election year too. So that's the other reason. All this put together led to the decision to end the war that neo-Nazis started in Ukraine in 2014. Do you, do you think Zelensky has the freedom to negotiate a settlement <clears throat> to this conflict? I don't know the details, of course, it's difficult for me to judge. But I believe he has, in any case, he used to have. His father fought against the fascists, Nazis, during World War II. I once talked to him about this. I said, Volodya, what are you doing? Why are you supporting neo-Nazis in Ukraine today, while your father fought against fascism? He was a frontline soldier. I will not tell you what he answered, this is a separate topic, and I think it's incorrect for me to do so. But as to the freedom of choice, why not? He came to power on the expectations of Ukrainian people that he would lead Ukraine to peace. He talked about this. It was thanks to this that he won the elections overwhelmingly. But then, when he came to power, in my opinion, he realized two things. Firstly, it is better not to clash with neo-Nazis and nationalists, because they are aggressive and very active. You can expect anything from them. And secondly, the US-led West supports them and will always support those who antagonize with Russia. It is beneficial and safe. So, he took the relevant position, despite promising his people to end the war in Ukraine. He deceived his voters. But do you think at this point, as of February 2024, he has the latitude, the freedom, to speak with you or your government directly about putting an end to this, which clearly isn't helping his country or the world. Can he do that, do you think? Why not? He considers himself head of state. He won the elections. Although we believe in Russia that the coup d'etat is the primary source of power for everything that happened after 2014. And in this sense, even today, government is flawed. But he considers himself the president and he is recognized by the United States, all of Europe and practically the rest of the world in such a capacity. Why not? He can. We negotiated with Ukraine in Istanbul. We agreed. He was aware of this. Moreover, the negotiation group leader, Mr. Arachamiya is his last name, I believe still has the faction of the ruling party, the party of the president in the Rada. He still has the presidential faction in the Rada, the country's parliament. He still sits there. He even put his preliminary signature on the document I am telling you about. But then he publicly stated to the whole world, we were ready to sign this document, but Mr. Johnson, then the Prime Minister of Great Britain, came and dissuaded us from doing this, saying it was better to fight Russia. They would get So here's a question about this. I know that, like, I don't trust Vladimir Putin, obviously, but this is, this is what I have seen, this is what I read as well. And I want to hear the remaining five pro-Ukrainian guys in here that uh, are probably here as haters to explain to me what is wrong about this position. Like, Because I've heard conflicting information, people saying like, no, it wasn't Boris Johnson that like fucked up the talks at all. But then they also simultaneously say, well, why? how could you trust Putin on his word that he would maintain uh, the conditions of the... Uh, the the fifteen point plan in Istanbul or in Turkey, and no, don't just say it's not true. I want to know like there's more. There's gotta be more to it, because if it's just, if it's if it's just that like how can you trust? Well, then why the fuck did they go to the table to begin with? Like it's so dumb. It's like when Israel says we can't trust the fucking ceasefire with Hamas. Okay. It was widely reported here in the UK that Johnson was the one who scroopered the talks. Correct. Definitely trust issue. Not going to invade more of a show. Mr. Not going to invade more of a show. Okay. So if it's a trust issue, then that doesn't make sense. Because why the fuck would you go to the table with a, a, to, to negotiate the terms and conditions of a ceasefire with a person that you don't fucking trust. That makes no that makes no sense. Why would they do that? Something changed midway through.
I don't understand it. I've always assumed Wait, hold on. Oh shit. My dude outside and breathe fresh air. You often still have to negotiate with what? I mean, what's the other option? You often still have to negotiate with those you don't trust. You're just not going to show up. Okay, no, I don't think anyone is making a good argument here. Um, at all. It doesn't make any sense. Boris is a chronic liar and not an easy person to respect in any quarter. Huh. It makes, when I look at it, when I look at it, it makes sense to be like, they're having a conversation. Ukraine is in a relatively decent position to negotiate a better position than, uh, than, than they are now. Right. They put these fucking conditions in writing. It's a 15 point plan. It makes sense. There's like decent concessions on either side. Okay. And then the referendums are on referendums happen. No, no referendums did not happen as a Russian. This is one of your most infuriating things. Bojo had nothing to do with that. The referendums happened and the reaction on them was codified at this point. No, the referendums were discussed to have happened 15 years uh, in the future for Crimea. What referendums are you talking about? Why would they attack Kiev to force a deal and not continue to attack? Shows you the peace deal stories just to cope to explain the failure to take the rest of Ukraine. They went to the table. They went to the table. They discussed a 15 point plan. The, the areas that Russia now has annexed. Uh, in Eastern Ukraine, it had not officially annexed yet. Okay. Um, the 15 point plan was pretty smart, politically expedient, pretty smart. In my opinion, from Zelensky's perspective, who was dealing with obviously internal pressure in not conceding. This is not rumor talk. This has been widely reported. Globe heads are coping. No, I know. I, I know. That's why I'm saying like, I, I read a lot of stuff about this negotiation and it's not like it was Russian propaganda or some shit. This is what I, this is what I saw. And I, uh, I, what I saw was that Boris Johnson's, um, Boris Johnson's, uh, visit basically aligned perfectly with the ceasefire conversation falling apart entirely the boris tank the deal is just taking agency from ukraine to choose their path okay this is what makes me want to fucking video game myself entirely because there is no autonomy in ukraine okay if there if ukrainian agency was a factor in this fucking conversation then america would be wiping out every russian position right now with f-16s or f-35s or whatever the fuck they're using Please stop. If, if Ukrainian agency mattered in this conversation from the eyes of the Western world and Western leadership, they literally would not, I, there, there would be no more Russian invasion at this point. They would be, Ukraine would be in NATO. Like, I, I don't know why people always bring this up and say like, oh, it's, like, you think any Western power gives a fuck about Ukrainian agency? What the fuck are we talking about? I'm sorry, guys. Like, this is this is laughable. Like, people legitimately still push this position over and over again about... People still legitimately push this position over and over again that, like, America's involvement in Ukraine is actually a moral one. America is on the right side of this conflict. 
but America's interests are not a fucking moral one in Ukraine. They have openly mentioned this. They keep saying it over and over again. It seems so naive to just like refuse to hear what the American politicians have openly said. This is not my analysis. This was my analysis originally. Okay. My analysis originally was, I think America is doing this as a proxy war. But now I don't have to say that as speculation because I could just point to Elizabeth Warren or uh, Chris Coons or uh, uh, or Lindsey Graham or numerous other Republican and Democratic Party foreign policy apparatus members very clearly defining that it is a great return on investment for 5% of our military budget. We've been able to take out 50% of our foreign adversaries military without a single U.S. active duty service member lost in the process. I'd say that's a really good bargain. There's also a secondary uh, line of communication here where they've also talked about how this is all great for our military industrial complex. These are our arms deals. These are American manufacturers that are making these weapons and, and getting the money. 50%, what the fuck are you getting this from? Dog, it's just the Lindsey Graham quote. I'm not saying that they actually destroyed 50% of the Russian military. I'm simply saying that's what Lindsey Graham directly said. Huh. When you hear stuff like that, you have to realize that while America is technically on the right side of a conflict, siding with those who are invaded versus the invaders, right? America in Israel-Palestine, wrong side of the conflict. That much is very obvious, okay? Israel is engaging in a genocidal campaign against Palestinians. America is firmly on... America is firmly on the side of Israel on that situation, on that side of the conflict, okay? America is firmly on the side of Ukraine in the Russian invasion of Ukraine. That is the right side. Ukrainians are correct in wanting to defend their country. Russians, or the Russian government, or Vladimir Putin, okay, specifically, is on the wrong side. Yeah, but that doesn't mean it's not a just cause. You don't think Ukraine wants to defend itself and we shouldn't help because Russia is our adversary? What? No, you're, you're putting words in my mouth. I'm saying that while America is technically aligned on the right side of this conflict since the invasion, okay, their interest and their motivation is not for honest reasons. How do you justify sides right or wrong? Easy. The invading force is in the wrong. <laughs> it's that simple. There are obviously differences throughout history, like America going into Europe to defeat Nazis is, is, is uh, the right thing to do. But yes, Russia is the oppressor. Russia is the aggressor. Russia is in the wrong. My point is... If you want the NATO simps reasoning, their story is that this was just a fake negotiation on the part of Russia to plan the post Kiev failure. Oh. Okay. I guess that's maybe a more reasonable argument. I don't fucking know. People have basically said that this is fa this is false. And it made me feel and these are like people who who pay way closer attention. People who pay way closer attention to Ukraine than me, right? I'm not a particularly smart guy, okay? But this, to me, Boris Johnson casting doubt on the possibility of a negotiated peace in Ukraine and the Ukrainian peace talks for like falling apart is very different than people being like, well, how can you trust the Russians on a, a negotiated condition of like surrender? 
those are two separate things. If you don't trust the Russians, you just don't fucking go to the table to do peace talks with them anyway. Okay? But you should engage in an honest effort to do a ceasefire. And if it doesn't work out, then you're back to square one. And square one is you blowing shit up anyway. Putin repeats nonsense claim Boris Johnson's screwed efforts to end Ukraine invasion. You just said that, but... I feel like, I feel like they sold the Ukrainians a lie that they were going to get unconditional and permanent support from the Western world. Oh, this is the one. Okay. The Russian president said via translator, a huge document had been prepared and approved by the head of the Ukrainian delegation before the UK prime minister had stepped in and dissuaded Ukraine. Vladimir Putin has repeated a claim that Boris Johnson scrupled negotiations for a peace settlement. During a highly anticipated sit-down interview, da -da -da, he put his signature and then himself, we were ready to sign it and the war would have been over long ago. However, Prime Minister Johnson came to talk us out of it and we missed that chance. In an interview with the Times in January, Mr. Johnson strongly denied the claims which have been previously aired by Moscow, <laughs> describing them as total nonsense of Russian propaganda. Okay, I don't trust Boris Johnson either, though. Mr. John, is, if this is just Mr. Johnson's word, then why the fuck would I trust Boris Johnson? He's an absolute baboon. Mr. Johnson asserted that during a conversation with Mr. Zelensky following the peace talks in Istanbul, he had expressed concerns about the nature of the potential agreement, but assured him the UK's unwavering support for Ukraine. He added that no peace proposals or peace agreement were possible in February and March 2022. Russia entered Ukraine solely for the sake of seizing territories, killing civilians, and overthrowing a democratic government. The former prime minister's rebuttal came following statements made by David Arahamia, the leader of the Servant of the People Party faction in Verkhovna Rada, and the head of the Ukrainian delegation in talks uh, with Russia in November 2023. I remember this. This, is, this came out as well. Mr. Arahamia, cited by a previous visit by Mr. Johnson to Kiev as forming part of the decision not to negotiate with Moscow in 2022, Mr. Johnson had, uh, allegedly said that Ukraine shouldn't sign anything with them at all, and let's just fight. Speaking of the proposed negotiations, Mr. Putin continued, we have never refused, and the fact that they obeyed the demand of the persuasion of Mr. Johnson, the former Prime Minister of Great Britain, it seems ridiculous and very sad to me. Because, as Mr. Arahamia put it, we could have stopped these hostilities with a uh, war a year and a half ago already. But the British persuaded us, and we refused us. Where's Mr. Johnson now? And the war continues. It's like, bitch, you're saying that, but you're the one who's continuing the war, for the record. Asked where he thought Mr. Johnson was, Mr. Putin laughed, replying, hell knows, I don't understand it myself. Conspiracy theories about Mr. Johnson's potential involvement in peace negotiations between two nations have been previously bandied. Okay, this article sucks dick, dude. This article sucks dick. Do you know why this article sucks dick? Because it literally openly admits that Boris Johnson did very publicly say, don't sign anything. It shows a Ukrainian head of the delegation. Why didn't they go to the fucking guy himself and be like, did Boris Johnson tell you this? What the fuck? Anyway, according to the Guardian article I sent you, Boris apparently said that because Zelensky had maximalist position. Oh. Yeah, he said, I really don't see how the Ukrainians can easily sit down and come to some kind of accommodation. How can you negotiate with a crocodile when it's got your legs in his jaws? NATO would keep going with the strategy of supplying Ukraine with the weapons to defend itself. He suggested President Zelensky had what he called a pretty maximalist position of wanting to see Russian troops expelled from their current positions in Donetsk and Luhansk, adding, on Crimea, they are not so maximalist. 
Johnson played down the prospects that he could persuade Modi to toughen India's stance on Ukraine. Da, 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 da. And the rest of it is Modi. Okay, this still doesn't... This still doesn't mean that he didn't dissuade the Ukrainian uh, envoy, or at least, like, feed them a lie. Because here's the thing. Can you use a British accent when talking about Boris? No, because I'm at nine hours and I have a headache. Uh, and I'm losing it a little bit. The thing that frustrates me about this is the same position that I've brought forward time and time again. In the simplest terms, you have to always give peace a chance. Okay? All matter of war end in treaties. Okay? All matter of war end in treaties. That's how it ends. Always. So when people say, oh, dude, you can't do fucking treaties with these guys. They're, they're fucking awful. They're dogs. It's like, okay, let's say you do try to engage in a ceasefire. Okay? Let's say you try to engage in a ceasefire. Fine. Great. Dandy. Love it. And let's say Russia doesn't follow through on the conditions of a ceasefire. Right? They keep shelling. Okay. Then what the fuck happens? You're back to square one. You were already violent before the ceasefire. You were already withstanding violence before the ceasefire. And you just go back to square one and you continue withstanding violence after the ceasefire is violated. This is what I mean. This is what is very frustrating, but then both sides deepen even more. What do you mean deepen even more? Anyway. Motherfuckers would say this makes you look weak. Yeah, you know what makes you look weak when uh the the manpower you have runs out and the western world slowly but surely starts withdrawing support because they have a shiny new genocide that they actually care about so they no longer care about your defense because they never cared about your defense at all they cared about your defense as far as you could hurt russia okay they cared about your defense as far as they could uh as they as they could use your people to fight back against a foreign fucking adversary. Anyway, I can't finish this interview. I'm so fucking tired. And I have a headache. No. Guys, it's nine hours. I, I'm, I'm at nine hours right now. I don't think I'll be able to play uh, the, the glorious... I'm not going to be able to defend the glorious Ajedistan borders today. I know everybody was very excited for it, but I do have not one, but two dogs that I need to take care of here. And some other shit too. God damn it. Why, Mr. Grumpy Pants? Mr. Grumpy Pants, dude, this is like a full day we did of politics. I'm... It's just like... Fuck. I'm tired, man. We did nine hours of like nonstop maximum politics. It's not my fault, though. It's because the Tucker Carlson interview dropped and it was kind of a crazy one and I didn't realize it was gonna be two fucking hours long God damn it and we didn't even get to finish it but um we will do we will do border patrol tomorrow okay 
It was a fat day. Big day. Lots of stuff that we talked about. God damn. Hopefully it was informative for you guys. You know? And uh, that is all I got for today. But tomorrow is another day. Putin calls Tucker CIA. I know. I talked about that. I saw it. Fucking awesome. Anyway, love you guys. Peace. And bye-bye. Sunny Los Angeles, California says her song. The starlight to the starlight to the dark it just begun. There he is again, her son is streaming. Her son is streaming. There he is again. Her son is streaming, her son is streaming. Reviewing the P.O. Box, Uncle Uger's face. Sad in this gold hatchet prop, great names take on breaks. Tiny Bernie Sanders, LGBTQ Air Force. The hole left at your fingertips, on the at your door. The H3 crowded up, babe, the Young Turks online show. Three full fucking years of this. Plenty more to go. Ninety day fiance talks of champagne, bourgeoisie. A Trump rally live reaction on mass riot at DC. There he is again, her son is streaming. Sun is streaming. There it is again. The sun is streaming. The sun is streaming. Reading live stream fail comments. Austin show jazz bites. Suck you in the line. JCS React Lord frame is broken, cover blown. A full blown mess pandemic monster streaming at your home. Total radicalization coming out to find. System you were taught to trust in was broken the whole time. And all these daily streams, whether big or whether small, have helped me and so many find the meaning through it all. Sun is streaming, her sun is streaming. There he is again, her sun is streaming.